Chapter One of Ticonderoga A Story of Early Frontier Life in the Mohawk Valley. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ticonderoga A Story of Early Frontier Life in the Mohawk Valley by G. P. R. James. Chapter One the house was a neat though a lowly one it bore traces of newness for the bark on the trunks which supported the little veranda had not yet mouldered away nevertheless it was not built by the owner's own hands for when he came there he had much to learn in the rougher arts of life but with a carpenter from a village some nine miles off he had aided to raise the building and directed the construction by his own taste the result was satisfactory to him and what was more in his eyes was satisfactory to the two whom he loved best at least it seemed satisfactory to them although those who knew them even not so well as he did might have doubted and yet loved them all the better the door of the house was open and custom admitted every visitor freely whatever was his errand it was a strange state of society that in which men though taught by daily experience the precaution was necessary took none they held themselves occasionally ready to repel open assault which was rare and neglected every safeguard against insidious attack which was much more common it was the custom of the few who visited that secluded spot to enter without ceremony and to search in any or every room in the house for some one of the inhabitants but on this occasion the horse that came up the road stopped at the gate of the little fence and the traveller whoever he was when he reached the door after dismounting knocked with his whip before he entered the master of the house rose and went to the door he was somewhat impatient of ceremony but the aspect and demeanour of his visitor were not of a kind to nourish any angry feeling he was a young and very handsome man probably not more than thirty years of age sinewy and well formed in person with a noble and commanding countenance a broad high brow and a keen but tranquil eye his manner was courteous but grave and he said without waiting to have his errand asked i know not sir whether i shall intrude upon you too far in asking hospitality for the night but the sun is going down and i was told by a lad whom i met in the woods just now that there is no other house for ten miles farther and to say the truth i am very ignorant of the way come in said the master of the cottage we never refuse to receive a visitor here and indeed have sometimes to accommodate more than the house will well hold we are alone however now and you will not have to put up with the inconveniences which our guests are sometimes obliged to encounter stay i will order your horse to be taken care of thus saying he advanced a step or two beyond the door and called in a loud voice for some one whom he named agrippa he had to shout more than once however before a negro appeared blind in one eye and somewhat lame withal but yet apparently both active and intelligent the necessary orders were soon given and in a moment after the traveller was seated with his host in the little parlour of the cottage the manner of the latter could not be called cordial though it was polite and courteous the other seemed to feel it in some degree and a certain stateliness appeared in his demeanour which was not likely to warm his host into greater familiarity but suddenly the chilly atmosphere of the room was warmed in a moment and a chain of sympathy established between the two by the presence of youth a boy of sixteen and a girl a little more than a year older entered with gay and sunshiny looks and the cloud was dispelled in a moment my daughter edith my son walter said the master of the house addressing the stranger as the two young people bounded in and then he added with a slight inclination of the head it was an ancient and honourable custom in scotland when that country was almost as uncivilised as this and possessed all the uncivilised virtues never to inquire the name of a guest and therefore i cannot introduce you to my children but doubtless they will soon acknowledge you as their nameless friend i am a friend of one of them already answered the stranger holding out his hand to the lad this is the young gentleman who told me that i should find the only house within ten miles about this spot 
and his father willing to receive me, though he did not say that I should find a gem in the wilderness and a gentleman in these wild woods. It has been a foolish fancy, perhaps, said the master of the house, to carry almost into the midst of savage life some remnants of civilization. We keep the portraits of dead friends, a lock of hair, a trinket, a garment of the loved and departed. The habits and the ornaments of another state of society are to me like those friends, and I long to have some of their relics near me. Oh, my dear father, said Edith, seating herself by him and leaning her head upon his bosom, without timidity or restraint. You could never do without them. I remember when we were coming hither, now three years ago, that you talked a great deal of free, unshackled existence. But I knew quite well, even then, that you could not be content till you had subdued the rough things around you to a more refined state. "'What made you think so, Edith?' asked her father, looking down at her with a smile. "'Because you never could bear the parson of the parish drinking punch and smoking tobacco pipes,' answered the beautiful girl with a laugh, "'and I was quite sure that it was not more savage life you sought, but greater refinement.' "'Oh, yes, my father,' added the lad, "'and you often said when we were in England "'that the Red Indian had much more of the real gentleman in him "'than many a peer.' "'Dreams, dreams,' said their father with a melancholy smile, "'and then, turning to the stranger, he added, "'You see, sir, how keenly our weaknesses are read by even children. "'But come, Edith, our friend must be hungry with his long ride. "'See and hasten the supper. "'Our habits are primeval here, sir, like our woods.' We follow the sun to bed and wake with him in the morning. They are good habits, answered the stranger, and such as I am accustomed to follow much myself. But do not, I pray you, hasten your supper for me. I am anything but a slave of times and seasons. I can fast long and fare scantily, without inconvenience. And yet you are an Englishman, answered the master of the house gravely. A soldier, or I mistake, a man of station, I am sure, the all three would generally infer, as the world goes at this present time, a fondness for luxurious ease and an indulgence of all the appetites. A slight flush came to his young companion's cheek, and the other hastened to add, Believe me, I meant nothing discourteous. I spoke of the Englishman, the soldier, and the man of rank and station generally, not of yourself. I see it is far otherwise with you. You hit hard, my good friend, replied the stranger. "'and there is some truth in what you say, "'but perhaps I have seen as many lands as you, "'and I boldly venture to pronounce "'that the fault is in the age, "'not in the nation, the profession, or the class.' "'As he spoke, he rose, walked thoughtfully to the window, "'and gazed out for a moment or two in silence, "'and then, turning round, he said, "'addressing his host's son, "'How beautifully the setting sun shines down yonder glade in the forest, "'pouring, as it were, in its golden mist through the needle foliage of the pines. Runs there a road down there? The boy answered in the affirmative, and drawing close to the stranger's side, pointed out to him, by the undulation of the ground and the gaps in the treetops, the wavy line that the road followed down the side of the gentle hill, saying, By a white oak and a great hemlock tree, there is a footpath to the left. At a clump of large cedars on the edge of the swamp, the road forks out to the right and left, one leading eastward towards the river, and one out westward to the hunting-grounds. The stranger seemed to listen to him with pleasure, often turning his eyes to the lad's face as he spoke, rather than to the landscape to which he pointed, and when he had done he laid his hand on his shoulder, saying, "'I wish I had such a guide as you, Walter, for my onward journey.' "'Will it be far?' asked the youth. "'Good faith, I cannot well tell,' answered the other, it may be as far as Montreal, or even to Quebec, if I get not satisfaction soon. I could not guide you as far as that, replied the boy, but I know every step towards the lakes, as well as an Indian. With whom he is very fond of consorting, said his father with a smile. But before the conversation could proceed farther, an elderly, respectable woman servant entered the room and announced that supper was on the table. Edith had not returned, but they found her in a large oblong chamber, to which the master of the house led the way. There was a long table in the midst, and four wooden chairs arranged round one end, over which a snowy tablecloth was spread. The rest of the table was bare, 
but there were a number of other seats and two or three benches in the room, while at equal distances on either side, touching the walls, lay a number of bear and buffalo skins, as if spread out for beds. The eye of the stranger glanced over them as he entered, but his host replied to his thoughts with a smile. "'We will lodge you somewhat better than that, sir. We have just now more than one room vacant, but you must know there is no such thing as privacy in this land, and when we have any invasion of our Indian friends, those skins make them supremely happy.' I often smiled to think how a red man would feel in Holland sheets. I tried it once, but it did not succeed. He pulled the blankets off the bed and slept upon the floor. Seated at the table, the conversation turned to many subjects, general, of course, but yet personally interesting to both the elder members of the party. More than an hour was beguiled at the table, a longer period than ordinary, and then the bright purple hues which spread over the eastern wall of the room opposite the windows, told that the autumnal sun had reached the horizon. The master of the house rose to lead the way into another room again, but ere he moved from the table another figure was added to the group around it, though the foot was so noiseless that no one heard its entrance into the chamber. The person who had joined the little party was a man of middle age, of a tall, commanding figure, upright and dignified carriage, and fine but somewhat strongly marked features. The expression of his countenance was grave and noble, but yet there was a certain strangeness in it, a touch of wildness, perhaps I might call it, very difficult to define. It was not in the eyes, for they were good, calm and steadfast, gazing straight at any object of contemplation, and fixed full upon the face of any one he addressed. It was not in the lips, for, except when speaking, they were firm and motionless. Perhaps it was in the eyebrow, which, thick and strongly marked, was occasionally suddenly raised or depressed, without apparent cause. His dress was very strange. He was evidently of European blood, although his skin was embrowned by much exposure to sun and weather. But yet he wore not altogether the European costume, the garb of the American backwoodsman, or that of the Indian. There was a mixture of all, which gave him a wild and fantastic appearance. His coat was evidently English, and had straps of gold lace upon the shoulders. His knee-breeches and high-riding boots would have looked English, also, had not the latter been destitute of soles, properly so called, for they were made somewhat like a stocking, and the part beneath the foot was of the same leather as the rest. Over his shoulder was a belt of rattlesnake skin, and round his waist a sort of girdle, formed from the claws of the bear, from which depended a string of wampum, while two or three knives and a small tomahawk appeared on either side. No other weapons had he whatever, but under his left arm hung a common powder flask, made of cow's horn, and beside it a sort of wallet, such as trappers commonly used for carrying their little store of Indian corn. A round fur cap of bearskin, without any ornament whatever, completed his habiliments. It would seem that in that house he was well known, for its master instantly held forth his hand to him, and the young people sprang forward and greeted him warmly. A full minute elapsed before he spoke, but nobody uttered a word till he did so, all seeming to understand his habits. "'Well, Mr. Prevost,' he said at length, "'I have been a stranger to your wigwam for some time. How art thou, Walter? Not a man yet, in spite of all thou canst do.' Edith, my sweet lady, time deals differently with thee from thy brother. He makes thee woman against thy will. And turning suddenly to the stranger, he said, Sir, I am glad to see you. Were you ever at Kilmansegi? Once, replied the stranger laconically. Then we will confer presently, replied the newcomer. How have you been this many a day, Mr. Prevost? You must give me food, for I have ridden far. I will have that bearskin, too, for my night's lodging-place, if it be not pre-engaged. No, not that one, the next, for I ever count upon your courtesy. There was something extremely stately and dignified in his whole tone, and with frank straightforwardness, but without any indecorous haste, he seated himself at the table, drew toward him a large dish of cold meat, and while Edith and her brother hastened to supply him with everything else he needed, proceeded to help himself liberally to what was within his reach. 
Not a word more did he speak for several minutes, while Mr. Prevost and his guest stood looking on in silence, and the two young people attended the newcomer at the table. As soon as he had done, he rose abruptly, and then, looking first to Mr. Prevost, and next to the stranger, said, "'Now, gentlemen, if you please, we will to council.' The stranger hesitated, and Mr. Prevost answered with a smile, "'I am not of the initiated, Sir William, but I and the children will leave you with my guest, whom you seem to know, but of whose name and station I am ignorant.' "'Stay, stay,' replied the other to whom he spoke. "'We shall need not only your advice, but your concurrence.' This gentleman I will answer for as a faithful and loyal subject of His Majesty King George. He has been treated with that hardest of all treatments, neglect. But his is a spirit in which not even neglect can drown out loyalty to his king and love to his country. Moreover, I may say that the neglect which he has met with has proceeded from a deficiency in his own nature. God, unfortunately, did not make him a grumbler, or he would have been a peer long ago. The Almighty endowed him with all the qualities that could benefit his fellow creatures, but denied him those which were necessary to advance himself. Others have wondered that he never met with honours or distinction or reward. I wonder not at all, for he is neither a charlatan, nor a coxcomb, nor a pertinacious beggar. He cannot stoop to slabber the hand of power, nor lick the spittle of the man in office. How can such a man have advancement? It is contrary to the course of things of this world. But he has loved his fellow men, and so will he love them. As he has served his country, so will he serve it. As he has sought honour and truth more than promotion, honour and truth will be his reward, alas, that it should be the only one. But when he dies, if he dies unrecompensed, it will not be unregretted or unvenerated. He must be of our council. Mr. Prevost had stood by in silence, with his eyes bent upon the ground, but Edith sprang forward and caught Sir William Johnson's hand as he ended the praises of her father, and bending her head with exquisite grace, pressed her lips upon it. Her brother seemed inclined to linger for a moment, but saying, Come, Walter, she glided out of the room, and the young lad, following, closed the door behind him. End of chapter 1"'Chapter 2 of Ticonderoga by George Payne Rainsford James. "'This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. "'Chapter 2. "'Who can he be?' said Walter Prevost "'when they had reached the little sitting-room. "'Sir William called him my lord.' "'Edith smiled at her brother's curiosity. "'Oh, how much older women always are than men!' "'Lords are small things here, Walter,' she said. "'I do not think that lords are small things anywhere,' answered her brother, who had not imbibed any of the Republican spirit which was even then silently creeping over the American people. Lords are made by kings for great deeds or great virtues. "'Then they are lords of their own making,' answered Edith. "'Kings only seal the patent nature has bestowed.' That great red oak, Walter, was growing before the family of any man now living was ennobled by the hand of royalty. Pooh, nonsense, answered her brother. You are indulging in one of your daydreams. What has that oak to do with nobility? I hardly know, replied his sister, but yet something linked them together in my mind. It seemed as if the oak asked me, what is their antiquity to mine? and yet the antiquity of their families is the greatest claim to our reverence. "'No, no,' cried Walter Prevost eagerly. "'Their antiquity is nothing, for we are all of as ancient a family as they are. But it is that they can show a line from generation to generation, displaying some high qualities, ennobled by some great acts, granted that here or there a sluggard, a coward, or a fool may have intervened, or that the acts which have won praise in other days may not be reverenced now. Yet I have often heard my father say that, in looking back through records of noble houses, we shall find a sum of deeds and qualities suited to and honoured by succeeding ages, which, tried by the standard of the times of the men, 
shows that hereditary nobility is not merely an honour won by a worthy father for unworthy children, but a bond to great endeavours, signed by a noble ancestor on behalf of all his descendants. Edith, you are not saying what you think. Perhaps not, answered Edith, with a quiet smile. But let us have some lights, Walter, for I am well nigh in darkness. The lights were brought, and Walter and his sister sat down to muse over books, I can hardly say to read, till their father reappeared. For the evening prayer and the parting kiss had never been omitted in their solitude ere they lay down to rest. The conference in the hall, however, was long, and more than an hour elapsed before the three gentlemen entered the room. Then a few minutes were passed in quiet conversation, and then, all standing round the table, Mr. Prevost raised his voice, saying, "'Protect us, O Father Almighty, in the hours of darkness and unconsciousness. Give us thy blessing of sleep to refresh our minds and bodies, and if it be thy will, let us wake again to serve and praise thee through another day more perfectly than in the days past, for Christ's sake. The Lord's Prayer succeeded, and then they separated to rest. Before daylight in the morning, Sir William Johnson was on foot and in the stable. Some three or four negro slaves, for there were slaves then on all parts of the continent, lay sleeping soundly in a small sort of barrack hard by, and as soon as one of them could be roused, his horse was saddled, and he rode away without stopping to eat or say farewell. He bent his course direct toward the bank of the Mohawk, flowing at some twenty miles' distance from the cottage of the Prevost, and before he had been five minutes in the saddle was in the midst of the deep woods which surrounded the little, well-cultivated spot where the English wanderer had settled. About a mile from the house a bright and beautiful stream crossed the road, flowing onward toward the great river, but bridge there was none and in the middle of the stream Sir William suffered his horse to stop and bend its head to drink. He gazed to the eastward, but all there was dark and gloomy under the thick overhanging branches. He turned his eyes to the westward, and they rested on a figure standing in the midst of the stream, with rod in hand, and his back turned toward him. He thought he saw another figure, too, amidst the trees upon the bank, but it was shadowy there, and the form seemed shadowy, too. After gazing for a moment or two, he raised his voice and exclaimed, "'Walter! Walter Prevost!' The lad heard him, and laying his rod upon the bank, hastened along over the green turf to join him. But at the same moment the figure among the trees, if really figure it was, disappeared from sight. "'Thou art out early, Walter,' said Sir William. "'What do you do at this hour?' "'I'm catching trout for the stranger's breakfast,' said the lad, with a gay laugh. "'You should have had your share, had you but waited.' "'Who was that speaking to you on the bank above?' asked the other gravely. "'Merely an Indian girl, watching me fishing,' replied Walter Prevost. "'I hope your talk was discreet,' rejoined Sir William. "'These are dangerous times when trifles are of import, Walter.' "'There was no indiscretion,' replied the lad, with the colour mounting slightly in his cheek. "'She was noticing the feather flies with which I caught the fish,' and blamed me for using them. She said it was a shame to catch anything with false pretenses. She is wise, answered the other, with a faint smile, but yet that is hardly the wisdom of her people. An Indian maiden? he added thoughtfully. Of what tribe is she? One of the five nations, I trust. Oh, yes, an Oneida, replied Walter, one of the daughters of the stone, the child of a sachem, who often lodges at our house. "'Well, be she who she may,' said Sir William. "'Be careful of your speech, especially regarding your father's guest. "'I say not to conceal that there is a stranger with you, for that cannot be. "'But whatever you see or guess of his station or his errand, keep it to yourself. "'And let not a woman be the sharer of, of your thoughts till you have tried her with many a trial.' "'She would not betray them, I am sure,' answered the lad warmly, "'and then added with some slight embarrassment, as if he felt that he had in a degree betrayed himself. But she has nothing to reveal or to conceal. Our talk was all of the river and the fish. We met by accident, and she is gone. Perhaps you may meet by accident again, said the other, and then be careful. But now to more serious things. 
Perchance your father may have to send you to Albany, perchance to my castle. You can find your way speedily to either, is it not so? Further than either, replied the lad gaily. But you may have a heavy burden to carry, rejoined Sir William. Do you think you can bear it? I mean the burden of a secret. I will not drop it, by the way, answered Walter gravely. Not if the sachem's daughter offered to divide the load, asked his companion. Doubt me not, said Walter. I do not, said Sir William. I do not, but I would have you warned. And now, farewell. You are very young to meet maidens in the wood. Be careful. Farewell. He rode on, and the boy tarried by the roadside and meditated. In about two minutes, he took his way up the stream again still musing toward the place where he had laid down his rod he sprang up the bank and in amongst the maples and some ten minutes after the sun rising higher poured its light through the stems upon a boy and girl seated at the foot of an old tree he with his arms around her and his hand resting on the soft brown velvety skin and she with her head upon his bosom and her warm lips within the reach of his her skin was brown, I have said, yes, very brown, but still hardly browner than his own. Her eyes were dark and bright, of the true Indian hue, but larger and more open than is at all common in many of the tribes of the Iroquois. Her lips, too, were rosy, and as pure of all tinge of brown as those of any child of Europe, and her fingers also were stained of Aurora's own hue but her long, silky black hair would have spoken her race at once, had not each tress terminated in a wavy curl. The lines of the form and of the face were all wonderfully lovely, too, and yet were hardly those which characterised so peculiarly the Indian nations. The nose was straighter, the cheekbones less prominent, the head more beautifully set upon the shoulders. The expression, too, as she rested there, with her cheek leaning on his breast, was not that of the usual Indian countenance. It was softer, more tender, more impassioned, for though romance and poetry have done all they could to spiritualise the character of Indian love, I fear from what I have seen and heard and known, it is rarely what it has been portrayed. Her face, however, was full of love and tenderness and emotion, and the picture of the two as they sat there told at once of a tale of love just spoken to a willing ear. End of chapter 2《Chapter 3 of Ticonderoga by George Payne Rainsford James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 3 The hour of breakfast had arrived when Walter Prevost returned with his river spoil but the party at the house had not yet sat down to table. The guest who had arrived on the preceding night was standing at the door talking with Edith, while Mr. Prevost himself was within in conference with some of the slaves. Shaded by the little rustic porch, Edith was leaning against the doorpost in an attitude of exquisite grace, and the stranger, with his arms crossed upon his broad manly chest, now raising his eyes to her face, now dropping them to the ground, seemed to watch with interest the effect his words produced as it was written on that beautiful countenance. "'I know not,' said the stranger, speaking as the young man approached, "'I know not how I should endure it myself for any length of time. The mere abstract beauty of nature would soon pall upon my taste, I fear, without occupation.' "'But you would make occupation,' answered Edith earnestly. "'You would find it.' Occupation for the body is never wanting when you have to improve and cultivate and ornament, and occupation flows in from a thousand gushing sources in God's universe, even were one deprived of books and music. Ay, but companionships and social converse and the interchange of thought with thought, said the stranger, where could one find those? And he raised his eyes to her face. "'Have I not my brother and my father?' she asked. "'True, you have,' said the other. "'But I should have no such resource.' He had seen a slight hesitation in her last reply. He thought that he had touched the point where the yoke of solitude galled the spirit. He was not the one to plant or to nourish discontent in anyone, and he turned at once to her brother, saying, 
"'What, at the stream so early, my young friend? Have you had sport?' "'Not very great,' answered Walter. "'My fish are few, but they are large. Look here.' "'I call such sport excellent,' said the stranger, looking into the basket. "'I must have you take me with you some fair morning, for I am a great lover of the angle.' The lad hesitated and turned somewhat redder in the cheek than he had been the moment before, but his sister saved him from reply, saying in a musing tone, "'I cannot imagine what delight men feel in what they call the sports of the field. To inflict death may be a necessity, but surely should not be an amusement.' "'Man is a born hunter, Miss Prevost, replied the stranger with a smile. "'He must chase something.' "'Oh, my dear young lady, if you can tell the enjoyment in the midst of busy, active, troublous life, of one calm day's angling by the side of a fair stream, with quiet beauty all around us and no adversary but the speckled trout.' "'And why should they be your foes?' asked Edith. "'Why should you drag them from the cool, clear element to pant and die in the dry upper air?' "'Cause we want to eat em said a voice from the door behind her. They eat everything. Why shouldn't we eat them? Darn this world. It is but a place for eating and being eaten. The bivers that I trap eat fish, and many a cunning trick the crafty critters use to catch them. The minks eat birds and birds' eggs. Men talk about beasts of prey. Why, everything is a beast of prey, eating the oxen and the sheep and such like. And sometimes I have thought it hard to kill them, who never do harm to no one and a great deal of good sometimes. But come, Master Walter, don't ye keep them fish in the sun. Give em to Black Rosie the cook, and let us have some of em for breakfast afore they're all wilted up. The man who spoke might have been five feet five or six in height, and was anything but corpulent. Yet he was in chest and shoulders as broad as a bull, and though the lower limbs were more likely formed than the upper, yet the legs, as well as the arms, displayed strong, rounded muscles, swelling forth at every movement. His hair was as black as jet, without the slightest mixture of grey, though he could not be less than fifty-four or fifty-five years of age, and his face, which was handsome, with features somewhat eagle-like, was browned by exposure to a colour nearly resembling that of mahogany. With his shaggy bearskin cap, well worn, and a frock of deerskin, with the hair on, descending to the knees he looked more like a bison than anything human and half expecting to hear him roar the stranger was surprised to trace tones soft and gentle though somewhat nasal to such a rude and rugged form while walter carried his basket of fish to the kitchen and mr prevost's guest was gazing at the newcomer in whom edith seemed to recognize an acquaintance the master of the house himself approached from behind the latter saying as he came let me make you acquainted with Mr. Brooks, Major Kilmanseggy, Captain Jack Brooks. Poo, poo, Provost, exclaimed the other. Call me by my right name. I was Captain Brooks long agone. I'm new christened and called Woodchuck now. That's because I burrow, Major. Them Injuns a wonderful circumdiferous. But they have found that when they try tricks with me, I can burrow under them, and so they call me Woodchuck, because it's a burrowing sort of a beast. "'I do not exactly understand you,' said the gentleman, who had been called Major Kilmenseggy. "'What is the exact meaning of circumdiferous?' "'It means just circumventing like,' answered the woodchuck. First and foremost, there's many of the Injuns, the Algonquin, for a sample. Never tell a word of truth. No, no, not they. One of them told me so plainly one day. Woodchuck, says he, Injuns seldom tell truth.' and he know better than that. Truth too good a thing to be used every day. Keep that for a time of need. I believe at that precious moment he spoke the truth the first time for forty years. The announcement that breakfast was ready interrupted the explanation of Captain Brooks, but seemed to afford him great satisfaction. And at the meal, certainly, he ate more than all the rest of the party put together, consuming everything set before him with a veracity truly marvellous. He seemed to think some apology necessary, indeed, for his furious appetite. "'You see, Major,' he said as soon as he could bring himself to a pause sufficiently long to utter a sentence, "'I eat well when I do eat, for sometimes I eat nothing for four or five days together. 
when I get to a lodge like this, I take in stores for my next voyage, as I can't tell what port I shall touch it again. "'Pray do you anticipate a long cruise just now?' asked the stranger. "'No, no,' said the other, laughing. "'But I always prepare against the worst. "'I'm just going up the Mohawk for a step or two "'to make a trade with some of my friends of the Five Nations, "'the Iroquois, as the French call them. "'But I shall trot up afterward to Sandy Hill and Fort Lyman "'to see what is to be done there in the way of business. "'Fort Lyman, I call it still, though it should be Fort Edward, "'for after the brush with Dieskau it has changed its name.' "'Aye, that was a sharp affair, Major. "'You'd a liked to have been there, I guess.' "'Were you there, Captain?' asked Mr. Prevost. "'I did not know you had seen so much service.' "'There I was,' answered Woodchuck with a laugh, "'though, as to service, I did more than I was paid for, "'seeing as I had no commission. "'I'll tell you how it was, Prevost. "'Just in the beginning of September, "'the seventh or eighth, I think, "'of the year of our last, that is, 1755, I was going up to the head of the lake to see if I could not get some poultry, for I had been unlucky down westward, and had made a bargain in Albany that I did not like to break. Just at the top of the hill, near where the King's Road comes down to the ford, who should I stumble upon amongst the trees but old Hendrick, as they called him? Why, I can't tell, the satchel of the tortoise totem of the Mohawks. He was there with three young men at his feet, but we were always good friends, he and I, and over and above I carried the calumet, so there was no danger. Well, we sat down, and he told me that the general, that is, Sir William, as is now, had dug up the tomahawk and was encamped near Fort Lyman, to give battle to Unondioc, that is to say, in their jargon, the French governor. He told me, too, that he was on his way to join the general, and that he did not intend to fight, but only to witness the brave deeds of the Corlier men, that is to say, the English. He was a cunning old fox, old Hendrick, and I fancied from that he thought we should be defeated. But when I asked him, he said no, that was all on account of a dream he had had, forbidding him to fight on the penalty of his scalp. So I told him I was minded to go with him and see the fun. Well, we must have before the sun was quite down, well nigh upon three hundred mohawks, all beautifully painted and feathered. But they all told me they had not sung their war song, nor danced their war dance before they left their lodges, so I could see well enough that they had no intention to fight, and the tarnation devil wouldn't make them. However, we got to the camp, where they were all busy throwing up breastworks, and we heard that Dieskau was coming down from the hunters in force. The next morning we heard that he had turned back again from Fort Lyman, and Johnson sent out Williams with seven or eight hundred men to get hold of his haunches. I tried hard to get old Hendrick to go along, for I stuck fast by my engines, knowing the brutes can be serviceable when you trust them. But the satchel only grunted and did not stir. In an hour and a half we heard a mighty large rattle of muskets, and the Injuns could not stand the sound quietly, but began looking at their rifle flints and fingering their tomahawks. However, they did not stir. And old Hendrick sat as grave and as brown as an old hemlock stump. Then we saw another party go out of camp to help the first, but in a very few minutes they came running back with Yeskow at their heels. In they tumbled over the breastworks, head over heels. Anyhow and a pretty little considerable quantity of fright brought they with them. If Dieska had charged straight on that minute, we should have all been smashed to everlasting flinders. And I don't doubt no more than that a bear's a critter, that Hendrick and his painted devils would have had as many English scalps as French ones. But the old coon of a garman halted up short some two hundred yards off, and Johnson did not give him much time to look about him, for he poured all the cannon shot he had got into him as hard as he could pelt, while the French engines, and there was a mighty sight of them, did not like that game of ball, and they squatted off to the right and left, some into the trees and some into the swamps, and I could stand it no longer, but up with my rifle and give them all I had to give, and old Hendrick, seeing how things were likely to go, took to the right end too, but a little too fast, for the old devil came into him, and he must needs have scalps. So out he went with the rest, and just as he got his forefinger in the hair of a young Frenchman, 
whiz came a bullet into his dirty red skin, and down he went like an old moose. Some twenty of his engines got shot too, but in the end the Eskow had to run. Johnson was wounded too, and them folks have since said that he had no right to the honour of the battle, but that it was Lyman who took the command when he could fight no longer. But that's all trash. Dieskow had missed his chance, and all his irregulars were sent skimming by the first fire long before Johnson was hit. Lyman had nothing to do but hold what Johnson left him, and pursue the enemy. The first he did well enough, but the second he forgot to do, though he was a brave man and a good soldier for all that. This little narrative seemed to give matter for thought both to Mr. Prevost and his English guest, who, after a moment or two of somewhat gloomy consideration, asked the narrator whether his friendly Indians had on that occasion received any special offence to account for their unwillingness to give active assistance to their allies, or whether their indifference proceeded merely from a fickle or treacherous disposition. "'Somewhat of both,' replied Captain Brooks, and after leaning his great, broad forehead on his hand for a moment or two, in deep thought, he proceeded to give his views of the relations of the cronies with the Iroquois, in a manner and tone totally different from any he had used before. They were grave and almost stern, and his language had few, if any, of the coarse illustrations with which he ordinarily seasoned his conversation. "'They are a queer people, the Indians,' he said, "'and not so much savages as we are inclined to believe them. Sometimes I am ready to think that in one or two points they are more civilised than ourselves. They have not got our arts and sciences, and as they have got no books, one set of them cannot store up the knowledge they gain in their own time to be added to by every generation of them that comes after, and we all know that things which are sent down from mouth to mouth are soon lost or corrupted. But yet they are always thinking, and they have a calmness and a coolness in their thoughts that we white men very often want. They are quick enough in action when once they have determined upon a thing, and for perverseness they beat all the world, but they take a long time to consider before they do act and it is really wonderful how quietly they do consider, and how steadily they stick in consideration to all their own old notions. We have not treated them well, sir, and we never did. They have borne a great deal, and they will bear more still. But yet they feel and know it, and some day they may make us feel it too. They have not the wit to take advantage at present of our divisions, and by joining together themselves make us feel all their power, for they hate each other worse than they hate us. But if the same spirit were to take the whole red men, which got hold of the five nations many a long year ago, and they were to band together against the whites as those five nations did against the other tribes, they'd give us a great deal of trouble, and though we might thrash them at first, we might teach them to thrash us in the end. As it is, however, you see there are two sets of Indians and two sets of white men in this country, each as different from the other as anything can be. The Indians don't say, as they ought, the country is ours and we will fight against all the whites till we drive them out. But they say, the whites are wiser and stronger than we are, and we will help those of them who are wisest and strongest. I don't mean to say that they have not got their likings and dislikings, and that they are not moved by kindness or by being talked to, for they are great haters and great likers. But still, what I have said is at the bottom of all their friendships with the white men. The Dutchmen helped the five nations and taught them to believe they were a strong people. So the five nations liked the Dutch and made alliance with them. Then came the English and proved stronger than the Dutch, and the five nations attached themselves to the English. They have stuck fast to us for a long time and would not go from us without cause. If they could help to keep us great and powerful, they would and I don't think a little adversity would make them turn. But still to see us whipped and scalped would make them think a good deal, and they won't stay by a people long they don't respect. They have got their own notions, too, about faith and want of faith. If you are quite friendly with them, altogether, out and out, they'll hold fast enough to their word with you. But a very little turning or shaking or doubting will make them think themselves free from all engagements, and then take care of your scalp-lock. If I am quite sure when I meet an Indian, that, as the good book says, my heart is right with his heart, that I have never cheated him or thought of cheating him, that I have not doubted him, nor do I doubt him, 
I can lie down and sleep in his lodge as safe as if I were in the heart of Albany. But I should not sleep a wink if I knew there was the least bit of insincerity in my own heart. For they are as cute as serpents, and they are not a people to wait for explanations. Put your wit against theirs at the back of the forest, and you'll get the worst of it. "'But have we cheated or attempt to cheat these poor people?' asked the stranger. "'Why, the less we say about that, the better, Major,' replied Woodchuck, shaking his head. "'They have had to bear a great deal, and now, when the time comes that we look as if we are going to the war, perhaps they may remember it.' "'But I hope and trust we are not exactly going to the war," said the other, with his colour somewhat heightened. "'There has been a great deal said in England about mismanagement of our affairs on this continent.' "'But I have always thought, being no very violent politician myself, "'that party spirit dictated criticisms which were probably unjust.' "'There has been mismanagement enough, Major,' replied Captain Brooks. "'Hasn't there, Prevost?' "'I fear so, indeed,' replied his host with a sigh. "'But quite as much on the part of the colonial authorities "'as on that of the government at home.' "'And whose fault is that?' asked the other, somewhat warmly. "'Why, that of the government at home, too.' Why do they appoint incompetent men? Why do they appoint ignorant men? Why do they exclude from every office of honour, profit, trust, or emolument the good men of the provinces, who know the situation and the wants and the habits of the provinces, and put over us men who, if they were the best men in the world, would be inferior, from want of experience, to our own people, but who are nothing more than a set of presuming, ignorant, grasping bloodsuckers who are chosen because they are related to a minister or a minister's mistress, or perhaps his valet, and whose only object is to make as much out of us as they can, and then get back again. I do not say they are all so, but a great many of them are, and that is an insult and an injury to us. He spoke evidently with a good deal of heat, but his feelings were those of a vast multitude of the American colonists, and those feelings were preparing the way for a great revolution. "'Come, come, Woodchuck!' exclaimed Walter Prevost with a laugh. "'You are growing warm, and when you are angry you bite. The Major wants to hear your notions of the state of the English power here, not your censure of the King's government.' "'God bless King George,' cried the other warmly, "'and send him all prosperity. "'There's not a more loyal man in the land than I am, "'but it vexes me all the more to see his ministers "'throwing away his people's hearts "'and losing his possessions into the bargain. "'But I'll tell you how it is, Major, "'at least how I think it is, and then you'll see. "'But I must go back a bit. "'Here are we, the English, in the middle of this North America, "'and we have got the French on both sides of us.' "'Well, we have a right to the country all across the continent, "'and we must have it, for it is our only safety. "'But the French don't want us to be safe, "'and so they are trying to get behind us and push us into the sea. "'They have been trying it for a long time, and we have taken no notice. "'They have pushed their posts from Canada right along by the Wabash "'and the Ohio, from Lake Erie to the Mississippi, "'and they have built forts and one over the Indians, "'drawing a string round us, "'and they will tighten every day unless we act.' "'And what have the ministers been doing all this time? "'Why, for a long time they did nothing at all. First, the French were suffered boldly to call the country their own "'and to carry our traders and trappers and send them into Canada, "'and never a word was said by our people. "'Then they built fort after fort till troops can march "'and goods can go with little or no trouble from Quebec to New Orleans. "'And all that this produced was a speech from Governor Hamilton "'and a message from Governor Dinwiddie. The last, indeed, sent to England and made representation, but all he got was an order to repel force by force if he could, but to be quite sure that he did so on the undoubted territories of King George, and doubted why the French made the doubt and then took advantage of it. Dinwiddie, however, had some spirit, and with what help he could get he began to build a fort himself in the best chosen spot of the whole country, just by the meeting of the Ohio and the Monongahela, but he had only one man, to the French ten, and not a regular company amongst them. So the French marched with a thousand soldiers and plenty of cannon and stores, turned his people out, took possession of his half-finished fort, and completed it themselves. That was not likely to make the Indians respect us. Well, then Colonel Washington, the Virginian, and the best man in the land, built Fort Necessity, 
but they left him without forces to defend it, and he was obliged to surrender to Villiers, and a force big enough to eat him up. That did not raise us with the Redskins, and the French force never moved without a whole herd of Indians, supposed to be in friendship with us, but ready to scalp us when we were defeated. Then came Braddock's mad march upon Fort Duquesne, where he and almost all who were with him were killed by a handful of Indians amongst the bushes, fifteen hundred men dispersed, killed and scalped by not four hundred savages, all the artillery taken and baggage beyond count think of that then shirley made a great parade of marching against fort niagara and he turned back almost as soon as he set out and had it not been for some good luck on the north side of massachusetts bay and the victory of johnson over the Eskow, you would not have had a tribe to hold fast to us they were all wavering as fast as they could i could see it as plain as possible from old hendrick's talk and the french jesuits were in among them day and night to bring the five nations over this was the year before last well what did they do last year nothing at all but lose oswego lord loudon and abercrombie and webb marched and countermarched and consulted and played the fool while montcalm was besieging mercer taking oswego breaking the terms he had expressly granted and suffering his indians to scalp and torture his prisoners of war before his eyes well this was just about the middle of august but it was judged too late to do anything that year and nothing was done there was merry work in albany and people danced and sang but the indians got a strange notion that the english lion was better at roaring than he was at biting and now major what have we done this year to make up for the blunders of the last five or six why lord loudon stripped the whole of this province of its men and guns to go to halifax and attack Louisbourg. when he got to halifax he exercised his men for a month heard a false report that Louisbourg was too strong and too well prepared to be taken and sailed back to new york in the meantime montcalm took fort william henry on lake george and as usual let the garrison be butchered by the indians so now the redskins see the english arms contemptible on every part of this continent and the french complete masters of the lakes and the whole western country the five nations see their long house open to our enemies on three sides and not a step taken to give them assistance or protection we have abandoned them can you expect them not to abandon us the young officer long before this painful question was asked had leaned his elbow on the table and covered his eyes and part of his face with his hand walter and edith both gazed at him earnestly while their father bent his eyes gloomily down on the table all three sympathizing with the feelings of a british officer while listening to such a detail the expression they could not see but the fine cut ear appearing from beneath the curls of his hair glowed like fire before the speaker finished he did not answer, however, for more than a moment, but then, raising his head with a look of stern gravity, he replied, "'I cannot expect it. I cannot even understand how they have remained attached to us so long and so much.' "'The influence of one man has done a great deal,' replied Mr. Prevas. "'Sir William Johnson is what is called the Indian agent, and whatever may be thought of his military ability, there can be no doubt that the Iroquois trust him.' and love him more than they have ever trusted or loved a white man before he is invariably just toward them he always keeps his word with them and never yields to importunity or refuses to listen to reason and he places that implicit confidence in them which enlists everything that is noble in the indian character in his favour thus in his presence and in their dealings with him they are quite a different people from what they are with others all their fine qualities are brought into action and all their wild passions are stilled i should like to see them as they really are said the young officer eagerly and then turning to woodchuck he said you tell me you are going amongst them my friend can you not take me with you wait three days and i will replied the other i am first going up the mohawk as i told you close by sir william's castle and hall as he calls the places you'll see little there but if you will promise to do just as I tell you and take advice, I'll take you up to Sandy Hill and the creek where you'll see enough of them. That will be after I come back on Friday about noon. Mr. Prevost looked at the young officer, and he at his entertainer, and then the former asked, 
"'When will you bring him back, Captain? "'He must be here again by next Tuesday night.' "'That he shall be, with or without his scalp,' answered Woodchuck with a laugh. "'You get him ready to go, for you know, Prevost, the, the forest is not the parade ground.' "'I will lend him my Gakar and Gisea and Gastoe,' cried Walter. "'That will make him quite an Indian.' "'No, no,' answered Woodchuck. "'That won't do, Walter. "'The man who tries to please an Indian by acting like an Indian makes naught of it. "'They know it's a cheat, and they don't like it. "'We have our ways. "'They have theirs. "'And let each keep his own, like honest men. "'So I think, and so the Indian think. "'Putting on a lion's skin will never make a man a lion. "'Get him some good, tough leggings, "'and a coat that won't tear, "'a rifle and an axe and a wood-knife, a bottle of brandy is no bad thing, but don't forget the calumet and a bunch of tobacco, for both may be needful. So now good-bye to you all. I must trot. Thus saying, he rose from the table, and without more ceremonious adieu, left the room. End of chapter 3「Chapter 4 of Ticonderoga by George Payne Rainsford James this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 4 When Brooks had left them, half an hour was spent in one of those pleasant after-breakfast dreams, when the mind seems to take a moment's hesitating pause before grappling with the active business of the day. But little was said. Each gazed forth from window or from door, each thought perhaps of the other, and each drank in sweet sensations from the scene before the eyes. Each thought of the other, I have said, and when such is the case, how infinite are the varieties into which thought moulds itself. Walter paused and pondered upon the stranger's state and objects, asked himself who he was, what could be his errand, how, why he came thither. Major Kilmansegi he knew him not to be. A chance word had shown him not only his rank and station, but shown also that there was a secret to be kept, a secret to which perhaps his imagination lent more importance than it deserved. He was an English peer, the young man knew, one of rank, with which in former years he had been accustomed to mingle, and for which, notwithstanding all that had passed, and lapse of time and varied circumstances, he retained an habitual veneration. But what could have led a British peer to that secluded spot? What could be the circumstances which, having led him thither, had suddenly changed his purpose of proceeding onward, and induced him to remain a guest in his father's cottage, in a state of half-concealment? Could it be Lord Loudon, he asked himself, the commander-in-chief of the royal forces, whose conduct had been so severely censured in his own ears by the man just gone? It was not by accident that Lord H. and Edith Prevost met there. It was for the working out of their mutual destiny under the hand of God, for if there be a God, there is a special providence. "'This is very lovely, Miss Prevost,' said the young soldier, when the long meditative lapse was drawing to a close. "'But I should think the scene would become somewhat monotonous. Hemmed in by these woods, the country round, though beautiful in itself, must pall upon the taste.' "'Oh, no!' cried Edith eagerly. "'It is full of variety. Each day affords something new, and every morning walk displays a thousand fresh beauties.' Let us go and take a ramble, if you have nothing better to do, and I will show you there is no monotony. Come, Walter, take your rifle and go with us. Father, this is not your hour. Can you never come before the sun has passed his height, and see the shadows fall the other way? Mine is the evening hour, my child, answered Mr. Prevost, somewhat sadly. But go, Edith, and show our noble friend the scenes you so much delight in. He will need something to make his stay in this dull place somewhat less heavy. The stranger made no complimentary reply, for his thoughts were busy with Edith, and he was at that moment comparing her frank, unconscious, undesigning offer to lead him through the love-like woods and glades, 
with the wily hesitation of a court coquette. "'Perhaps you are not disposed to walk,' said Edith, marking his reverie and startling him from it. "'I shall be delighted,' he said eagerly, and truly, too. "'You must forgive me for being somewhat absent, Miss Prevost. Your father knows I have much to think of, though indeed thought at present is vain, and you will confer a boon by banishing that idle but importunate companion.' "'Oh, then, you shall not think at all when you are with me,' said Edith, smiling, and away she ran to cover her head with one of those black wimples, very generally worn by the women of that day. Beyond the cultivated ground, as you descended the gentle hill, lay the deep forest at the distance of some three hundred yards, and at its edge Edith paused and made her companion turn to see how beautiful the cottage looked upon its eminence, shaded by gorgeous maple-trees in their gold and crimson garb of autumn with a tall rock or two of grey and mossy stone rising up amidst them lord h gazed at the house and saw that it was picturesque and beautiful very different indeed from any other dwelling he had seen on the western side of the atlantic but there was absent thoughtfulness in his eyes and edith thought he did not admire it half enough "'How strange are men's prejudices and prepossessions,' said Lord H., as they paused to gaze at a spot where a large extent of low woodland lay open to the eye below them. "'We are incredulous of everything we have not seen, or to the conception of which we have not been led by very near approaches. Had anyone shown me, ere I reached these shores, a picture of an autumn scene in America?' though it had been perfect as a portrait, hue for hue, or even inferior in its striking colouring, to the reality, I should have laughed at it as a most extravagant exaggeration. Did not the first autumn you passed here make you think yourself in fairyland? No, I was prepared for it, replied Edith. My father had described the autumn scenery to me often before we came. "'Then he was ever in America before he came to settle?' asked her companion. "'Yes, once,' answered Edith. She spoke in a very grave tone, and then ceased suddenly. But her brother took up the subject with the boy's frankness, saying, "'Did you ever hear that my grandfather and my father's sister died in Virginia? He was in command there, and my father came over just before my birth.' "'It is a long story, and a sad one, my lord,' said Edith, with a sigh. "'But look now as we mount the hill, and see how the scene changes. "'Every step upon the hillside gives us a different sort of tree, "'and the brush disappears from amidst the trunks. "'This grove is my favourite evening seat, "'where I can read and think under the broad, shady boughs, "'with nothing but beautiful sights around me. "'Truly this is an enchanting scene.' It wants, methinks, but the figure of an Indian in the foreground, and there comes one, I fancy, to fill up the picture. Stay, stay, we shall want no rifles. It is but a woman coming through the trees. It is a tetzer, it is the blossom, cried Edith and Walter in a breath, as they looked forward to a spot where across the yellow sunshine as it streamed through the trees, a female figure, clad in the gaily embroidered and bright-coloured gaka, or petticoat of the indian women was seen advancing with a rapid yet somewhat doubtful step edith without pause or hesitation sprang forward to meet the newcomer and in a moment after the beautiful arms of the indian girl who had sat with walter in the morning were round the fair form of his sister and her lips pressed on hers there was a warmth and eagerness in their meeting unusual on the part of the red race but while the young Oneida almost lay upon the bosom of her white friend, her beautiful dark eyes were turned towards her lover, as with a mixture of the bashful feelings of youth and the consciousness of having something to conceal, Walter, with a glowing cheek, lingered a step or two behind his sister. "'Art thou coming to our lodge, dear Blossom?' asked Edith, and then added, "'Where is thy father?' "'We both come,' answered the girl in pure English, with no more of the Indian accent than served to give a peculiar softness to her tones. I wake the black eagle here since dawn of day. He has gone toward the morning with our father the white heron, 
for we heard the Hurons by the side of Corlear, and some thought the hatchet would be unburied. So he journeyed to hear more from our friends by Horicon, and bade me stay and tell you and your brother Walter to forbear that road if I saw you turn your eyes toward the east wind. He and White Heron will be by your father's council fire with the first star. A good deal of this speech was unintelligible to Lord H., who had now approached, and on whom Blossom's eyes were turned with a sort of timid and inquiring look. But Walter hastened to interpret, saying, She means that her father and the missionary, Mr. Gore, have heard that there are hostile Indians on the shores of Lake Champlain, and have gone down toward Lake George to inquire. For Black Eagle, that is her father, is much our friend, and he always fancies that my father has chosen a dangerous situation here, just at the verge of the territory of the Five Nations, or their long house, as they call it. "'Well, come to the lodge with us, dear Blossom,' said Edith, while her brother was giving this explanation. "'You know my father loves you well, and will be glad to have the Blossom with us. Here, too, is an English chief dwelling with us, who knows not what sweet blossoms grow on Indian trees.' But the girl shook her head, saying, "'Nay, I must do the father's will. It was with much praying that he let me come hither with him,' and he bade me stay here from the white rock to the stream. So must I obey. But it may be dangerous, replied Edith, if there be Hurons so near, and it is sadly solitary, dear sister. Then stay with me for a while, said the girl, who would not affect to deny that her lonely watch was somewhat gloomy. I will stay with her and protect her, cried Walter eagerly, but, dearest Blossom, if we should see danger, you must fly to the lodge. Yes, stay with her, Walter. Oh, yes, stay with her, said the unconscious Edith. And so it was settled, for Atezza made no opposition, though with a cheek in which something glowed through the brown, and with a lip that curled gently with a meaning smile, she asked, Perhaps my brother Walter would be elsewhere. He may find a long watch wearisome on the hill and in the wood. "'Let us stay a while ourselves,' said Lord H., seating himself on the grass and gazing forth with a look of interest over the prospect. "'Methinks this is a place where one may well dream away an hour without the busiest mind reproaching itself for inactivity.' For two hours the four sat there on the hillside, beneath the tall, shady trees, with the wind breathing softly upon them, the lake glittering before their eyes, the murmur of the waterfall sending music through the air. But to the young Englishman these were but accessories. The fair face of Edith was before his eyes, the melody of her voice in his ears. At length, however, they rose to go, promising to send one of the slaves from the house with food for Walter and Otezza at the hour of noon, and Lord H. and his fair companion took their way back toward the house. The distance was not very far, but they were somewhat long upon the way. They walked slowly back, and by a different path from that by which they went, and often they stopped to admire some pleasant scene, and often Lord H. had to assist his fair companion over some rock, and her soft hand rested in his. He gathered for her flowers, the fringed gentian, and other late blossoms, and they paused to examine them closely, and comment on their loveliness, and once he made her sit down beside him on a bank and tell him the names of all the different trees, and from trees his conversation went on into strange, dreamy, indefinite talk of human beings and human hearts. Thus noon was not far distant when they reached the house, and both Edith and her companion were very thoughtful. Edith was meditative through the rest of the day, was it of herself, she thought? Was it of him, who had been her companion, through the greater part of the morning? There had been no word spoken, there had been no sign given, there had been no intimation to make the seal tremble on the fountain, but the master of its destiny was near. She had had a pleasant ramble with one such as she seldom saw, and that was all. There had been something that day in the manner of her brother Walter, a hesitation, and yet an eagerness, 
a timidity unnatural, with a warmth that spoke of passion which had not escaped her eye. In the sweet Indian girl, too, she had seen signs not equivocal. The fluttering blush, the look full of soul and feeling, the glance suddenly raised to the boy's face and suddenly withdrawn, the eyes full of liquid light, now beaming brightly under sudden emotion, now shaded beneath the long fringe like the moon beneath a passing cloud. For the first time it seemed to her that a dark, impenetrable curtain was falling between herself and all the ancient things of history, that all indeed was to be new and strange and different. And yet she loved a Tate so well, and had in the last two years seen many a trait which had won esteem as well as love. The old Black Eagle, as her father was called, had ever been a fast and faithful ally of the English but to Mr. Prevost he had attached himself in a particular manner. An accidental journey on the part of the old Satcham had first brought them acquainted, and from that day forward the distance of the Oneida settlement was no impediment to their meeting. Whenever the Black Eagle left his lodge he was sure, in his own figurative language, to wing his flight sooner or later toward the nest of his white brother, and, in despite of Indian habits, he almost invariably brought his daughter with him. When any distance or perilous enterprise was on hand, a tater was left at the lodge of the English family, and many a week had she passed there at a time, loved by and loving all its inmates. It was not there, however, that she had acquired her perfect knowledge of the English language or the other characteristics which distinguished her from the ordinary Indian women. When she first appeared there, she spoke the language of the settlers as perfectly as they did, and it was soon discovered that from infancy she had been under the care and instruction of one of the English missionaries. At that time, alas, few, who had sacrificed all that civilized life could bestow for the purpose of bringing the Indian savages into the fold of Christ. Mr. Prevost judged it quite right that Walter should stay with Otezza, and he even sent out the old slave Agrippa, who somehow was famous as a marksman, with a rifle on his shoulder, to act as a sort of scout upon the hillside and watch anything bearing a hostile aspect. After dinner, too, he walked out himself, and sat for an hour with his son and the Indian girl, speaking words of affection to her that sunk deep into her heart, and more than once brought drops into her bright eyes. No father's tenderness could exceed that he showed her, and Otezza felt as if he were almost welcoming her as a daughter. Evening had not lost its light when a shout from Walter's voice announced that he was drawing nigh the house, and in a moment after he was coming across the cleared land with his bright young companion and two other persons. One was a tall, red man, upward of six feet in height, dressed completely in the Indian garb, but without paint. He could not have been less than sixty years of age, but his strong muscles seemed to have set at defiance the bending power of time. He was as upright as a pine, and he bore his heavy rifle in his right hand as lightly as if it had been a reed. In his left he carried a long pipe, showing that his errand was one of peace, though in his belt were a tomahawk and a scalping knife and he wore the sort of feather crown, or gustaway, distinguishing the chief. The other man might be of the same age or a little older. He too seemed active and strong for his years, but he wanted the erect and powerful bearing of the other, and his gait and carriage, as much as his features and complexion, distinguished him from the Indian. His dress was a strange mixture of ordinary European costume, and that of the half-savage rangers of the forest. He wore a black coat, or one that had once been black, but the rest of his garments were composed of skins, some tanned into red leather, after the Indian fashion, some with the hair still on, and turned outward. He bore no arms whatever, unless a very long, sharp-pointed knife could be considered a weapon, though in his hands it only served the unusual service of dividing his food or carving willow-whistles for the children of the Satcham's tribe. 
running with a light foot by the side of the chief as he strode along, came Ortezza, but all the others followed the Indian fashion, coming after him in single file, while old Agrippa, with his rifle on his arm, brought up the rear, appearing from the woods somewhat behind the rest. "'It is seldom I have so many parties of guests in two short days,' said Mr. Prevost, moving toward the door. "'Generally I have either a whole tribe at once, or none at all. "'But this is one of my best friends, my lord, and I must go to welcome him.' "'He is a noble-looking man,' said the young officer, following. "'This is the Black Eagle, I suppose, whom the pretty maiden talked of.' Mr. Prevost made no reply, for by this time the chief's long strides had brought him almost to the door, and his hand was already extended to grasp that of his white friend. "'Welcome, Black Eagle,' said Mr. Prevost. "'Thou art thy brother,' said the chief in English, but of a much less pure character than that of his daughter. "'What news from Corlear? asked Mr. Prevost. But the Indian answered not, and the man who followed him replied in so peculiar a style that we must give his words, although they imported very little, as far as the events to be related are concerned. "'All is still on the banks of Champlain Lake,' he said, "'but Huron tracks are still upon the shore. "'The friendly Mohawks watch them come and go, "'and tell us that the Frenchman, too, was there, "'painted and feathered like the Indian chiefs, "'but finding England stronger than they thought "'upon the side of Horicon, "'they sailed back to Fort Carillon on Monday last.' For an instant, Lord H. was completely puzzled to discover what it was that gave such peculiarity to the missionary's language, for the words and accent were those of an ordinary Englishman of no very superior education, and it was not until Mr. Gore had uttered one or two sentences more that he perceived that what he said often arranged itself into a sort of blank verse, not very poetical, not very musical even, but scannable easily enough. In the meanwhile, the Black Eagle and his host had entered the house and proceeded straight to the great eating hall, where the whole party seated themselves in silence, Otatsa taking her place close to the side of Edith, while Walter stationed himself where he could watch the bright girl's eyes without being remarked himself. For a moment or two no one spoke, in deference to the Indian habits, and then Mr. Prevost broke silence, saying, "'Well, Black Eagle, how fares it with my brother?' "'As with the tamarack in the autumn,' answered the warrior, "'the cold wind sighs through the branches, "'and the fine leaves wither and fall, "'but the branch stands firm as yet, "'and decay has not reached the heart.' "'This is a chief from the land of my white fathers,' "'said Mr. Prevost, waving his hand gracefully toward Lord H. "'He has but lately crossed the great water.' "'He is welcome in what was once the red man's land,' "'said Black Eagle.' and bending his eyes upon the ground, but without any sign of emotion, at the thoughts which seemed to be beneath his words, he lapsed into silence for a minute or two. Then raising his head again, he asked, "'Is he a great chief? Is he a warrior, or a man of counsel, or a medicine man?' "'He is a great chief and a warrior,' answered Mr. Prevost. "'He is, moreover, skilled in counsel, and his words are clear as the waters of Horicon. He is welcome, repeated the chief. He is our brother. He shall be called the cataract, because he shall be powerful, and many shall rejoice at the sound of a calm voice. But, my brother... Speak on, said Mr. Prevost, seeing that he paused. They are friendly ears that listen. Thou art too near the Kataki. "'Thou art too near to Corlear,' said the warrior, meaning the river, St. Lawrence, and Lake Champlain. "'There is danger for our brother, and the wings of the Black Eagle droop when he is in his solitary place afar, midst the children of the stone, to think that thou art not farther within the walls of the Longhouse.' "'What does he mean by the walls of the Longhouse?' asked Lord H. in a whisper, addressing Edith. "'Merely the territory of the five nations, or Iroquois, as the French call them,' answered his fair companion. "'I fear not, brother,' answered Mr. Prevost. "'The fire and the iron have not met to make the tomahawk which shall reach my head.' "'But for the maiden's sake,' said Black Eagle, "'is she not unto us as a daughter? 
Is she not the sister of Otezza? I pray thee, white pine tree, let her go with the eagle and the blossom into the land of the children of the stone, but for a few moons, till thy people have triumphed over their enemies, and till the five nations have hewed down the trees of the Huron and the Algonquin, till the war hatchet is buried and the pipe of peace is smoked. To a better, truly, my good friend Prevost, said Mr. Gore, we have seen sights to-day would make the blood of the most bold and hardy man on earth turn cold and icy to behold, and know he had a daughter near such scenes of death. What were they, my good friend? asked Mr. Prevost. I have heard of nothing very new or near. The last was the capture of Fort William Henry some six weeks since, but as yet we have not heard the whole particulars, and surely, if we are far enough away for the tidings not to reach us in six weeks, it is not likely that hostile armies would approach us very soon. Thou art deceived, my brother, answered Black Eagle. One short day's journey lies betwixt thee and the battlefield. This morning we crossed when the sun wanted half an hour of noon, and we are here before he has gone down behind the forest. What we saw chilled the blood of my brother here, for he has not seen such things before. The children of stone slay not women and children when the battle is over. "'Speak, speak, my good friend, Mr. Gore,' said the master of the house. "'You know our habits better and can tell us more of what has happened. Things which are common to his eye may be strange to yours.' "'We passed the ground between the one fort and the other,' answered the missionary. "'The distance is but seven or eight miles, "'and in that short space lay well nigh a thousand human bodies "'slain by every dark and terrible means of death. "'There were young and old, the grey-headed officer, "'the blooming youth, fresh from his mother's side, "'women and boys and girls, "'and little infants snatched from the mother's breast "'to die by the hatchet or the war-club. We heard the tiger Montcalm in violation of his given word, in defiance of humanity, Christianity, and the spirit of a gentleman, stood by and saw his own convention broken, and gallant enemies massacred by his savage allies. But what the chief says is very true, my friend. You are far too near this scene, and although perhaps no regular army could reach this place ere you received timely warning, Yet the Indian forerunners may be upon you at any moment, your house in flames, and you and your children massacred, ere any one could come to give you aid. The troops of our country are far away, and no force is between you and Horicon, but a small body of our Mohawk brethren, who are not as well pleased with England as they have been. Mr. Prevost turned his eyes toward Lord H., and the young Englishman replied to Mr. Gore at once, saying, with a quiet inclination of the head, "'On one point you are mistaken, sir. Lord Loudon has returned, and there is now a strong force at Albany. I passed through that city lately, and I think that by the facts which must have come to his knowledge, General Montcalm will be deterred from pushing his brutal incursions further this year at least. Before another shines upon him, he may receive some punishment for his faithless cruelty. "'If not here, hereafter,' said the missionary, "'there is justice in heaven, sir, and often it visits the evildoer upon earth. "'That man's end cannot be happy. "'But I fear you will not give us aid in persuading our friend here "'to abandon for a time his very dangerous position.' "'I know too little of Mr. Prevost's affairs,' replied Lord H., "'to advise either for or against.' I know still less of the state of the country between this and the French line. Perhaps in a day or two I may know more, and then, as a military man myself, I can better tell him what are the real dangers of his situation. At all events, I should like to think over the matter till to-morrow morning before I offer an opinion. From what was said just now, I infer that the Hurons and the French have gone back, that there can be no immediate peril." Mr. Gore shook his head, and the Indian chief remained in profound and somewhat dull silence, seeming not very well pleased with the result of the discussion. A few minutes after, the evening meal was brought in, and to it, at least, the Black Eagle did ample justice, eating like a European with a knife and fork, and displaying no trace of the savage in his demeanour at the table. 
He remained profoundly silent, however, till the party rose, and then, taking Mr. Prevost's hand, he said, "'Take counsel of thine own heart, my brother. Think of the flower that grows up by thy side. Ask if thou wouldst have it trodden down by the red man's moccasin, and listen not to the cataract, for it is cold.' Thus saying, he unrolled one of the large skins which lay at the side of the room, and stretched himself upon it to take repose. Edith took a tater by the hand, saying, "'Come, Blossom, you shall be my companion as before.' And Walter, retiring the moment after, left Lord H. and his host to consult together with Mr. Gore. End of chapter 4"'Chapter Five of Ticonderoga by George Payne Rainsford James. "'This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. "'Chapter Five. "'One hour after the sun had risen again, three travellers took their way onward "'from the house of Mr. Prevost, along a path which led to the northeast. Two other persons watched them from the door of the house, "'and two negro men and a negro woman gazed after them, from a corner of the building which joined on to a low fence, encircling the stable and poultry yard, and running on round the well-cultivated kitchen garden. The negro woman shook her head and looked sorrowful and sighed, but said nothing. The two men talked freely of the imprudence of Master in suffering his son to go upon such an expedition. Mr. Prevost and his daughter gazed in silence till the receding figures were hidden by the trees. Then the master of the house led Edith back, saying, "'God will protect him, my child. A parent was not given to crush the energies of youth, but to direct them.' In the meanwhile, Lord H. and his guide, Captain Brooks, according to his English name, or Woodchuck, in the Indian parlance, followed by Walter Prevost, made their way rapidly and easily through the wood. The two former were dressed in the somewhat anomalous attire which I have described in first introducing the worthy captain to the reader, but Walter was in the ordinary costume of the people of the province of that day, except inasmuch as he had his rifle in his hand and a large leathern wallet slung over his left shoulder. Each of his companions, too, had a rifle hung across the back by a broad leathern band, and each was furnished with a hatchet at his girdle, and a long pipe with a curiously carved stem in his hand. Although they were not pursuing any of the public provincial roads, and were consequently obliged to walk singly, the one following the other, yet Woodchuck, who led the way, had no difficulty in finding it, or in proceeding steadily. We are told by an old writer of those days, who, unlike many modern writers, witnessed all he described with his own eyes, that the Indian trails, or footpaths, were innumerable over that large tract of country, which the five nations called their long house. Crossing and recrossing each other in every different direction, sometimes almost lost where the ground was hard and dry, sometimes indenting by the repeated pressure of many feet, the natural soil to the depth of thirty-six or forty inches. It was along one of these that the travellers were passing, and although a stump here and there, or a young tree springing up in the midst of a trail, offered an occasional impediment, it was rarely of such a nature as to retard the travellers in their course, or materially add to their fatigue. With the calm assurance and unhesitating rapidity of a practised woodsman, Brooks led his two companions forward without doubt as to his course. No great light had he, it is true, for though the sun was actually above the horizon, and now and then his slanting rays found their way through some more open space, and gilded the pathway, in general, the thick trees and underwood formed a shade, which at that early hour the light could hardly penetrate, and the sober morning was to these travellers still dressed almost in the dark hues of night. "'Set your steps in mine, said Woodchuck, speaking in a whisper over his shoulder to Lord H., then we shall be real Indians. Don't you know that when they go out on the war-path, as they call it, 
each man puts down his foot just where his leader put down his before so come dog come cat no one can tell how many went to jack pilbury's barn but do you think there is any real danger asked lord h there is always danger in a dark wood and a dark eye answered woodchuck with a laugh but no more danger here than in prevost's cottage from either the one or the other for you or for walter as for me i am safe anywhere but you are taking strange precautions where there is no danger replied lord h who could not banish all doubts of his wild companion you speak in whispers and advise us to follow all the cunning devices of the indians in a wood which we passed through fearlessly yesterday i am just as fearless now as you were then if you passed through this wood answered brooks in a graver tone but you are not a woodsman or you'd understand better what i mean sir is that we are so often in danger we think it best to act as if we were always in it and never knowing how near it may be to make sure as we can that we keep it at a distance you cannot tell there is not an indian eye in every bush you pass and yet you'd chatter as loud as if you were in any lady's drawing-room but i though i know there is ne'er a one don't speak louder than a grasshopper's hind legs for fear i would get into the habit of talking loud in the forest there is some truth my friend i believe in what you say replied lord h but i hear a sound growing louder and louder as we advance it is the cataract i suppose yes just the waterfall answered the other in an indifferent tone down half a mile below it master walter will find the boat that will take him to albany then you and i snake up by the side of the river till we have gone as far as we have a mind to i shouldn't wonder if we got a shot at somewhat on four a moose or a painter or a look severe or something of that kind pity we haven't got a canoe or a bateau or something to put our game in in heaven's name what do you call a look severe asked lord h why the french folks call it a loup servier answered brooks i guess you never saw one but he is not as pleasant as a pretty maid in a by-place is he walter he puts himself up into a tree and there he watches looking full asleep but with the devil that is in him moving every joint of his tail the moment he hears anything come trotting along and when it is just under him he drops upon it plump like a rifle shot into a pumpkin the conversation then fell off into a word or two spoken now and then and the voice of the waters grew loud and more loud until lord h could hardly hear his own footfalls the more practised ear of brooks however caught every sound and at length he exclaimed what's alive why are you cocking your rifle walter hush said the lad there is something stealing on there just behind the bushes it is an indian i think going on all fours look quietly out there more likely a bear replied woodchuck in the same low tone which the other had used i see i see it's not a bear either but it's not an indian it's gone no there it is again hold hard let him climb it's a painter here walter come up in front you shall have him the cur smells fresh meat he'll climb in an instant there he goes no the critter's on again we shall lose him if we don't mind quick walter spread out there to the right i will take the left and we shall drive him to the water where he must climb you major keep right on ahead mind take the middle trail all along and look up at the branches or you may have him on your head there he's heading south quick walter quick lord h had as yet seen nothing of the object discovered by the eyes of his two companions but he had sufficient of the sportsman in his nature to enter into all their eagerness and unslinging his rifle he followed the path or trail along which they had been proceeding while walter prevost darted away into the tangled bushes on his right and woodchuck stole more quietly in among the trees on his left he could hear the branches rustle and for nearly a quarter of a mile could trace their course on either side of him by the various little signs of now a waving branch now a slight sound once and only once he thought he saw the panther cross the trail 
but it was at a spot peculiarly dark, and he did not feel at all sure that fancy had not deceived him. The roar of the cataract in the meantime increased each moment, and it was evident to the young nobleman that he and his companions on their different courses were approaching more and more closely to some large stream, towards which it was the plan of good Captain Brooks to force the object of their pursuit. At length, too, the light became stronger, and he heard the report of a rifle, then a fierce snarling sound, and then a shout from Walter Prevost. Knowing how dangerous the wounded panther is, the young officer, without hesitation, darted away into the brush to aid Edith's brother, for by this time it was in that light that he generally thought of him, and the lad soon heard his approach and guided him by his voice, calling, "'Here! Here!' There was no alarm or agitation in his tones. They were rather those of triumph, and a moment after, as he caught sight of his friend coming forward, he added, "'He's a splendid beast. I must have the skin off him.' Lord H. drew nigh, somewhat relaxing his speed when he found there was no danger, and in another minute he was by the side of the lad, who was quietly recharging his rifle, while at some six or seven yards' distance lay a large panther of the American species, mortally wounded and quite powerless of evil, but not yet quite dead. "'Keep away from him! Keep away!' cried Walter, as the young nobleman approached. "'They sometimes tear on terribly, even at the last gasp. "'Why, he is nearly as big as a tiger,' said Lord H. "'He is a splendid fellow,' answered Walter joyfully. "'One might live a hundred years in England without finding such game.' Lord H. smiled and remained for a moment or two till the young man's rifle was reloaded, gazing at the beast in silence. Suddenly, however, they both heard the sound of another rifle on the left, and Walter exclaimed, "'Woodchuck has got one, too!' but the report was followed by a yell very different from the snarl or growl of a wounded beast. "'That's no panther's cry!' exclaimed Walter Prevost, his cheek turning somewhat pale. "'What can have happened?' "'It sounded like a human voice,' said Lord H., listening, like that of someone in sudden agony. "'I trust our friend the woodchuck has not shot himself by some accident.' "'It was not a white man's voice,' said Walter, bending his ear in the direction from which had come the sounds. But all was still, and the young man raised his voice and shouted to his companion. No answer was returned, however, and Lord H., exclaiming, "'We had better seek him at once. He may need help,' darted away toward the spot whence his ear told him the shot had come. "'A little more to the right, my lord, a little more to the right,' said Walter, "'You will hit on a trail in a minute.' "'And raising his voice again, he shouted, "'Woodchuck! Woodchuck!' "'with evident alarm and distress. "'He was right in the supposition "'that they should soon find some path. "'They quickly struck an Indian trail, "'crossing that on which they had been previously proceeding, "'and leading in the direction in which they wished to go. "'Both then hurried on with greater rapidity, "'Walter rather running than walking.' and Lord H. following with his rifle cocked in his hand. They had not far to go, however, for the trail soon opened upon a small piece of grassy savanna, lying close upon the river's edge, and in the midst of it they beheld a sight which was terrible enough in itself, but which afforded less apprehension and grief to the mind of Lord H. than to that of Walter Prevost, who was better acquainted with the Indian habits and character. About ten yards from the mouth of the path appeared the powerful form of Captain Brooks, with his folded arms leaning on the muzzle of his discharged rifle. He was as motionless as a statue, his brow contracted, his brown cheek very pale, and his eyes bent forward upon an object lying upon the grass before him. It was the form of a dead Indian, weltering in his blood. The dead man's head was bare of all covering except the scalp-lock. He was painted with the war colours, and in his hand, as he lay, he grasped the tomahawk, as if it had been raised in the act to strike the moment before he fell. To the eyes of Lord H., his tribe or nation was an undiscovered secret, but certain small signs and marks on his garb, and even in his features, showed Walter Prevost at once that he was not only one of the five nations, but an anida. The full and terrible importance of the fact will be seen by what followed. 
For some two minutes the three living men stood silent in the presence of the dead, and Walter exclaimed in a tone of deep grief, "'Alas, Woodchuck, what have you done?' "'Saved my scalp,' answered Brooks sternly, and fell into silence again. There was another long silence, and then Lord H., mistaking in some degree the causes of the man's strong emotion, laid his hand upon the hunter's arm, saying, "'Come away, my friend. Why should you linger here?' "'It's no use,' answered Woodchuck gloomily. "'He had a woman with him, and it will soon be known all through the tribe.' "'But for your own safety,' said Walter, "'you had better fly. "'It is very sad indeed. "'What could make him attack you?' "'An old grudge, Master Walter,' answered Brooks, "'seating himself deliberately on the ground "'and laying his rifle across his knee. "'I knew the critter well. "'The striped snake, they called him, "'and a snake he was.' He tried to cheat and to rob me, and I made it plain to the whole tribe. Some laughed and thought it fair, but old Black Eagle scorned and rebuked him, and he has hated me ever since. He has been long watching for this, and now he has got it. "'Well, well,' said Walter, "'what's done cannot be undone, and you had better get away as fast as may be, for Black Eagle told me he had left three scouts behind to bring tidings in case of danger.' "'and we cannot tell how near the others may be.' "'This was one of them,' answered Brooks, "'still keeping his seat and gazing at the Indian. "'But what is safety to me, Walter? "'I can no more roam the forests. "'I can no more pursue my way of life. "'I must go into dull and smoky cities "'and plod amongst thieving, cheating crowds of white men. "'The rifle and the hatchet must be laid aside for ever. "'The forest grass must know my foot no more.' "'Flowers and green leaves and rushing streams, "'and the broad lake and the mountain-top are lost and gone. "'The watch under the deep boughs and by the silent waters. "'Close-pressed amidst the toiling herd "'I shall become sordid and low and filthy as they are. "'My free nature lost and jives upon my spirit. "'All life's blessings are gone from me. "'Why should I care for life?' There was something uncommonly plaintive, mournful, and earnest in his tones, and Lord H. could not help feeling for him, although he did not comprehend fully the occasion of his grief. "'But, my good friend,' he said, "'I cannot perceive how your having slain this Indian in your own defence can bring such a train of miseries upon you. You would not have killed him if he had not attacked you.' "'Alas for me! Alas for me!' was all the answer the poor man made." "'You do not know their habits, sir,' said Walter, in a low voice. "'They must have blood for blood. "'If he stays here, if he ever returns, "'go where he will in the Indian territory, "'they will attack him. "'They will follow him day and night. "'He will be amongst them like one of the wild beasts "'whom we chase so eagerly, "'pursued from place to place, "'with the hatchet always hanging over his head. "'There is no safety for him, "'but far away in the provinces "'beyond those towns that Indians ever visit.' "'so persuade him to come away and leave the body. "'He can go down with me to Albany "'and thence make his way to New York or Philadelphia.' "'For some minutes Brooks remained deaf to all arguments. "'His whole mind and thoughts seemed occupied with the terrible conviction "'that the wild scenes and the free life which he enjoyed so intensely "'were lost for ever. "'Suddenly, however, when Lord H. was just about to give up in despair "'the task of persuading him, He started up as if some new thought struck him, and gazing first at Walter and then at the young officer, he exclaimed, "'But I am keeping you here, and you too may be murdered. The death spot is upon me, and it will spread to all around. I am ready to go. I will bear my fate as well as I can, but it is very, very hard. Come, let us be gone quick. Stay, I will charge my rifle first. "'Who knows how soon we may need it for such bloody work again?' "'All his energy seemed to have returned in a moment, "'and it deserted him not again. "'He charged his rifle with wonderful rapidity, "'tossed it under his arm, and took a step as if to go. "'Then, for a moment, he paused, "'and advancing close to the dead Indian, gazed at him sternly. "'Oh, my enemy!' he cried. "'Thou saidst thou wouldst have revenge, and thou hast had it far more bitter than if thy hatchet had entered into my skull, and I were lying in thy place. 
Turning round as soon as he had spoken, he led the way back along the trail, murmuring rather to himself than to his companions. The instinct of self-preservation is very strong. Better for me had I let him slay me. I know not how I was fool enough to fire. Come, Walter, we must get round the falls, where we shall find some batteaux that will carry us down. He walked along for some five minutes in silence, and suddenly looked round to Lord H., exclaiming, "'But what's to become of him? How is he to find his way back again? Come, I will go back with him. It matters not if they do catch me and scalp me. I do not like to be dogged and tracked and followed and taken unawares. I can but die at last.' "'I will go back with him as soon as you are in the boat, Walter.' "'No, no, Woodchuck, that will not do,' replied the lad. "'You forget that if they found you with him, they will kill him, too. "'I will tell you how we will manage it. "'Let him come down with us to the point, "'and there is a straight road up to the house, "'and we can get one of the Bateau's men "'to go up with him and show him the way, "'unless he likes to go on with me to Albany.' "'I cannot do that,' replied Lord H., for I promised to be back at your father's house by tomorrow night, and matters of much importance may have to be decided. But I can easily land at the point, as you say, whatever point you may mean, and find my way back. As for myself, I have no fears. There seem to be but a few scattered parties of Indians of different tribes roaming about, and I trust that anything like general hostility is at an end for this year at least." "'In Indian warfare the danger is the greatest, I have heard, when it seems the least,' replied Walter Prevost. "'But from the point to the house, some fourteen or sixteen miles, the road is perfectly safe, for it is the one on which large numbers of persons are passing to and from Albany.' "'It will be safe enough,' said Woodchuck. "'That way is always quiet, and besides, a wise man and a powerful one could travel at any time from one end of the long house to the other without risk.' unless there were special cause. It is bad shooting we have had to-day, Walter, but still I should have liked to have the skin of that panther. He seemed to me an unextinguishable fine critter. He was a fine critter, and that I know, for I shot him, Woodchuck, said Walter Prevost, with some pride in his achievement. I wanted to send the skin to Otezza, but it cannot be helped. "'Let us go and get it now,' cried Woodchuck, with the ruling passion strong in death. "'Tis but a step back. Darn those Injuns! Why should I care?' But both his companions urged him forward, and they continued their way through woods, skirting the river for somewhat more than two miles, first rising gently to a spot where the roar of the waters was heard distinctly, and then, after descending, rising again to a rocky point midway between the highest ground and the water-level, where a small congregation of huts had been gathered together, principally inhabited by boatmen and surrounded by a stout palisade. The scene at the hamlet itself had nothing very remarkable in it. Here were women sitting at the door, knitting and sewing, men lounging about or mending nets or making lines, children playing in the dirt, as usual, both inside and outside of the palisade. The traces of more than one nation could be discovered in the features, as well as in the tongues of the inhabitants, and it was not difficult to perceive that here had been congregated, by the force of circumstances into which it is not necessary to inquire, sundry fragments of Dutch, English, Indian, and even French, races all bound together by a community of object and pursuit. The approach of the three strangers did not in any degree startle the good people from their idleness or their occupations. The carrying trade was then a very good one, especially in remote places where travelling was difficult, and these people could always make a very tolerable livelihood without any very great or continuous exertion. The result of such a state of things is always very detrimental to activity of mind or body, and the boatmen, though they sauntered up round Lord H., and his companions, divining that some profitable piece of work was before them, showed amazing indifference as to whether they would undertake it or not. But that which astonished Lord H. the most was to see the deliberate coolness with which Woodchuck set about making his bargain for the conveyance of himself and Walter to Albany. He sat down upon a large stone within the enclosure, took a knife from his pocket and a piece of wood from the ground, 
and begun cutting the latter with the former with as tranquil and careless an air as if there were no heavy thought upon his mind no dark memory behind him no terrible fate dogging him at the heels but woodchuck and walter were both well known to the boatman and though they might probably have attempted to impose upon the inexperience of the lad they knew they had met their match in the shrewdness of his companion and were not aware that any circumstance rendered speed more valuable to him than money the bargaining then was soon concluded but captain brooks was not contented till he had bargained also for the services of two men in guiding lord h back to the house of mr prevost this was undertaken for a dollar apiece however and then the whole party proceeded to the bank of the river where a boat was soon unmoored and walter and his companion set forth upon their journey not however till lord h had shaken the latter warmly by the hand and said a few words in the ear of captain brooks adding walter will tell you more and how to communicate with me thank you thank you replied the hunter wringing his hand hard a friend in need is a friend indeed i do not want it but i thank you as much as if i did but you shall hear if i do for somehow i guess you are not the man to say what you don't mean after seeing his two companions row down the stream a few yards the young nobleman turned to the boatman who accompanied him saying now my lads i want to make a change of our arrangements and to go back the short way by which we came i did not interrupt our good friend woodchuck because he was anxious about my safety there were some indians in the forest and he feared i might get scalped however we shot a panther there which we could not say to skin as their business in albany was pressing now i want the skin and i am not afraid of the indians are you the men laughed and replied in the negative saying that there were none of the red men there but four or five oneidas and mohawks but adding that the way though shorter was much more difficult and bushy and therefore they must have more pay lord h however was less difficult to deal with than captain brooks and yielded readily to their demands each of the men then armed himself with a rifle and took a bag of parched corn with him and the three set out lord h undertook to guide them to the spot where the panther lay and not a little did they wonder at the accuracy and precision with which his military habits of observation enabled him to direct them step by step he took great care not to let them approach the spot where the dead indian had been slain but turning about a quarter of a mile to the south led them across the thicket to within a very few yards of the object of his search it was soon found when they came near the place and about half an hour was employed in taking off the skin and packing it up for carriage now said lord h will you two undertake to have this skin properly cured and dispatched by the first trader going west to the anida village the men readily agreed to do so if well paid for it but of course required further directions saying there were a dozen or more anida villages it will be sure to reach its destination said lord h if you tell the bearer to deliver it to otetsa which i believe means the blossom the daughter of black eagle the sachem say that it comes from walter prevost oh ay answered the boatman it shall be done but we shall have to pay the man who carries it the arrangement in regard to payment was soon made though it was somewhat exorbitant but to ensure that the commission was faithfully executed lord h reserved a portion of the money to be given when he heard that the skin had been delivered the rest of the journey was passed without interruption or difficulty and at an early hour of the evening the young nobleman once more stood at the door of his fellow countryman's house end of chapter five chapter six of ticonderoga by george payne rainsford james this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter six the return of lord h without his guide and companion captain brooks caused some surprise in mr prevost and his daughter who had not expected to see any of the party before a late hour of the following evening not choosing to explain in the presence of edith the cause of his parting so suddenly from the hunter 
the young nobleman merely said that circumstances had led him to conclude that it would be advisable to send Woodchuck in the boat with Walter to Albany, and his words were uttered in so natural and easy a tone that Edith, unconscious that her presence put any restraint upon his communication with her father, remained seated in their pleasant little parlour till the hour for the evening meal. "'Well, my lord,' said Mr. Prevost, after the first few words of explanation had passed, "'did you meet with any fresh specimens of the Indian in your short expedition?' The question might have been a somewhat puzzling one for a man who did not want to enter into any particulars, but Lord H. replied with easy readiness, "'Only one. Him we saw only for a moment, and he did not speak with us.' "'They are a very curious race,' said Mr. Prevost, "'and albeit not very much given to ethnological studies, "'I have often puzzled myself as to whence they sprang "'and how they made their way over to this continent.' "'Lord H. smiled. "'I fear I cannot help you,' he said. "'Mine is a coarse and unstudious profession, you know, my dear sir, "'and leads one much more to look at things as they are "'than to inquire how they came about.' It strikes me at once, however, that in mere corporeal characteristics the Indian is very different from any race I ever beheld, if I may judge by the few individuals I have seen. Bating the grace and dignity, said Edith gaily, I do think that what my father would call the finest specimens of the human animal are to be found among the Indians. Look at our dear little Otezza, for instance. Can anything be more beautiful, more graceful, more perfect than her whole face and form? Lord H. smiled and slightly bowed his head, saying, Now many a fair lady, Miss Prevost, would naturally expect a very gallant reply, and I might make one without a compliment, in good, cool blood, and upon calm, mature consideration. I am very poorly versed, however, in civil speeches, and therefore I will only say that I think I have seen white ladies as beautiful, as graceful, and as perfect as your fair young friend, together with the advantage of a better complexion. But at the same time I will admit that she is exceedingly beautiful, and not only that, but very charming, and very interesting too. Hers is not exactly the style of beauty I admire the most, but certainly hers is perfect in its kind, and my young friend Walter seems to think so, too. A slight flush passed over Edith's cheek, and her eyes instantly turned toward her father. But Mr. Prevost only laughed, saying, "'If they were not so young, I should be afraid that my son would marry the Satcham's daughter, and perhaps in the end take to the tomahawk and the scalping knife. But, joking apart, a tater is a very singular little creature. I never can bring myself to feel that she is an Indian.' a savage, in short, when I hear her low, melodious voice with its peculiar song-like sort of intonation, and see the grace and dignity with which she moves, and the ease and propriety with which she adapts herself to every European custom. I have to look at her bead-embroidered petticoat and her leggings and moccasins before I can bring it home to my mind that she is not some very high-bred lady of the court of France or England. Then she is so fair, too, but that is probably from care, and the lack of that exposure to the sun which may at first have given and then perpetuated the Indian tint. To use an old homely expression, she is the apple of her father's eye, and he is as careful of her as of a jewel, after his own particular fashion. "'She is a dear creature,' said Edith warmly, "'all soul and heart and feeling. Thank God, too, she is a Christian,' "'And you cannot fancy, my lord, what marvellous stores of information the little creature has. "'She knows that England is an island in the midst of the salt sea, "'and she can write and read our tongue nearly as well as she speaks it. "'She has a holy hatred of the French, however, "'and would not speak a word of their language for the world, "'for all her information and a good share of her ideas "'come from our good friend Mr. Gore, "'who has carried John Bull completely into the heart of the wilderness,' and kept him there perfect in a sort of crystallized state. Had we but a few more men such as himself among the Indian tribes, there would be no fear of any wavering in the friendship of the five nations. There goes an Indian now, past the window. We shall have him in here in a moment, for they stand upon no ceremony. No, he is speaking to Antony, the negro boy. How curiously he peeps about him. 
He must be looking for somebody he does not find. Lord H. rose and went to the window, and in a minute or two after, the Indian stalked quietly away and disappeared in the forest. "'What could he want?' said Edith. "'It is strange he did not come in. I will ask Antony what he sought here.' and going to the door she called the gardener boy up and questioned him you want captain woodchuck missa replied the lad he asked if he not lodge here last night i tell him yes but woodchuck go away early this morning and not come back since he quire very much about him and who went with him i tell him massa walter and de strange gentleman but both leave him soon massa walter go straight to albany strange gentleman come back here did he speak english asked edith few words replied the negro i speak few words indian so patch them together we make many missy and he laughed with that peculiar unmeaning laugh with which his race are accustomed to distinguish anything they consider witty the whole conversation was heard by the two gentlemen within on mr prevost it had no effect but to call a cynical smile upon his lips but the case was different with lord h he saw that the deed which had been done in the forest was known to the Indians, that its doer had been recognised, and that the hunt was up, and he rejoiced to think that poor Woodchuck was already far beyond pursuit. Anxious, however, to gain a fuller insight into the character and habits of a people of whom, as yet, he had obtained but a glimpse, he continued to converse with Mr. Prevost in regard to the aboriginal races, and learned several facts which by no means tended to decrease the uneasiness which the events of the morning had produced the indians said his host in answer to a leading question are as you say a very revengeful people but not more so than many other barbarous nations indeed in many of their feelings and habits they greatly resemble a people i have heard of in central asia called algans both, in common with almost all barbarians, look upon revenge as a duty imperative upon every family and every tribe. They modify their ideas, indeed, in case of war, although it is very difficult to bring about peace after war has commenced. But if any individual of a tribe is killed by another person in time of peace, nothing but the blood of the murderer can satisfy the family or the tribe, if he can be caught. They will pursue him for weeks and months and employ every stratagem which their fertile brains can suggest to entrap him, till they feel quite certain that he is beyond their reach. This perseverance proceeds from a religious feeling, for they believe that the spirit of their dead relation can never enter the happy hunting ground till his blood has been atoned for by that of the slayer. But if they cannot catch the slayer, asked Lord H, what do they do then? I used the wrong expression, replied Mr. Prevost. I should have said the blood of some other victim. It is their duty, according to their ideas, to sacrifice the slayer. If satisfied that he is perfectly beyond their power, they strive to get hold of his nearest relation. If they cannot do that, they take a man of his tribe or nation and sacrifice him. It is all done very formally, and with all sorts of consideration and consultation, for in these bloody rites, they are the most deliberate people in the world, and the most persevering also. A few days before, Lord H. might have plainly and openly told all the occurrences of the morning in the ears of Edith Prevost, but sensations had been springing up in his breast which made him more tender of her feelings, more careful of creating alarm and anxiety, and he kept his painful secret well till after the evening meal was over, and she had retired to her chamber. Then, however, he stopped Mr. Prevost just as that gentleman was raising a light to hand to his guest, and said, "'I am afraid, my good friend, we cannot go to bed just yet. I have something to tell you which, from all I have heard since it occurred, appears to me of much greater importance than at first. Whether anything can be done to avert the evil consequences or not, I cannot tell.' but at all events it is as well that you and I should talk the matter over. He then related to Mr. Prevost all the events of the morning, and was sorry to perceive that gentleman's face assuming a deeper and deeper gloom as he proceeded. "'This is most unfortunate indeed,' said Mr. Prevost at length. "'I quite acquit our poor friend Brooks of any evil intent, 
but to slay an Indian at all, so near our house, and especially an Oneida, was most unlucky. That tribe or nation, as they call themselves, from the strong personal regard, I suppose, which has grown up accidentally between their chief and myself, has always shown the greatest kindness and friendship toward myself and my family. Before this event, I should have felt myself in any of their villages as much at home as by my own fireside, and I am sure that each man felt himself as secure on any part of the lands granted to me as if he were in his own lodge. But now, as they will call it, their blood has stained my very mat, and the consequences no one can foresee. Woodchuck has himself escaped. He has no relations or friends on whom they can wreak their vengeance. Surely, exclaimed Lord H, they will never visit his offence on you or yours. I trust not, replied Mr. Prevost, after a moment's thought, but yet I cannot feel exactly sure. They will take a white man for their victim, an Englishman, one of the same nation as the offender. Probably it may not matter much to them who it is, and the affectionate regard which they entertain towards us may turn the evil aside. But yet these Indians have a sort of fanaticism in their religion, as well as we have in ours. The station and the dignity of the victim which they offer up enters into their consideration, they like to make a worthy and an honourable sacrifice, as they consider it, and just as this spirit moves them or not, they may think that any one will do for their purpose, or that they are required by their god of vengeance, to immolate someone dear to themselves, in order to dignify the sacrifice. This is indeed a very sad view of the affair, which had never struck me, replied Lord H., and it may be well to consider, my dear sir, what is the best and safest course? I must now tell you one of the objects which made me engage your son to carry my dispatches to Albany. It seemed to me, from all I have heard during my short residence with you, especially during my conference with Sir William Johnson, that the unprotected state of this part of the country left Albany itself and the settlements around it unpleasantly exposed. We know that on a late occasion it was Jesco's intention if he had succeeded in defeating Sir William and capturing Fort George, to make a dash at the capital of the province. He was defeated, but there is no reason to believe that Montcalm, a man much his superior both in energy and skill, entertained the same views, although I know not what induced him to retreat so hastily after his black and bloody triumph at Fort William Henry. He may seize some other opportunity, and I can perceive nothing whatsoever to impede his progress or delay him for an hour, if he can make himself master of the few scattered forts which lie between Albany and Carillon or Ticonderoga. In the circumstances, I have strongly urged that a small force should be thrown forward to a commanding point on the river Hudson, not many miles from this place, which I examined as I came hither with an advance post or two still nearer to your house. My own regiment I have pointed out as better fitted for the service than any other, and I think that if my suggestions are attended to, as I doubt not they will be, we can give you efficient protection. But I think, continued the young nobleman, speaking more slowly and emphatically, that with two young people so justly dear to you, with a daughter so beautiful and in every way so charming, and so gallant and noble a lad as Walter, whose high spirit and adventurous character will expose him continually to any snares that may be set for him, it will be much better for you to retire with them both to Albany, at least till such time as you know that the spirit of Indian vengeance has been satisfied, and that the real peril has passed. Mr. Prevost mused for several minutes, and then replied, "'The motives you suggest are certainly very strong, my lord,' but I have strange ways of viewing such subjects, and I must have time to consider whether it is fair and right to my fellow countrymen, scattered over this district, to withdraw from my share of the peril which all who remain would have to encounter. Do not argue with me upon the subject to-night. I will think over it well, and doubt not that I shall view the plan you have suggested with all the favour that paternal love can afford." I will also keep my mind free to receive any further reasons you may have to produce. But I must first consider quietly and alone. 
there is no need of immediate decision for these people according to their own code are bound to make themselves perfectly sure that they cannot get possession of the actual slayer before they choose another victim it is clear from what the indian said to the negro boy that they know the hand that did the deed and they must search for poor brooks first and practice every device to allure him back before they immolate another let us both think over the matter well and confer to-morrow thus saying he shook hands with lord h and they retired to their several chambers with very gloomy and apprehensive thoughts next morning mr prevost was aroused by a distant knocking at the huts where the outdoor servants slept and then by a repetition of the sound at the door of the house itself rising hastily he got down in time to see the door opened by old agrippa and found a man on horseback bearing a large official-looking letter addressed to major-general lord h it proved to be a dispatch from sir william johnson requesting both lord h and himself to attend a meeting of some of the chiefs of the five nations which was to be held at johnson castle on the mohawk in the course of the following day the distance was not very great but still the difficulty of travelling required the two gentlemen to set out at once in order to reach the place of rendezvous before night and neither liked to neglect what they considered a duty i will mount my horse as soon as it can be got ready said lord h when he had read the letter and shown it to mr prevost i suppose in existing circumstances you will not think it advisable to accompany me most certainly i will go with you my lord replied his host as i said last night the danger though very certain is not immediate weeks months may pass before these indians feel assured that they cannot obtain possession of the actual slayer of their red brother and as many of the Anidas will probably be present at this talk, as they call it, I may perhaps, though it is very doubtful, gain some insight into their thoughts and intentions. I will take my daughter with me, however, for I should not like to leave her here altogether alone. Her preparations may delay us for half an hour, but still we have ample time, and the horse of the messenger, who will act as our guide, must have some little time to take rest and food." A very brief time was spent at breakfast, and then the whole party set out on horseback, followed by a negro leading a pack-horse, and preceded by the messenger of Sir William Johnson. Mr. Prevost, the messenger, and the negro were all armed, but Lord H., who had hitherto worn nothing but the common riding-suit in which he had first presented himself, except in his unfortunate expedition with Captain Brooks, had now donned the splendid uniform of a major-general in the British service, and was merely armed with his sword and pistols in the holsters of his saddle the journey passed without incident not a human being was seen for seventeen or eighteen miles though here and there a small log hut apparently deserted testified to the efforts of a new race to wrest their hunting grounds from the earlier people efforts too soon too sadly and too cruelly to be consummated the softer light of early morning died away and then succeeded a warmer period of the day when the heat became very oppressive for in the midst of those deep forests with no wind stirring the change from summer to winter is not felt so rapidly as in more open lands about an hour after noon they proposed to stop rest the horses and take some refreshment and a spot was selected where some fine oaks spread their large limbs over a beautifully clear little lake or pond the view across which presented peeps of a distant country with some blue hills of no very great elevation appearing above the tops of the trees at the end of an hour the party again mounted and pursued their way still on through forests and valleys across streams and by the sides of lakes till at length just as the evening sun was reaching the horizon a visible change took place in the aspect of the country spots were seen which had been cultivated where harvests had grown and been reaped and then a house gleamed here and there through the forest and blue wreaths of smoke might be seen rising up tracks of cart wheels channelled the forest path a cart or wagon was drawn up near the roadside high piles of firewood showed preparation against the bitter winter and everything indicated that the travellers were approaching some new but prosperous settlement. Soon small traces of the primeval woods, except those which the little party left behind them, disappeared, 
and a broad tract of well-cultivated country spread out before them, with a fine river bounding it at the distance of more than a mile. The road, too, was comparatively good and broad, and halfway between the forest and the river, that road divided into two, one branch going straight on, and another leading up the course of the stream. "'Is Sir William at the hall or at his castle?' asked Mr. Prevost, raising his voice to reach the ears of his guide, who kept a little in front. "'He said, sir, to take you on to the hall if you should come on, sir,' replied the messenger. "'There is a great number of Indians up at the castle already, and he thought you might perhaps not like to be with them altogether.' "'Probably not,' replied Mr. Prevost dryly, and they rode on upon the direct road till, passing two or three smaller houses, they came in sight of a very large and handsome edifice, built of wood indeed, but somewhat in the style of a European house of the reign of George I. As they approached the gates, Sir William Johnson himself, now in the full costume of an officer of the British Army, came down the steps to meet and welcome them, and little less ceremonious politeness did he display in the midst of the wild woods of America than if he had been at the moment in the halls of St. James's. With stately grace he lifted Edith from her horse, greeted Lord Ape with a deferential bow, took Mr. Prevost by the hand, and then led them himself to rooms which seemed to have been prepared for them. "'Where is my friend Walter?' he said, as he was about to lead Mr. Prevost to some short repose. "'What has induced him to deny his old acquaintance the pleasure of his society?' "'Ha! Mr. Prevost, does he think to find metal more attractive at your lonely dwelling? "'Perhaps he may be mistaken, for let me tell you the beautiful Otezza is here, "'here in this very house, for our good friend Gore has so completely anglified her "'that what between her Christianity, her beauty, and her delicacy, "'I believe she is afraid to trust herself with four or five hundred red warriors at the castle.' He spoke in a gay and jesting tone, and every one knows the blessed facility which parents have of shutting their eyes to the love affairs of their children. Mr. Prevost did not in the least perceive anything in the worthy general's speech but a good-humoured joke at the boyish fondness of his son for a pretty Indian girl, and he hastened to excuse Walter's absence by telling Sir William that he had been sent to Albany on business by Lord H. He then inquired, somewhat anxiously, "'Is our friend the Black Eagle here with his daughter?' "'He is here on the ground,' replied Sir William, "'but not in the house. "'His Indian habits are of too old standing "'to be rooted out like Otezas, "'and he prefers a bearskin and his own blue blanket "'to the best bed and quilt in the house. "'I offered him such accommodation as it afforded, "'but he declined, with the dignity of a prince "'refusing the hospitality of a cottage.' "'Does he seem in a good humour to-day?' asked Mr. Prevost, hesitating whether he should tell Sir William at a moment, when they were likely to be soon interrupted, the event which had caused so much apprehension in his own mind. You know he is somewhat variable in his mood.' "'I never remarked it,' replied the other. "'I think he is the most civilised savage I ever saw, far more than King Hendrick, though the one, since his father's death, wears a blue coat.' and the other does not. He did seem a little grave, indeed, but the shadows of Indian mirth and gravity are so faint, it is difficult to distinguish them. While these few words were passing, Mr. Prevost had decided upon his course, and he merely replied, "'Well, Sir William, pray let her take and know that Edith is here. They will soon be in each other's arms, for the two girls love like sisters.' A few words sprung to Sir William Johnson's lips, which, had they been uttered, might perhaps have opened Mr. Prevost's eyes, at least to the suspicions of his friends. He was on the eve of answering, and some day they may be sisters, but he checked himself, and nothing but the smile which should have accompanied the words made any reply. When left alone, the thoughts of Mr. Prevost reverted at once to more pressing considerations. The old chief knows the event, he said to himself. He has heard of it, heard the whole probably. It is wonderful how rapidly intelligence is circulated amongst this people from mouth to mouth. He was well nigh led away into speculations regarding the strange celerity with which news can be carried orally, and was beginning to calculate how much distance to travel would be saved in a given space, by one man shouting the tidings to another at a distance, 
when he forced back his mind into the track it had left and came to the full conclusion from his knowledge of the character of the parties and from all that he had heard that certainly the black eagle was cognizant of the death of one of his tribe by the hand of captain brooks and probably though not certainly had communicated the facts but not his views and purposes to his daughter whose keen eyes were likely to discover much of that which he intended to conceal End of chapter 6Chapter 7 of Ticonderoga by George Payne Rainsford James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 7. There was a curious and motley assembly that night in the halls of Sir William Johnson. There were several ladies and gentlemen from Albany, several young military men, and two or three persons of a class now extinct, but who then drove a thriving commerce, and whose peculiar business it was to trade with the Indians. Some of the latter were exceedingly well-educated men, and one or two of them were persons not only of enlightened minds, but of enlarged views and heart. The others were mere brutal speculators, whose whole end and object in life was to wring as much from the savages and give as little in return as possible. Besides these, an Indian chief would, from time to time, appear in the rooms, often marching through in perfect silence, observing all that was going on with dignified gravity and then going back to his companions at the castle amongst the rest was otatsa still in her indian costume but evidently in gala dress of the finest cloth and the most elaborate embroidery not only was she perfectly at her ease talking to every one laughing with many but the sort of shrinking timid tenderness which gave her so great a charm in the society of the few whom she loved had given place to a wild spirit of gaiety but little in accordance with the character of her nation she glided hither and thither through the room she rested in one place hardly for a moment her jests were as light and sometimes as sharp as those of almost any parisian dame and when one of the young officers ventured to speak to her somewhat lightly as the mere indian girl she piled upon him a mass of ridicule that wrung tears of laughter from the eyes of one or two older men standing near. "'I know not what has come to the child to-night,' said Mr. Gore, who was seated near Edith in one of the rooms. "'A wild spirit seems to have seized upon her, which is quite unlike her whole character and nature, unlike the character of her people, too, or I might think that the savage had returned notwithstanding all my care.' "'Perhaps it is the novelty and excitement of the scene,' said Edith. "'Oh, no,' answered the missionary. "'There is nothing new in this scene to her. "'She has been at these meetings several times "'during the last two or three years, "'but never seemed to yield to their influence "'as she has done to-night.' "'She has hardly spoken a word to me,' said Edith. "'I hope she will not forget the friends who love her.' "'No fear of that, my dear,' replied Mr. Gore. "'Otatsa is all heart, and that heart a gentle one. "'Under its influence is she acting now.' It throbs with something that we do not know, and those light words that make us smile to hear have sources deep within her, perhaps of bitterness. "'I think I have heard her say,' answered Edith, "'that you educated her from her childhood.' "'When I first joined the people of the stone,' replied the missionary, "'I found her there, a young child of three years old. Her mother was just dead, and although her father bore his grief with the stern, gloomy stoicism of his nation, and neither suffered tear to fall nor sigh to escape his lips, I could see plainly enough that he was struck with grief such as the Indian seldom feels and never shows. He received me most kindly and made my efforts with his people easy, and though I know not to this hour whether with himself I have been successful in communicating blessed light, he gave his daughter altogether up to my charge, and with her I have not failed. I fear in him the savage is too deeply rooted to be ever wrung forth, but her I have made one of Christ's flock indeed. It seemed as if by a sort of instinct that Otatsa discovered that she was the subject of conversation between her two friends, 
twice she looked around at them from the other side of the room and then she glided across and seated herself beside edith for a moment she sat in silence there then leaning her head gracefully on her beautiful companion's shoulder she said in a low whisper do not close thine eyes this night my sister till thou seest me and then starting up she mingled with the little crowd again it was still early in the night when edith retired to the chamber assigned for her for even in the most fashionable society of those times people had not learned to drive the day into the night and make morning and evening meet her room was a large and handsome one and though plainly it was sufficiently furnished no forest as at her dwelling interrupted the beams of the rising moon and she sat and contemplated the ascent of the queen of night as she soared grandly over the distant trees the conduct of Atezza during that night had puzzled her, and the few whispered words had excited her curiosity, for it must not be forgotten that Edith was altogether unacquainted with the fact of one of the Anidas having been slain by the hands of Captain Brooks within little more than two miles of her own abode. She proceeded to make her toilet for the night, however, and was almost undressed when she heard the door of her room open quietly, and Atezza stole in and cast her arms around her. "'Ah, my sister,' she said, "'I have longed to talk with you.' And seating herself by her side, she leaned her head again upon Edith's shoulders, but remained silent for several minutes. The fair English girl knew that it was better to let her take her own time, and her own way to speak whatever she had to say. But her tates had remained so long without uttering a word that an undefinable feeling of alarm spread over her young companion.' she felt her bosom heave as if with struggling sighs she even felt some warm drops like tears fall upon her shoulder and yet her taste remained without speaking till at length edith said in a gentle and encouraging tone what is it my sister there can surely be nothing you should be afraid to utter to my ear not afraid answered otezza and then she relapsed into silence again "'But why do you weep, my sweet blossom?' said Edith, after pausing for a moment or two, to give her time to recover her composure. "'Because one of your people has killed one of my people,' answered the Indian girl sorrowfully. "'Is not that enough to make me weep?' "'Indeed!' exclaimed Edith. "'I am much grieved to hear it, blossom. But when did this happen, and how?' "'It happened but yesterday,' replied the girl and but a little toward the morning from your own house my sister it was a sad day it was a sad day but i trust it was none near and dear to the blossom or to the black eagle said edith putting her arms around her and trying to soothe her no no answered otezza he was a bad man a treacherous man one whom my father loved not but that matters little they will have blood for his blood the truth flashed upon edith's mind at once for though less acquainted with the indian habits than her brother or her father she knew enough of their revengeful spirit to feel that they would seek the death of the murderer with untiring eagerness and she questioned her sweet companion earnestly as to all the particulars of the sad tale Atesa told her all that she knew which was indeed nearly all that could be told the man called the snake she said had been shot by the white man woodchuck in the wood to the northeast of mr prevost's house intimation of the fact had spread like fire in dry grass through the whole of the anidas who were flocking to the meeting at sir william johnson's castle and from them it would run through the whole tribe woodchuck has escaped she said or he would have been slain ere now but they will have his life yet my sister and then she added slowly and sorrowfully or oh, the life of some other white man if they cannot catch this one the words presented to edith's mind a sad and terrible idea one more fearful in its vagueness and uncertainty of outline than in the darkness of particular points that out of a narrow and limited population some one was foredoomed to be slain that out of a small body of men all feeling almost as brethren one was to be marked out for slaughter 
that one family was to lose husband or father or brother, and no one could tell which, made her feel like one out of a herd of wild animals cooped up within the toils of the hunters. Edith's first object was to learn more from her young companion, but Otetsa had told almost all she knew. "'What they will do, I know not,' she said. "'They do not tell us, women. "'But I fear, Edith, I fear very much, "'for they say our brother Walter was with the woodchuck "'when the deed was done.' "'Not so, not so,' cried Edith. "'Had he been so, I should have heard of it. "'He has gone to Albany, "'and had he been present, I am sure he would have stopped it if he could. "'If your people tell truth, they will acknowledge that he was not there.' Otetsa raised her head suddenly with a look of joy, exclaiming, "'I will make her tell the truth were she as cunning a snake as he was. "'But yet, my sister Edith, someone will have to die if they find not the man they seek.' "'The last words were spoken in a melancholy tone again, and then she started up, repeating, "'I will make her tell the truth.' "'Can you do so?' asked Edith. "'Snakes are always very crafty.' "'I will try at least,' answered the girl. "'But, oh, my sister, it were better for you and Walter and your father, too, to be away. "'When a storm is coming, we try to save what is most precious. "'There is yet ample time to go, for the red people are not rash, "'and do not act hastily as you white people do.' "'But is there no means,' asked Edith, "'of learning what the intention of the nation really is?' "'I know of none,' answered the girl, that can be depended upon with certainty. The people of the stone change no more than the stone from which they sprang. The storm beats upon them, the sun shines upon them, and there is little difference on the face of the rock. Yet let your father watch well when he is at the great talk to-morrow. Then if the priest is very smooth and soft-spoken, and if the black eagle is stern and silent, wraps his blanket over his left breast, be sure that something sad is meditated. That is all I can tell you, but I will make this woman speak the truth if there be truth in her, and that, too, before the chiefs of the nation. Now, sister, lie down to rest. Otetsa is going at once to her people. But are you not afraid? asked Edith. It is a dark night, dear Blossom. Lie down with me and wait the morning sunshine. "'I have no fear,' answered the Indian girl. "'Nothing will hurt me. "'There are times, sister, when a spirit enters into us "'that defies all and fears nothing. "'So it has been with me this night. "'The only thing I dreaded to face was my own thought, "'and it I would not suffer to rest upon anything "'till I had spoken with you. "'Now, however, I have better hopes. "'I will go forth, and I will make her tell the truth.' "'Thus saying, she left Edith's chamber, and about an hour and a half after she might have been seen standing beside her father, who was seated near a fire kindled in one corner of the court attached to a large house, or rather fort, built by Sir William Johnson on the banks of the Mohawk, and called by him his castle. Round the sachem, forming a complete circle, sat a number of the head men of the Oneidas, each in that peculiar crouching position which has been rendered familiar to our eyes, by numerous paintings. The court and the castle itself were well-nigh filled with Indians of other tribes of the five nations, but none took any part in the proceedings of the Oneidas but themselves, and the only stranger who was present in the circle was Sir William Johnson. He was still fully dressed in his British uniform, and seated on a chair in an attitude of much dignity, with his left hand resting on the hilt of his sword. With the exception of that weapon, he had no arms whatever, and indeed it was his custom to sleep frequently in the midst of his red friends, utterly unarmed and defenceless. The occasion seemed a solemn one, for all faces were very grave, and a complete silence prevailed for several minutes. "'Bring in the woman,' said Black Eagle at length. "'Bring her in and let her speak the truth.' "'Of what do you accuse her, Otetsa?' asked Sir William Johnson, fixing his eyes upon his beautiful guest. "'Of lying to the sachem and to her brethren,' answered Otetsa. "'Her breath has been full of the poison of the snake.' "'Thou hearest,' said the Black Eagle, turning to a woman 
of some one or two and twenty years of age, what sayest thou? I lie not, answered the woman in the Indian tongue. I saw him lift the rifle and shoot my brother dead. Who did it? asked Black Eagle gravely and calmly. The woodchuck, answered the woman. He did it. I know his face too well. Believe her not, answered Otatsa. The woodchuck was ever a friend of our nation. He is our brother. He would not slay an Oneida. But he was my brother's enemy, answered the woman. There was vengeance between them. Vengeance on thy brother's part, answered the old chief. More likely he to slay the woodchuck than the woodchuck to slay him. If she have a witness, let her bring him forward, said Otatsa. We will believe her by the tongue of another. I have none, cried the woman vehemently. None was present but ourselves, but I saw him kill my brother with my own eyes, and I cry for his blood. Didst thou not say that there were two white men with him? asked Otatsa, raising up her right hand. Then in this thou hast lied to the sachem and thy brethren, and who shall say whether thou speakest the truth now? A curious sort of drowsy hum ran round the circle of Indians, and one old man said, She has spoken well. The woman, in the meanwhile, stood silent and abashed, with her eyes fixed upon the ground, and Black Eagle said, in a grave tone, There was none. No, said the woman, lifting her look firmly, there was none, but I saw two others in the wood hard by, and I was sure they were his companions. That is guile, said Black Eagle sternly. Thou didst say that there were two men with him, one the young pale-faced Walter, and the other a tall stranger, and brought a cloud over our eyes and made us think that they were present at the death. Then methinks, Black Eagle, said Sir William Johnson, using their language nearly as fluently as his own, there is no faith to be put in the woman's story, and we cannot tell what has happened. Not so, my brother, answered Black Eagle. We know that the snake was slain yesterday before the sun had reached the pine tops. We believe, too, that the woodchuck slew him, for there was an enmity between them, and the ball which killed him was a large ball such as we had never seen but in that man's pouch. That is doubtful evidence, said Sir William, and I trust my brother will let vengeance cease till he had better witnesses. The Indians remained profoundly silent for more than a minute, and then the old man who had spoken once before replied, If our brother will give us up woodchuck, vengeance shall cease. That I cannot do, answered Sir William Johnson. First, I have no power. Secondly, he may be tried by our laws, but I will not lie to you. If he can show he did it in self-defence, he will be set free. Again there was a long silence, and then Black Eagle rose, saying, We must take counsel. His face was very grave, and as he spoke, he drew the large blue blanket which covered his shoulders over his left breast, with the gesture which her tater had described to Edith as indicating some dark determination. Sir William Johnson marked the signs he saw, and was too well acquainted with Indian character to believe that their thirst for blood was at all allayed, but neither by expression of countenance nor by words did he show any doubt of his red friends, and slept amongst them calmly that night without a fear of the result. At an early hour on the following morning all the arrangements were made for the great council, or talk, that was about to be held. Some large armchairs were brought forth into the court. A few soldiers were seen moving about, and some negro servants. A number of the guests from the hall came up about nine o'clock, most of them on horseback, but when all were assembled, the body of white men present were few and insignificant when compared with the multitude of Indians who surrounded them. No one showed or entertained any fear, however, and the conference commenced and passed off with perfect peace and harmony. It is true that several of the Indian chiefs, and more especially King Hendrick, as he was called, the son of the chief who had been killed near Fort George a year or two before, had made some complaints against the British government for neglect of the just claims of their red allies. All angry feeling, however, was removed by a somewhat large distribution of presents, and after hearing everything which the Indians had to say, 
Sir William Johnson rose from the chair in which he had been seated, between Lord H. and Mr. Prevost, and addressed the assembly in English, according to his invariable custom, when called upon to deal publicly with the heads of the five nations, the speech being translated, sentence for sentence, by an interpreter. The whole of his address cannot be given here, but it was skilfully turned to suit the prejudices and conciliate the friendship of the people to whom he spoke. He said that their English father, King George, loved his red children with peculiar affection, but as his lodge was a long way off, he could not always know their wants and wishes. He had very lately, however, shown his great tenderness and consideration for the five nations by appointing him, Sir William Johnson, as Indian agent to make known as speedily as possible all that his red children desired. He then drew a glowing picture of the greatness and majesty of the English monarch, as the Atotaho, a chief leader of a thousand different nations, sitting under a pine tree that reached to the sky, and receiving every minute messages from his children in every part of the earth. A hum of satisfaction from the Indians followed this flight of fancy, and the speaker went on to say that this great chief, their father, had long ago intended to do much for them, and still intended to do so, but that the execution of his benevolent purposes had been delayed and impeded by the machinations of the French, their enemies and his, whom he represented as stealthily lying in wait for all the ships and convoys of goods and presents which were destined for his Indian children, and possessing themselves of them by force or fraud. Rich as he might be, he asked how it was possible that their white father could supply all their wants when he had so many to provide for, and when so many of his enemies had dug up the tomahawk at once. If the chiefs of the five nations, however, he said, would vigorously aid him in his endeavours, King George would speedily drive the French from America, and to show his intention of doing so, he had sent over the great chief on his left hand, Lord H., and many other mighty warriors, to fight side by side with their red brethren. More, he said, would come on in the ensuing spring, and with the first flower that blossomed under the hemlock trees, the English warriors would be ready for the battle, if the Indian chiefs then present would promise them cordial support and cooperation. It must not be supposed that in employing very exaggerated language, Sir William had any intention of deceiving. He merely used figures suited to the comprehension of his auditors, and his speech gave the very highest satisfaction. The unusually large presents which had been distributed, the presence and bearing of the young nobleman, and a natural weariness of the state of semi-neutrality between the French and the English, which they had maintained for some time, disposed the chiefs to grant the utmost he could desire, and the conference broke up with the fullest assurance of support from the heads of the Iroquois tribes, assurances which were faithfully made good in the campaigns which succeeded. End of chapter 7「Eight of Ticonderoga by George Payne Rainsford James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eight. All was pleasant at the house of Sir William Johnson, from which the stateliness of his manner did not at all detract, for when blended with perfect courtesy, as an Irishman can, perhaps better than any man, blend it, stateliness does not imply restraint. The conference with the Indians had not ended until too late an hour for Mr. Prevost and his companions to return to his dwelling on the day when it took place, and as Walter was not expected with the answers to Lord H.'s dispatches for at least two days more, the party were not unwilling to prolong their stay till the following morning. Several of the guests, indeed, who were proceeding to Albany direct, set out at once for their destination, certain of reaching the well-inhabited parts of the country before nightfall, and it was at one time proposed to send a letter by them to young Walter Prevost, directing him to join his father at the hall. The inconveniences which so frequently ensue from deranging plans already fixed caused this scheme to be rejected, and while her father, 
Lord H., and their host wandered forth for an hour or two along the banks of the beautiful Mohawk, Edith remained at the hall, not without hope of seeing Otaitza present herself with some intelligence. The beautiful Indian girl, however, did not appear, and gloomy thoughts thronged fast upon poor Edith. She strove to banish them. She schooled herself in regard to anticipating events only possible, but whoever mastered completely those internal warnings of approaching peril or woe, which as often come to cloud our brightest days as to darken the gloom of an already tempestuous sky. Her chief companion was an old lady nearly related to Sir William, but very deaf and very silent, and she had but small relief in conversation. In the meantime, the three gentlemen and a young aide-de-camp pursued their way amongst the neat farmhouses and mechanic shops which had gathered round the hall. Mr. Prevost gave way to thoughts apparently as gloomy as those which haunted his daughter, but in reality not so, for his was a mind of a discursive character, which was easily led by any collateral idea far away from any course which it was at first pursuing and though he had awakened that morning full of the considerations which had engaged him during the preceding day, he was now busily calculating the results of the meeting which had just been held, and arriving at the conclusions more just than were reached by many of the great statesmen and politicians of the day. Lord H., on his part, paid no little attention to the demeanour and all the proceedings of their host. The character of his mind was the exact reverse of that of Mr. Prevost, attaching itself keenly to an object, and turned from its contemplation with difficulty. His thoughts still dwelt upon the consequences which were likely to ensue from the death of the Oneida by the hands of Captain Brooks, without anything like alarm, indeed, but with careful forethought for those who in a few short days had won for themselves a greater share of the warmer affections which lay hidden in his heart than he often bestowed upon any one. As they quitted the door of the house, a mere trifle called his attention to something peculiar in the conduct of Sir William Johnson, and led him to believe that the mind of that officer was not altogether at ease, notwithstanding the favourable result of the meeting with the Indians. After they had taken a step or two upon their way, Sir William Johnson paused suddenly, turned back and ordered a servant to run up to the top of the hill and there watch until he returned. Mark well which paths they take, he said, without specifying the persons of whom he spoke, and let me hear if you see anything peculiar. The man seemed to understand him perfectly and the parties, as I have said, walked on, Lord H. watching everything with the utmost attention. In the course of their ramble, not less than some nine or ten persons came up at different times, and spoke a word or two to Sir William Johnson. First it was a negro, then a soldier, then an Irish servant, then another white man, but with features of a strongly marked Indian character. Each seemed to give some information in a few words uttered in a low tone, and each departed as soon as they were spoken, some with a brief answer, some with none. The evening which succeeded their walk passed somewhat differently from the preceding one. There were fewer persons present, the conversation was more general and intimate, and Sir William Johnson, seating Edith at the old-fashioned instrument which in those days supplied the lack of piano fortes, asked for a song which it seemed he had heard her sing before. She complied without any hesitation, with a sufficient skill and management of her voice to show that she had been well taught, but with tones so rich, so pure, and so melodious, that every sound in the room was instantly hushed, and Lord H. approached nearer and nearer to listen. Lord H. was full not only of the love, but of the sense of music, and he drew closer and closer to Edith as she sang, and at length hung over her with his face turned away from the other guests in the room, and bearing written on it feelings which he hardly yet knew were in his heart. Sir William Johnson was standing on the other side of the beautiful girl's chair, and as she concluded the stanza before the last, he raised his eyes suddenly to the face of Lord H., with a look of great satisfaction. 
What he saw there made him start and then smile, for the characters written on the young nobleman's countenance were too plain to be mistaken. And Sir William Johnson, who was not without his share of worldly wisdom, at once divined that Edith Prevost was likely to be a peeress of England. "'What a fine musician she is,' said the older general to the young nobleman, after he had conducted Edith to her former seat, but before the enthusiasm had subsided. One would hardly expect to find such music in the wild woods of America. "'She is all music,' said Lord H., in an absent tone, and then added, rousing himself, "'But you must not attribute such powers and such perfections altogether to your own land of America, Sir William.' for I find that Miss Prevost was educated in Europe. "'Only till she was fourteen, replied the other, "'but they are altogether a most remarkable family. "'If ever girl was perfect, it is herself. "'Her father, though somewhat too much given to dream, "'is a man of singular powers of mind, "'and her brother Walter, whom I look upon almost as a son, "'is full of high and noble qualities and energies, "'which, if he lives, will certainly lead him on to greatness. "'I think so,' said Lord H. "'And there the conversation dropped for the time. "'The rest of the evening passed on without any incident of note, "'and by daybreak on the following morning the whole household were on foot. "'An early breakfast was ready for the travellers, "'and nothing betrayed much anxiety on the part of their host "'till the very moment of their departure.' As they were about to set forth, however, and just when Edith appeared in her riding habit, or Amazon, as it was then called, and the hat with large floating ostrich plumes usually worn at that time by ladies when on horseback, looking lovely enough, it is true, to justify any compliment, Sir William took her by the hand, saying with a gay and courteous air, "'I am going to give you a commission, my fair Hippolyta,' which is neither more nor less than the command of half a dozen dragoons, whom I wish to go with you for a portion of the way, partly to exercise their horses on a road which is marvellously cleared of stumps and stones for this part of the country, partly to examine what is going on a little to the northeast, and partly to bring me the pleasant intelligence that you have gone at least half-way to your home in safety. Lord H. looked in his face in silence, and Edith turned a little pale, but said nothing. Mr. Prevost, however, went directly to the point, saying, "'You know of some danger, my good friend. You had better inform us of all the particulars that we may be upon our guard.' "'None whatever, Prevost,' answered Sir William, "'except the general perils of inhabiting an advanced spot on the frontiers of a savage people, especially when anything has occurred to offend them. You know what we talked about yesterday morning.' The Oneidas do not easily forgive, and in this case they will not forgive. But I have every reason to believe that they have taken their way homeward for the present. My people trace them a good way to the east, and it is only from some strange chance stragglers that there is any danger. Mr. Prevost mused without moving to the door, which was open for them to depart, and then said in a meditating kind of tone, "'I do not think they will attack any large party, Sir William, "'even when satisfied that they cannot get hold of the man who has incensed them. "'These Indians are a very cunning people, "'and they often satisfy even their notions of honour by an artifice, "'especially when two duties, as they consider them, are in opposition to one another. "'Depend upon it. "'After what passed yesterday, they will commit no act of national hostility against England.' They are pledged to us and will not break their pledge. They will attack no large party, nor slay any Englishman in open strife, though they may kidnap some solitary individual, and according to their curious notions of atonement, make him a formal sacrifice in expiation of the blood shed by another. "'You know the Indians well, Prevost,' said Sir William gravely, marvellously well, considering the short time you have been amongst them. "'I have had little else to do than to study them,' said the other, "'and the subject is one of great interest. "'But do you think I am wrong in the view I take, my good friend?' "'Quite the contrary,' replied Sir William, "'and that is the reason I send the soldiers with you. "'A party of eight or ten will be perfectly secure, 
and I would certainly advise that for the next two or three months, or till this unlucky dog Brooks, or Woodchuck as he is called, has been captured, no one should go any distance from his home singly. Such a party as yours might be large enough. I am not sure that my lord's red coat, which I am happy to see he has got on today, might not be sufficient protection, for they will not risk anything which they themselves deem an act of hostility against the British government. But still the soldiers will make the matter more secure till you have passed the spot where there is any danger of their being found. I repeat, I know of no peril, but I would fain guard against all where a fair lady is concerned. And he bowed gracefully to Edith. Little more was said, and taking leave of their host, Mr. Prevost's party mounted their horses and set out, followed by a corporal's guard of dragoons, a small body of which corps was then stationed in the province of New York, although from the nature of the country in which hostilities had hitherto been carried on, small opportunity had as yet been afforded them of showing their powers against an enemy nor would there have been very favourable opportunity for doing so in the present instance had Mr. Prevost and his companions been attacked, for though the road they had to travel was broad and open compared to an ordinary Indian trail, yet except at one or two points it was hemmed in with impervious forests, where the action of cavalry would be quite impossible, and under the screen of which a skilful marksman might bring down his man himself unperceived but Sir William Johnson was sincere in saying that he believed the very sight of the English soldiers would be quite sufficient protection. The Indians, he knew right well, would avoid anything like a struggle or a contest, and would more especially take care not to come into collision of any kind with the troops of their British allies. It was likely that they would depend upon cunning entirely to obtain a victim wherewith to appease their vengeance but on this probability he did not choose altogether to rely. He saw them depart, however, with perfect confidence, as the soldiers were with them, and they proceeded without seeing a single human being after they quitted his settlement, till they reached the shores of the small lake near which they had halted on their previous journey, and where they again dismounted to take refreshment. It was a very pleasant spot and well fitted for a resting place nor was repose altogether needless, though the distance already travelled was not great either for man or horse. But the day was exceedingly oppressive, like one of those which come in what is called the Indian summer, when the weather, after many a frosty day, becomes suddenly sultry, as if in the middle of June, and the air, loaded with thin yellow vapour, well deserves the term of smoky, usually given to it on the western side of the Atlantic yet there was no want of air the wind blew from the south-east but there was no freshness on the breeze it was like a sirocco taking away strength and freshness from all it breathed upon and the horses after being freed from the burdens they bore stood for several minutes with bent heads and heaving sides without attempting to crop the forest grass beneath the trees Thus repose was sweet, and the look of the little lake was cool and refreshing. The travellers lingered there somewhat after the hour at which they proposed to depart, and it was the negro who took care of the baggage, who first warned them of the waning of the day. "'Massa forget,' he said. "'Sun go early to bed in October. Twelve mile to go yet, and road was nor dis.' "'True, true,' replied Mr. Prevost, rising. "'We had better go on, my lord, for it is now past two, and we shall barely reach home by daylight. "'I really think, Corporal,' he continued, turning to the non-commissioned officer who had been seated with his men hard by, "'enjoying some of the good things of life, that we need not trouble you to go farther. "'There is no trace of any Indians, nor indeed any human beings in the forest but ourselves. "'Had there been so, my good friend Chowdo here, would have discovered it, for he knows their tracks as well as any of their own people. "'That I do,' replied the negro to whom he pointed. "'No Injun passed this road since yesterday, I swear. "'My orders were to go to the big blazed basswood tree four miles farther,' replied the soldier in a firm but respectful tone, "'and I must obey orders.' "'You are right,' said Lord H., pleased with the man's demeanour. "'What is your name, Corporal?' 
Clither to, my lord, replied the man with a military salute. Corporal Clither to. Lord H. bowed his head, and the party, remounting, pursued their way. The road, however, as the negro had said, was more difficult in advance than it had been nearer to Sir William Johnson's settlement, and it took the whole party an hour to reach the great basswood tree which had been mentioned, and which was marked out from the rest of the forest by three large marks upon the bark, hewn by some surveyor's axe when the road had been laid out. There the party stopped for a moment or two, and with a few words of thanks Mr. Prevost and his companions parted from their escort. "'How dim the air along the path is,' said Lord H., looking on, "'and yet the sun, getting to the west, is shining right down it through the valley. One could almost imagine it was filled with smoke.' "'This is what we call a smoky day in America,' replied Mr. Prevost, "'but I never knew the Indian summer come on us with such a wind.' No more was said on that matter at the time, and as the road grew narrower, Mr. Prevost and the Negro, as best acquainted with the way, rode first, while Lord H. followed by Edith's side, conversing with her in quiet and easy tones, but with words which sometimes called the colour to vary a little in her cheek. Thus they went on for some four miles farther, and the evening was evidently closing round them rapidly, though no ray had yet passed from the sky. Suddenly Mr. Prevost drew in his rein, saying in a low but distinct voice to the negro, "'What is that crossing the road?' "'No engine,' cried the negro, whose eyes had been constantly bent forward. "'Surely there is smoke drifting across the path,' said Mr. Prevost, "'and I think I smell it also.' "'I have thought so for some time,' said Lord H., who was now close to them with Edith. "'Are fires common in these woods?' "'Not very,' answered Mr. Prevost, "'but the season has been unusually dry. "'Good heaven, I hope my fears are not prophetic. "'I have been thinking all day "'of what would become of the lodge of the forest "'to take fire.' "'We had best ride on as fast as possible,' "'said the young nobleman, "'for then if the worst happens, "'we may be able to save some of your property, Mr. Prevost.' "'We must be cautious, we must be cautious,' "'said the other in a thoughtful tone. "'Fire is a capricious element, and often runs in a direction the least expected. "'I have heard of people getting so entangled in a burning wood "'as not to be able to escape.' "'Oh, yes,' cried the negro. "'When I were a little boy, I remember quite well Massa John Bostock and five other men with him get in pine wood behind Albany, and it catch fire. "'He run here and there, but it get all round him, "'and roast him up black as I be.' I saw him bring in what they fancied was he, but it no better than a great pine stump. If I remember, said Lord H., we passed a high hill somewhere near this spot, where we had a fine, clear view over the whole of the woody region round. We had better make for that at once. The fire cannot yet have reached it, if my remembrance of the distance is correct, for though the wind sets toward us, the smoke is, as yet, anything but dense. Pray God it be so said Mr. Prevost, spurring forward, but I fear it is nearer. The rest followed as quickly as the stumps and the fallen trees would let them, and at the distance of a half a mile, the ascent of the hill to which Lord H. had alluded. As far as that spot, the smoke had been becoming denser and denser every moment, apparently pouring along the valley formed by that hill, and another on the left, through which valley, let it be remarked, the small river in which Walter had been seen fishing by Sir William Johnson, but now a broad and very shallow stream, took its course onward toward the Mohawk. As they began to ascend, however, the smoke decreased, and Edith exclaimed joyfully, "'I hope, dear father, the fire is farther to the north.' "'We shall see, we shall see,' said Mr. Prevost, still pushing his horse forward." The sun is going down fast, and a little haste will be better on all accounts. In about five minutes more the summit of the hill was reached, at a spot where, in laying out two roads which crossed each other there, the surveyors had cleared away a considerable portion of the wood, leaving, as Lord H. had said, a clear view over the greater part of the undulating forest country lying in the angle formed by the Upper Hudson and the Mohawk. The only sign of man's habitation which could be discovered at any time was the roof and chimneys of Mr. Prevost's house, 
which in general could be perceived rising above the trees, upon an eminence a good deal lower than the summit which the travellers had now reached. Now, however, the house could not be seen. The sight which the country presented was a fine but a terrible one. On the one side the sun, with his lower limb just dipped beneath the forest, was casting up floods of many-coloured light, orange and purple, gold and even green, upon the light fantastic clouds scattered over the western sky, while above some fleecy vapours, fleeting quickly along, were all rosy with the touch of his beams. Onward to the east and north, filling up the whole valley between the hill on which they stood and the eminence crowned by Mr. Prevost's house, and forming an almost semicircular line of some three or four miles in extent, was a dense, reddish-brown cloud of smoke, marking where the fire raged, and softening off at each extreme to a bluish grey. No general flame could be perceived through this heavy cloud, but ever and anon a sudden flash would break across it, not bright and vivid, but dull and half-obscured, where the fierce elements got hold of some of the drier and more combustible materials of the forest. Once or twice, too, suddenly at one point of the line or another, a single tree, taller perhaps than the rest, or more inflammable, or garmented in a thick matting of dry vine, would catch the flame and burst forth from the root to the topmost branch, like a small column of fire. And here and there, too, from what cause I know not, perhaps from the accumulation of dry grass and withered leaves seized upon by the fire and wind together, a volley of sparks would mingle with the cloud of smoke and float along for a moment, bright and sparkling, to the westward. It was a grand but an awful spectacle, and as Mr. Prevost gazed upon it, thoughts and feelings crowded into his bosom which even Edith herself could not estimate. "'Look, look, Prevost!' cried Lord H. after they had gazed during one or two minutes in silence. "'The wind is drifting away the smoke. I can see the top of your house. It is safe as yet, and will be safe,' he added, for the wind sets somewhat away from it. "'Not enough,' said Mr. Prevost in a dull, gloomy tone. "'The slightest change, and it is gone. The house I care not for, the barns, the crops, and nothing. They can be replaced.' or I could do without them. But there are things within that house, my lord, I cannot do without. Do you not think we can reach it? asked Lord H. If we were to push our horses into the stream there, we might follow its course up. It seems broad and shallow, and the trees recede from the banks. Are there any deep spots in its course? None, massa, replied the negro. Let us try at all events, exclaimed Lord H., turning his horse's head. "'We can come back again if we find the heat and smoke too much for us.' "'My daughter,' said Mr. Prevost, in a tone of deep, strong feeling, "'my daughter, Lord H.' "'The young nobleman was silent. "'The stories he had heard that day, and many he had heard before, "'of persons getting entangled in burning forests and never being able to escape, "'which, while in the first enthusiasm of the moment he thought only of himself and of Mr. Prevost, had seemed to him but visions, wild chimeras, assumed a terrible reality as soon as the name of Edith was mentioned, and he would have shuddered to see the proposal adopted which he had made only the moment before. He was silent then, and Mr. Prevost was the first who spoke. "'I must go,' he said with gloomy earnestness, after some brief consideration. "'I must go. Let what will be tied.' He remained for two or three minutes profoundly silent. Then, turning suddenly to Lord H., he said, "'My lord, I am going to entrust to you the dearest thing I have on earth, my daughter, to place her under the safeguard of your honour, to rely for her protection and defence upon your chivalry. As an English nobleman of high name and fame, I do trust you without a doubt. I must make my way through that fire by some means. I must save some papers.' two pictures which I value more than my own life. I will take my good friend Chowdo here with me. I must leave you to conduct Edith to a place of safety. Oh, my father, cried Edith, but he went on without heeding her. If you follow that road, he continued, you will come at the distance of some seven miles to a good-sized farmhouse on the left of the road. 
The men are most likely out watching the progress of the fire, but you will find the women within, and good and friendly they are, though homely and uneducated. I have no time to stop for further directions. Edith, my child, God bless you. Do not cloud our parting with a doubt of heaven's protection. Should anything occur, and be it as he wills, you and Walter will find with the lawyers at Albany all papers referring to this small farm and to the little we have in England. God bless you, my child. God bless you. And thus saying, he turned and rode fast down the hill, beckoning to the negro to follow him. "'Oh, my father! My father!' cried Edith, dropping her rein and clasping her hands together, longing to follow, yet unwilling to disobey. "'He will be lost. I fear he will be lost.' "'I trust not,' said Lord H., in a firm, calm tone, well fitted to inspire confidence. "'He knows the country well, and can take advantage of every turning to avoid the flame. "'Besides, if you look along what I imagine to be the course of the stream, "'you will see a deep undulation, as it were, in that sea of smoke, "'and when the wind blows strongly it is almost clear. "'He said, too, that the banks continued free from trees.' "'As far as the bridge and the rapids near the house,' replied Edith, "'but after that they are thickly wooded.' "'But the fire has evidently not reached that spot,' said the young nobleman. "'All the ground within half a mile of the house is free at present. "'I saw it quite distinctly a moment ago, and the wind is setting this way.' "'Then can we not follow him?' asked his fair companion imploringly. "'To what purpose?' asked Lord H. "'And besides,' he added, now let me call to your mind the answer of the good soldier, Corporal Clitherto, just now. He said he must obey orders, and he was right. A soldier to his commander, a child to a parent, a Christian to his God. Have, I think, but one duty, to obey. Come, Edith, let us follow the directions we have received. The sun is already beneath the forest edge. We can do no good gazing here, and although I do not think there is any danger— and believe you will be safe under my protection. Yet, for many reasons, I could wish to place you beneath the shelter of a roof, and in the society of other women as soon as may be. Thank you much, she answered, gazing up into his face, on which the lingering light in the west cast a warm glow. You remind me of my duty, and strengthen me to follow it. I have no fear of any danger with you to protect me, my lord. It was for my father only I feared but it was wrong to do so, even for him. God will protect, I do hope and believe. We must take this way, my lord. And with a deep sigh she turned her horse's head upon the path which her father had pointed out. No general subject of conversation could, of course, be acceptable at that moment, but one topic they had to discuss, and yet Lord H. made more of that than some men would have made of a thousand. He comforted, he consoled, he raised up hope and expectation. His words were full of promise, and from everything he wrung some illustration to support and cheer. A few moments after they left the summit of the hill and began the more gentle descent which stretched away to the southeast, the last rays of sun were withdrawn and night succeeded, but it was the bright and sparkling night of the American sky. There was no moon indeed, but the stars burst forth in multitudes over the firmament larger, more brilliant than they are ever beheld in the clearest European atmosphere, and they gave light enough to enable the two travellers to see their path. The wind still blew strongly and carried the smoke away, and the road was wide enough to show the starry canopy overhanging the trees. Obliged to go very slowly, but little progress had been made in an hour, and by that time a strong odour of the burning wood and a pungent feeling in the eyes showed that some portion of the smoke was reaching them. "'I fear the wind has changed,' said Edith. "'The smoke seems coming this way.' "'The better for your father's house, dear lady,' answered Lord H. "'It was a change to the westward he had to fear. "'The more fully east, the better.' They fell into silence again, but in a minute or two after, looking to the left of the road where the trees were very closely set, though there was an immense mass of brushwood underneath, Lord H. beheld a small solitary spot of light, like a lamp burning. It was seen and hidden, seen and hidden again by the trees as they rode on, and must have been at some three or four hundred yards' distance. 
It seemed to change its place, too, to shift, to quiver, and then, in a long, winding line, it crept slowly round and round the bole of a tree, like a fiery serpent, and a moment after, with flash and crackling flame and fitful blaze, it spread flickering over the dry branches of a pitch pine. "'The fire is coming nearer, dear Miss Prevost,' said Lord H., "'and it is necessary we should use some forethought. "'How far, think you, this farmhouse is now?' "'Nearly four miles,' answered Edith. "'Does it lie due south?' asked her companion. "'Very nearly,' she replied. "'Is there any road to the westward?' demanded the young nobleman, "'with his eyes still fixed upon the distant flame. "'Yes,' she answered. "'About half a mile on there is a tolerable path made along the side of the hill, on the west, "'to avoid the swamp during wet weather. "'But it rejoins this road a mile or so farther on.' "'Let us make haste,' said Lord H. abruptly. "'The road seems fair enough just here, and I fear there is no time to lose.' He put his hand upon Edith's rein as he spoke, to guide the horse on, and rode forward perhaps somewhat less than a quarter of a mile, watching with an eager eye the increasing light to the east, where it was now seen glimmering through the trees in every direction, looking through the fretted trellis-work of branches, trunks, and leaves, like a multitude of red lamps hung up in the forest. Suddenly at a spot where there was an open space or streak, as it was called, running through some two or three hundred yards of the wood, covered densely with brush, but destitute of tall trees. The whole mass of the fire appeared to view, and the travellers seemed gazing into the mouth of a furnace. Just then the wind shifted a little more and blew down the streak. The cloud of smoke rolled forward. Flash after flash bursts forth along the line as the flame caught the withered leaves on the top of the branches and the bushes themselves were seized upon by the fire and sent flaming tongues far up into the air. Onward it rushed with a roar and a crackle and a hiss, caught the taller trees on either side and poured across the road right in front. Edith's horse, unaccustomed to such a sight, started and pulled vehemently back, but Lord H., snatching her riding whip from her hand, struck him sharply on the flank and forced him forward by the rein. But again the beast resisted. Not a moment was to be lost. Time wasted in the struggle must have been fatal. And casting the bridle free, he threw his right arm round her light form, lifted her from the saddle, and seated her safely before him. Then, striking his spurs into the sides of his well-trained charger, he dashed at full speed through the burning bushes, and in two minutes had gained the ground beyond the fire. "'You are saved, dear Edith,' he said. "'You are saved.' He could not call her Miss Prevost then, and though she heard the name he gave her, at that moment of gratitude and thanksgiving it sounded only sweetly on her ear. "'Thank God! Thank God!' said Edith. "'And, oh, my Lord, how can I ever show my gratitude to you?' Lord H. was silent for a moment, and then said in a low tone, for it would be spoken, "'Dear Edith, I have no claim to gratitude, "'but if you can give me love instead, "'the gratitude shall be yours for life. "'But I am wrong, very wrong, "'for speaking to you thus at this moment "'and in these circumstances. "'Yet there are emotions which force themselves into words "'whether we will or not. "'Forget those I have spoken, and do not tremble so, "'for they shall be no more repeated "'till I find a better occasion. "'Then they shall immediately. "'Now, dear Edith,' I will ride slowly on with you to this farmhouse, will leave you there with the good people, and, if possible, get somebody to guide me round another way to join your father, and assure him of your safety. That he is safe, I feel certain, for this very change of wind must have driven the fire away from him. Would you rather walk, for I am afraid you have an uneasy seat, and we are quite safe now. The flames will go another way." From many motives, Edith preferred to go on foot, and Lord H. suffered her to slip gently to the ground. Then, dismounting himself, he drew her arm within his own, and leading his horse by the bridle, proceeded along the road over the shoulder of the hill, leaving the lower ground which the flames still menaced, on their left. Edith needed support, and their progress was slow. But Lord H. touched no more upon any subject that could agitate her, and at the end of about an hour and a half they reached the farmhouse, and knocked for admission. 
There was no answer, however. No dogs barked, no sounds were heard, and all was dark within. Lord H. knocked again. Still all was silent, and putting his hand upon the latch, he opened the door. "'The house seems deserted,' he said, and then, raising his voice, he called loudly to wake any slumbering inhabitant who might be within. Still no answer was returned, and he felt puzzled and more agitated than he would have been in the presence of any real danger. There was no other place of shelter near. He could not leave Edith there, as he had proposed, and yet the thought of passing a long night with her in that deserted house produced a feeling of indecision, checkered by many emotions which were not usual to him. "'This is most unlucky,' he said. "'What is to be done now?' "'I know not,' said Edith, in a low and distressed tone. "'I fear, indeed, the good people are gone. "'If the moon would but rise, we might see what is really in the house.' "'I can get a light,' replied Lord H. "'There is wood enough scattered about to light a fire. "'Stay here in the doorway while I fasten my horse and gather some sticks together. "'I will not go out of sight.' The sticks were soon gathered and carried to the large kitchen, into which the door opened directly. Lord H.'s pistol, which he took from the holsters, afforded the means of lighting a cheerful fire in the hearth, and as soon as it blazed up a number of objects were seen in the room which showed that the house had been inhabited lately, and abandoned suddenly. Little of the furniture seemed to have been carried away, indeed, and amongst the first things that were perceived, much to Edith's comfort, were candles and a tin lamp of Dutch manufacture, ready trimmed. These were soon lighted, and Lord H., taking his fair companion's hand in his and gazing fondly on her pale and weary face, begged her to seek some repose. "'I cannot, of course,' he said, "'leave you here and seek your father as I proposed just now, but if you will go upstairs and seek some room where you can lock yourself in in case of danger, I will keep guard here below.' Most likely all the people of the house have gone forth to watch the progress of the fire, and may return speedily. Edith mused and shook her head, saying, I think something else must have frightened them away. Would you have courage to fire a pistol in case of need? asked Lord H., in a low tone. Edith gently inclined her head, and he then added, Stay, I will charge this for you again. Then he reloaded the pistol, the charge of which he had drawn to light the fire, and was placing it in Edith's hand when a tall, dark figure glided into the room, with a step perfectly noiseless. Lord H. drew her suddenly back and placed himself before her, but a second glance showed him the dignified form and fine features of a Tetzer's father. "'Peace,' said the old chief. "'Peace to you, my brother,' and he held out his hand to Lord H., who took it frankly. Black Eagle then unfastened the blue blanket from his shoulders and threw it around Edith, saying, Thou art my daughter, and art safe. I have heard the voice of the cataract, and its sound was sweet. It is a great water, and a good. The council is wise, my daughter. Go thou up and rest in peace. The Black Eagle will watch by the cataract till the eyes of morning open in the east. The Black Eagle will watch for thee, as for his own young, and thou art safe. "'I know I am, when thou art near me, father,' said Edith, taking his brown hands in hers. "'But is it so with all mine?' "'If I can make it so,' answered Black Eagle. "'Go, daughter, and be at peace. "'This one at least is safe also, for he is a great chief of our white fathers, "'and we have a treaty with him. "'The man of the five nations who would lift his hand against him is accursed.' Edith knew that she could extract nothing more from him, and with her mind somewhat lightened, but not wholly relieved, she ascended to the upper story. Lord H. seated himself on the step at the foot of the stairs, and the Indian chief crouched down beside him. But both kept a profound silence, and in a few minutes after, the moon, slowly rising over the piece of clear ground in front, poured in upon their two figures as they sat there side by side, in strange contrast. End of chapter 8。Chapter 9 of Ticonderoga by George Payne Rainsford James。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。Chapter 9
there is the fate of another connected with the events of that night of whom some notice must be taken from the influence which his destiny exercised over the destinies of all with greater promptness and celerity than had been expected from him even by those who knew him best walter prevost had executed the business entrusted to him and was ready to set out from albany a full day at least before his return had been expected by his family fortune had favoured him it is true he had found the commander-in-chief in the city and at leisure a man of a prompt and active mind he had readily appreciated the promptness and activity of the lad and his business had been dispatched as readily as circumstances permitted a boat sailing up the hudson with some stores and goods for traffic was found to carry him a considerable way on his journey and he was landing at a point on the western bank of the river some seventeen miles from his father's house at the very moment that mr prevost lord h and edith were mounting by the side of the little lake to pursue their journey the way before him was rough and uneven and somewhat intricate but he thought he knew it sufficiently to make his way by it before sunset to a better known part of the country and he hurried on with youthful confidence and vigour his rifle in his hand his knapsack on his shoulder and a good large hunting-knife in his belt and with great agility of limbs and no small portion of bodily vigour he would have proved no contemptible opponent in the presence of any single enemy but he never thought of enemies and all in his bosom was courage and joy and expectation whatever great cities and camps and courts might have offered albany at least a small provincial capital filled with a staid and somewhat rigid people and only enlivened by the presence of a regiment or two of soldiers had no attraction for him and he was heartily glad to escape from it again to the free life around his paternal dwelling and to the society of his father and edith and Atatza. steadily he went along climbed the hills strode along the plain and forded the river the traces of cultivation soon became fewer and then ceased and following resolutely the path before him two hours passed before he halted even to look around then however he paused for a minute or two to consider his onward course two or three indian trails crossed the spot where he stood one of them so deeply indented in the ground as to show that its frequent use existed from a very ancient date its course seemed to be in the direction which he wanted to go and he thought he remembered having followed it some months before across it ran the settler's way broader and better marked out but not very direct to his father's house and he was hesitating which he should take when the sound of creaking wheels and the cry used by ploughmen and teamsters to their cattle showed him that someone was coming who was likely to give him better information that information seemed the more necessary as the day was already far on the decline and he had not yet reached a spot of which he could be certain a moment or two after coming up a lane in the wood as it would be called in england appeared a heavy ox wagon drawn by four steers and loaded with three women and a number of boxes while by the side of the rude vehicle appeared three men on foot and one on horseback each very well armed together with no less than five dogs of different descriptions walter instantly recognized in the horseman the good farmer who lived some ten miles to the southwest of his father's house the farmer was a good-humoured kindly-hearted man honest enough but somewhat selfish in his way always wishing to have the best of a bargain if it could be obtained without absolute roguery yet willing enough to share the fruits of his labour or his cunning with any one who might be in need on the present occasion however he was either sullen or stupid and it was indeed clear that he and his male companions had been drinking quite enough to dull the edge of intellect in some degree those on foot went on without even stopping the oxen to speak with their young neighbour and the farmer himself only paused for a moment or two to answer walter's questions why mr whittier said the young gentleman you seem to be moving with all your family ay ay answered the farmer a look of dull cunning coming to his face i don't like the look of things i had a hint i guess there are other places better than the forest just now well, not so warm mayhap why what is the matter asked walter has anything happened oh no answered the farmer looking uncomfortable and giving his bridle 
a little sort of jerk as if he wished to pass on. The forest's too full of Indians for my notion, but as you and your father are so fond of them and they of you, there's no harm will come to you, I guess. His manner was almost uncivil, and Walter moved out of his way without even asking the question he had intended. The man passed on, but suddenly he seemed to think better of the matter, and turning round in the saddle, called out in a voice much louder than necessary, considering the distance between them, "'I say, Master Walter, if you're going home, you'd better take that deep trail to the right. I guess it's shorter and safer, and them red devils or some other vermin have set fire to the wood on there. It's not much of a thing just yet, but there's no knowing how it will spread. However, if you keep to the west, you'll get on. I'm going to more civilised parts for a month or two, seeing as I've got all my crops in safe. As soon as these words were uttered, he turned and rode after his wagon, and Walter at once took the Indian trail which the other had mentioned. About half a mile further on, he for the first time perceived the smell of smoke and as soon as he reached the summit of another hill beyond, the whole scene of the conflagration was before his eyes. Between the spot where he stood and his father's house stretched a broad belt of fire and smoke, extending a full mile to the north, farther than he had expected from the vague account of the farmer, and the cloud of brownish vapour had rolled so far up the opposite slope that the lad could neither see the dwelling itself nor distinguish what spot the fire had actually reached. Ignorant of the absence of Mr. Prevost and Edith, and well aware how rapidly the fame extended when once kindled in a wood, after a long season of dry weather, Walter's heart sank as he gazed, but he lost no time in useless hesitation. The sun was already setting, the distance was still considerable, and he resolved at once to break through the fiery circle, if it were possible, and reach his home at once. Onward he plunged then, down the side of the hill, and the moment he descended the whole scene was shut out from his sight so completely, that but for the strong and increasing smell of burning pine wood, and a feeling of unnatural warmth, he would have had no intimation that a fire was raging close at hand. As he came nearer and nearer, however, a certain rushing sound met his ear, something like that of a heavy gale of wind sweeping the forest, and the smoke became suffocating, while through the branches and stems of the trees a red light shone, especially toward the south and west, showing where the fire raged with the greatest fierceness. Breathing thick and fast, he hurried on, lighted by the flames alone, for the sun had sunk by this time, and the dense cloud of smoke which hung over this part of the wood shut out every star, till at length he reached the very verge of the conflagration. Some hundreds of acres lay before him, with trees, some fallen one over the other, some still standing, but deprived of foliage, masses of brushwood and long trailing vines, all glowing with intense heat. He felt that to proceed in that direction was death. He could hardly draw his breath. His face felt scorched and burning, and yet the drops of perspiration rolled heavily from his forehead. Retreating a little to escape the heat, he turned his steps northward, but by that time he had lost the trail, and he was forcing his way through the brushwood, encumbered by his rifle and knapsack, when suddenly by the light of the fire shining through the trees he saw a dark figure, some twenty or thirty yards before him, waving to him eagerly, and apparently calling to him also. The roar and crackling of the burning wood was too loud for any other sounds to be heard, but the gestures of the figure seemed to direct him toward the south again, and obeying the signs, he soon found himself once more upon an Indian trail. The next instant, the figure he had seen was upon the same path and a little nearer, but it was that of an Indian, and in the smoky light Walter Prevost could not distinguish his tribe or nation. He advanced cautiously then, with his thumb upon the cock of the rifle, but as soon as he was within hearing, the man called to him in the Oneida tongue, and in a friendly tone, telling him to follow, and warning him that death lay to the westward. Thrown off his guard by such signs of interest, the lad advanced with a quick step, and was soon close to his guide, though the man walked fast. "'Is the house burnt, brother?' asked the youth eagerly. "'What, the lodge of the pale-face?' said the Indian. "'No, it stands fast.' "'Thank God for that,' said Walter Prevost in English, 
but the words had hardly passed his lips when he suddenly felt his arm seized from behind, his rifle was wrested from his hands, and he himself cast backward on the ground. Two savage faces glared above him, and he expected to see the gleam of the deadly tomahawk the next instant. "'What now?' he exclaimed in an eider. "'Am I not your brother? Am I not the son of the Black Eagle and a friend of the Children of the Stone?' There was no answer, but in dead silence the Indians proceeded with rapid hands to bind his arms with thongs of deerskin, and then, raising him on his feet, forced him to retrace his steps along the very trail which had brought him thither. End of chapter 9"'Chapter Ten of Ticonderoga by George Payne Rainsford James. "'This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. "'Chapter Ten. "'Day broke slowly and heavily under a grey cloud "'and found Lord H. and the Indian chief "'still seated side by side at the entrance of the farmhouse. "'A word or two had passed between them in the earlier part of the night, "'but for many hours before dawn they had remained perfectly silent.' Only once through the hours of their watch had Black Eagle moved from his seat, and that was nearly at midnight. The ears of Lord H. had been on the watch as well as his own, but though the young English nobleman heard no sound, the chief caught a distant footfall about a quarter before twelve, and starting up, he listened attentively. Then, moving slowly toward the door, he stood there a few moments as still as a statue. Presently Lord H. caught the sound which had moved him, though it was exceedingly light, and the next instant another dark figure, not quite so tall as that of the chief, darkened the moonlight and threw its shadow into the doorway. A few words then passed between the two Indians in their native tongue, at first low and musical in tone, but then rising high, in accents which seemed to the ear of the listener to express grief or anger. Not more than five sentences were spoken on either part, and then the last comer bounded away with a quick and seemingly reckless step into the forest, and the old chief returned and seated himself, assuming exactly the same attitude as before. When day dawned, however, Black Eagle rose and said in English, "'It is day, my brother. Let the voice of the cataract awake the maiden, and I will lead you on the way. Her horse has not yet come,' but if it have not run with the wind or fed upon the fire, it will be here speedily. "'Do you know, then, what became of it after it broke away from us?' asked Lord H. "'Nay,' answered the Indian, "'I know not, but my steps were in yours from the setting sun till you came hither. I was there for your safety, my brother, and for the safety of the maiden.' "'We should have been glad of your advice,' answered Lord H., "'for we were often in sore need of some better information than our own. "'The man who aids himself needs no aid,' answered Black Eagle. "'Thou wert sufficient for the need. "'Why should I take from thee thy right to act?' "'As they were speaking, the light step of Edith was heard upon the stairs, "'and the eyes of the Black Eagle fixed upon her as she descended,' with a look which seemed to Lord H. to have some significance, though he could not tell exactly in what the peculiarity consisted. It was calm and grave, but there was a sort of tenderness in it, which, without knowing why, made the young nobleman fear that the Indian was aware of some evil having befallen Mr. Prevost. His mind was soon relieved, however, for when Edith had descended, the chief said at once, "'Thy father is safe, my daughter. "'He passed through the fire uninjured "'and is in his own lodge. "'Edith looked pale and worn, "'but the words of the chief "'called a joyful smile upon her face "'and the colour back upon her cheek. "'In answer to the inquiries of Lord H., "'she admitted that she had slept hardly at all "'and added with a returning look of anxiety, "'How could I sleep so uncertain as I was of my father's safety?' "'She expressed an anxious desire to go forward as soon as possible, "'and not to wait for the chance of her horse being caught by the Indians, "'which she readily comprehended as the meaning of the Black Eagle, 
when his somewhat ambiguous words were reported to her. "'They may catch him,' she said, "'or they may not, and my father will be very anxious, I know, till he sees me. I can walk quite well.' The Indian was standing silently at the door, to which he had turned after informing her of her father's safety, and Lord H., taking her hand, inquired in a low tone if she would be afraid to stay alone with the Black Eagle for a few moments, while he sought for some food for herself and him. "'Not in the least,' she answered. "'After his words last night and the throwing of his blanket upon me, I am as safe with him as a tetzer would be. From that moment he looked upon me as his daughter and would treat me as such in any emergency.' "'Well, then, I will not be long,' answered Lord H., and passing the Indian, he said, "'I leave her to your care for a few moments, Black Eagle.' The Indian answered only by a sort of guttural sound peculiar to his people, and then, turning back into the house, he seated himself on the ground as before, and seemed inclined to remain in silence. But there were doubts in Edith's mind which she wished to have solved, and she said, "'Is not my father thy brother, Black Eagle?' "'He is my brother,' answered the Indian laconically, and relapsed into silence again. "'Will a great chief suffer any harm to happen to his brother?' asked Edith again, after considering for a few moments how to shape her question. "'No warrior of the totem of the tortoise dares raise a tomahawk against the brother of the Black Eagle,' answered the chief." "'But is he not the great chief of the Oneidas?' said Edith again. "'Do not the people of the stone hear his voice? "'Is he not to them as the rock on which their house is founded? "'Whither in the sky could the Oneidas soar if the black eagle led them not? "'And shall they disobey his voice?' "'The people of the stone have their laws,' replied the chief, "'which are thongs of leather to bind each sachem and each totem and each warrior.' They were whispered into the rolls of wampum, which is in the hands of the great medicine man, or priest, as you would call him, and the voice of the black eagle, though it be strong in war, is as the song of the bobolink when compared to the voice of the laws. Short as this conversation may seem when written down, it had occupied several minutes, for the Indian had made long pauses, and Edith, willing to humour him by adopting the custom of his people, had followed his example. His last reply was hardly given when Lord H. returned, carrying a dry and somewhat hard loaf and a jug of clear cold water. I have not been very successful, for the people have evidently abandoned the place, and all their cupboards but one are locked up. In that, however, I found this loaf." They are squirrels who fly along the boughs at the sound of danger and leave their stores hidden, said the black eagle. But dip the bread in water, my daughter. It will give you strength by the way. Lord H. laid the loaf down upon the table and hurried out of the room again. But Edith had little opportunity of questioning her dusky companion further before the young nobleman returned. He was absent hardly two minutes, and when he came back he led his horse behind him, somewhat differently accoutred from the preceding day. The demi-peak was now covered with a pillow, firmly strapped on with some leathern thongs, which he had found in the house, thus forming it into a sort of pad, and the two stirrups brought to one side, stretched as far apart as possible, and somewhat shortened, were kept extended by a piece of plank passed through the irons, and firmly attached thus forming a complete rest for the feet of anyone sitting sidewise on the horse. Lord H. had done many a thing in life on which he might reasonably pride himself. He had resisted temptations to which most men would have yielded. He had done many a gallant and noble deed. He had displayed great powers of mind and high qualities of heart in terrible emergencies and moments of great difficulty but it may be questioned whether he had looked so complacently on any act of his whole life as on the rapid and successful alteration of his own inconvenient saddle into a comfortable lady's pad. And when he brought out Edith to the door, and she saw how he had been engaged, she could not help rewarding him with a beaming smile, in which amusement had a less share than gratitude. 
even over the dark countenance of the indian trained to stoical apathy something flitted not unlike a smile also the young nobleman lifting his fair charge in his arms seated her lightly on the horse's back adjusted the rest for her feet with care and then took the bridle to lead her on the way the indian chief without a word walked on before at a pace with which the horse's swiftest walk could scarcely keep up and crossing the cleared ground before the house they were soon once more beneath the branches of the forest more than once the black eagle had to pause and lean upon his rifle waiting for his two companions but doubtless it was the difficulties of the narrow path never made for horses hoofs and not the desire of prolonging conversation nor the pleasure of gazing up the while into a pair of as beautiful eyes as ever shone upon mortal man or into a face which might have looked out of heaven and not have shamed the sky that retarded the young nobleman on his way two miles were at length accomplished and then they came into the solitary high road again which led within a short distance of mr prevost's cottage during the whole journey the indian chief had not uttered a word but as soon as he had issued forth from the narrow path into the more open road he paused and waited till edith came up then pointing with his hand he said thou knowest the way my daughter thou hast no more need of me the black eagle must wing his way back to his own rock but shall we be safe asked edith as in the happy hunting grounds replied the chief and then turning away he retraced the trail by which they had come their pace was not much quicker than it had been in the more difficult path the seal seemed to be taken away from lord h's lips he felt that edith was safe nearer home no longer left completely left to his mercy and his delicacy and his words were tender and full of strong affection but she laid her hand gently on his as it rested on the peak of the saddle and with a face glowing as if of autumn maples had cast a reflection from their crimson hues upon it she said oh not now not now spare me a little still he gazed up in her face with a look of earnest inquiry but he saw something there in the half-veiled swimming eyes or in the glowing cheek or in the agitated quivering of the lip which was enough to satisfy him forgive me he said in a deprecatory tone and then the moment after he added with frank soldierly boldness but dear edith i may thank you now and thank you with my whole heart for i am not a confident fool and you are no light coquette and did you refuse you would say more edith bent her head almost to the saddle-bow and some bright drops rolled over her cheek they remained silent both conversing with their own thoughts for a short time and then they were roused from somewhat agitated reveries by a loud and joyous call and looking up the ascent before them they saw mr prevost on horseback and two of the negro slaves on foot coming down as if to meet them they hurried on fast father and daughter sprang to the ground and oh with what joy she felt herself in his arms it is unnecessary to give here the explanations that ensued mr prevost had little to tell he had passed safely though not without scorching his clothes and face and no small danger along the course of the stream and through a large part of the thicker wood he had found his horse and all the buildings safe and even the forest immediately around still free from the fire and out of danger as long as the wind remained easterly satisfied that his daughter would find the farmer's family and be kindly entertained he had no anxiety on her account till about an hour before when her horse had come back to the house with the saddle and housings scorched and blackened and the hoofs nearly burnt off his feet the poor animal could give no history and mr prevost in great alarm for edith had set out to seek her in haste her tale was soon told and again and again mr prevost shook her protector's hand thanking him earnestly for what he had done for his child the distance to the house was now not great and giving the horses to the negroes the little party proceeded on foot talking over the events of the last few hours when they reached the house 
there were somewhat obstreperous sounds of joy from the women servants to see their young mistress return and edith was speedily carried away to her chamber for rest and refreshment breakfast was immediately prepared in the hall for lord h who had tasted no food since the middle of the preceding day but he ate little even now and there was a sort of restlessness about him which mr prevost remarked with some anxiety my lord you hardly taste your food he said and seem not well or not at ease i trust you have no subject of grief or apprehension pressing upon your mind none whatever replied lord h with a smile but to tell you the truth my dear sir i am impatient for a few moments conversation with you alone and i could well have spared my breakfast till they are over pray let us go into the other room where we shall not be interrupted mr prevost led the way and closed the door after them with a grave face for as is usual in such cases he had not the faintest idea of what was coming our acquaintance has been very short mr prevost said lord h as soon as they were seated feeling indeed more hesitation and embarrassment than he had imagined he could experience in such circumstances but i trust you have seen enough of me taken together with general repute to make what i am going to say not very presumptuous mr prevost gazed at him in perfect astonishment unable to perceive where his speech would end and as the young nobleman paused he answered pray speak on my lord believe me i have the highest esteem and regard for you your character and conduct through life have i well know added lustre to your rank and your noble blood has justified itself in your noble actions what on earth can you have to say which could make me think you presumptuous for a moment simply this and perhaps you may think me presumptuous when i have said it replied lord h i am going to ask you to give me something which i value very much and which you rightly value as much at least as anything you possess i mean your daughter nay do not start and turn so pale i know all the importance of what i ask but i have now passed many days entirely in her society i have gone through some difficulties and dangers with her as you know scenes and sensations which endear two persons to each other i have been much in woman's society i have known the bright and the beautiful in many lands perhaps my expectations have been too great my wishes too exacting but i never met woman hitherto who touched my heart i have now found the only one whom i can love and i now ask her of you with a full consciousness of what it is i ask mr prevost had remained profoundly silent with his eyes bent down and his cheeks as lord h had said very pale there was a great struggle in his heart as there must always be in a parent's bosom in such circumstances she is very young so very young he murmured speaking to himself rather than to his companion i may indeed be somewhat too old for her said lord h thoughtfully but yet i trust in heart and spirit at least mr prevost i have still all the freshness of youth about me oh it is not that it is not that at all answered edith's father it is that she is so very young to take upon herself both cares and duties true she is no ordinary girl and perhaps if ever any one were fit at so early an age for the great responsibilities of such a state it is edith her education has been singular unlike that of any other girl he had wandered away as was his custom from the immediate question to collateral issues and was no longer considering whether he should give his consent to edith's marriage with lord h but whether she was fit for the marriage state at all and what effect the education she had received would have on her conduct as a wife the lover in the meantime habitually attaching himself and every thought to one important object was impatient for something more definite and he ventured to break across mr prevost's spoken reverie saying our marriage would be necessarily delayed mr prevost for some time even if i obtained your consent may i hope that it will be granted me if no personal objection exists towards myself none in the world exclaimed mr prevost eagerly you cannot suppose it for a moment my dear lord all i can say is 
that I will oppose nothing which Edith calmly and deliberately thinks is for her own happiness. What does she say herself? She says nothing, answered Lord H. with a smile, for though she cannot doubt what are my feelings towards her, she has not been put to the trial of giving any answer without your expressed approbation. May I believe, then, that I have your permission to offer her my hand? Beyond a doubt, replied Mr. Prevost, let me call her. Her answer will soon be given, for she is not one to trifle with anybody. He rose as he spoke, as if to quit the room, but Lord H. stopped him, saying, "'Not yet, not yet, my dear sir. She had little, if any, rest last night, and she experienced much fatigue and anxiety during the last twenty-four hours. Probably she is taking some repose, and I must not allow even a lover's impatience to deprive her of that.' "'I have forgotten.' said Mr. Prevost. It is indeed true that a child must indeed need some repose. It is strange, my lord, how sorrows and joys blend themselves together in all events of mortal life. I had thought, when in years long ago I entwined my fingers in the glossy curls of my Edith's hair, and looking through the liquid crystal of her eyes, seemed to see in the deep foundations of pure emotions in her young heart, I had thought, I say, that few joys would be equal to that of seeing her, at some future day, bestow her hand on some man worthy of her, to make and partake the happiness of a cheerful home. But now I find that thought has its bitter as well as its sweet, and memories of the chilly grave rise up to call a solemn and sober shade over the bright picture drawn. His tone dropped gradually as he spoke, and fixing his eyes upon the ground, he again fell into a fit of absent thought, which lasted long. Lord H. would not disturb his reverie, and walking quietly out of the room, he gave himself also up to meditation. But his reflective moods were of a different kind from those of his friend, more eager, more active, and they required some employment for the limbs while the mind was so busy. To and fro he walked before the house for nearly an hour, before Mr. Prevost came forth and found him. And then the walk was still continued. But the father's thoughts, though they had wandered for a while, had soon returned to his daughter, and their conversation was of Edith only. At length, when it was nearly noon, as they turned upon the little open space of ground in front of the dwelling, the eyes of the young nobleman, which had been turned more than once to the door, rested on Edith as she stood in the hall and gazed forth over the prospect. "'The fire seems to be raging there still,' she said, pointing with her fair hand over the country toward the southwest, where hung a dense canopy of smoke above the forest. "'What a blessing one of our autumnal rains would be!' Lord H. made no reply, but suddenly left the father's side, and taking her extended hand in his, led her into the little sitting-room. They remained long enough together, to Mr. Prevost it seemed very long, but when the lover led her to the door again, there were once more happy tears in her eyes, glad blushes on her cheek, and though the strong manly arm was fondly thrown around her waist, she escaped from its warm clasp and cast herself upon the bosom of her father. "'She is mine,' said Lord H. "'She is mine!' "'But none the less mine,' answered Mr. Prevost, kissing her cheek. "'Ah, no,' said Edith. "'No, always yours, my dear father, your child.' And then she added, while the glowing blood rushed over her beautiful face like a gush of morning over a white cloud, "'Your child, though his wife.' It cost her an effort to utter the word wife, and yet she was pleased to speak it. But then the moment after— as if to hide it from memory again, she said, "'Oh, that dear Walter was here. He would be very happy, I know, and say I had come to the end of my daydreaming.' "'He will be here probably to-night,' said her lover. "'We must not count upon it,' said her father. "'He may meet many things to detain him. And now, my children, I will go in and make up my journal till the dinner hour.' Edith leaned fondly on his bosom and whispered, "'And write that it has been one happy day, my father.' The day went by, night fell, and Walter Prevost did not appear in his father's house. No alarm, however, was entertained, for out of the wide range of chances 
there were many events which might have occurred to detain him. A shade of anxiety, perhaps, came over Edith's mind, but it passed away the next morning when she heard from the Negro Chowdo, or Alexander, who, having been brought up among the Indians from his infancy, was better acquainted with their habits than any person in the house, that there had not been a single one in the neighbourhood since the preceding morning at eight o'clock. "'All gone west, Missy,' he said. "'The last to go were old chief Black Eagle. "'I hear of him coming to help you, and I go out to see.' Edith asked no questions in regard to the sources of his information, for he was famous for finding out all that was going on in the neighbourhood, and with the childlike vanity making somewhat of a secret of the means by which he obtained intelligence. But she argued, reasonably, though wrongly, that as Walter was not to set out from Albany till about the same hour the Indians departed, he could not have fallen in with any of their parties. Thus passed the morning till about three o'clock, but then, when the lad did not appear, anxiety rose up and became strong, as hour after hour went by and he came not. Each tried to sustain the hopes of the others, each argued against the apprehensions he himself entertained. Lord H. pointed out that the commander-in-chief, to whom Walter had been sent, might be absent from Albany. Mr. Prevost suggested that the young man might have found no boat coming up the river, and Edith remembered that very often the boatmen were frightfully exorbitant in their charge for bringing anyone on the way who seemed eager to proceed. Knowing her brother's character well, she thought it very likely that he would resist an attempt at imposition, even at the risk of delay. But still she was very, very anxious, and as night again fell and the hour of repose arrived, without his presence, tears gathered in her beautiful eyes and trembled on the silken lashes. The following morning dawned in heavy rain. A perfect deluge seemed descending from the sky, but still Lord H. ordered his horse at an early hour, telling Edith and Mr. Prevost, in as quiet and easy a tone as he could assume, that he was going to Albany. "'Although I trust and believe,' he said, "'that my young friend Walter has been detained by some accidental circumstances, "'yet it will be satisfactory to us all to know what has become of him, "'and, moreover, it is absolutely necessary that I should have some communication "'as speedily as possible with the commander-in-chief. "'I think it likely that Walter may have followed him down the river, "'as he knows my anxiety for an immediate answer.' I must do so, too, if I find him still absent, but you shall hear from me when I reach Albany, and I will be back myself as soon as possible. Edith gazed at him with a melancholy look, for she felt how much she needed, and how much more she still might need, the comfort of his presence. But she would not say a word to prevent his going. The breakfast that day was a sad and gloomy meal. The lowering sky, the pouring rain, the thoughts that were in the hearts of all, banished everything like cheerfulness. Various orders were given for one of the servants to be ready to guide Lord H. on his way, for ascertaining whether the little river was in flood and other matters, and the course which Walter was likely to take on his return was considered and discussed, in order that the young nobleman might take the same road and meet him if possible. But this was the only conversation that took place. Just as they were about to rise from the table, however, a bustle was heard without, amongst the servants, and Mr. Prevost started up, exclaiming, "'Here he is, I do believe!' But the hope was dispelled the next instant, for a young man in full military costume, but drenched with rain, was ushered into the room and advanced toward Lord H., saying in a quiet, commonplace tone, "'We arrived last night, my lord, and I thought it better to come up and report myself immediately,' as the quarters are very insufficient, and we may expect a great deal of stormy weather, I am told. Lord H. looked at him gravely as if he expected to hear something more, and then replied after a moment's pause, I do not exactly understand you, Captain Hammond. You have arrived where? Why, at the boatman's village, on the points, my lord, replied the young officer with a look of some surprise. "'Have you not received Lord London's dispatch in answer to your lordship's own letters?' "'No, sir,' replied Lord H., "'but you had better come and confer with me in another room.' 
"'Oh, George, let us hear all!' exclaimed Edith, laying her hand upon his arm and divining his motives at once. "'If there be no professional reason for secrecy, let us hear all!' "'Well,' said Lord H., gravely, "'pray, Captain Hammond, when were his lordship's letters dispatched, and by whom?' "'By the young gentleman you sent, my lord,' replied Captain Hammond, "'and he left Albany two days ago, early in the morning. "'He was a fine, gentlemanly young fellow who won us all, "'and I went down to the boat with him myself.' "'Edith turned very pale, and Mr. Prevost inquired, "'Pray, has anything been heard of the boat since?' "'Yes, sir,' answered the young officer, "'beginning to perceive the state of the case. "'She returned to Albany the same night.' "'and we came up in her yesterday as far as we could. "'I made no inquiries after young Mr. Prevost, "'for I took it for granted he had arrived with the dispatches. "'Lord H. turned his eyes toward the face of Edith "'and saw quite sufficient there to make him instantly draw a chair toward her "'and seat her in it. "'Do not give way to apprehension,' he said, before we know more. "'The case is strange, undoubtedly, dear Edith.' but still the enigma may be solved in a happier way than you think. Edith shook her head sadly, saying in a low tone, You do not know all, dear George, at least I believe not. The Indians have received offence, they never forgive. They were wandering about here on the night we were caught by the fire, disappearing the next morning, and some time during that night my poor brother must have been... Tears broke off the sentence, but her lover eagerly caught at some of her words to find some ground of hope for her, whatever he might fear himself. He may have been turned from his course by the burning forest, he said, and have found a difficulty in retracing his way. The woods were still burning yesterday, and we cannot tell how far the fire may have extended. At all events, dearest Edith, we have gained some information to guide us. We can now trace poor Walter to the place where he disembarked, and that will narrow the ground we have to search. Take courage, love, and let us all trust in God. He says that Walter intended to disembark four miles south of the King's Road, said Mr. Prevost, who had been talking earnestly to Captain Hammond. Let us set out at once and examine the ground between this place and that. I think not, said Lord H., after a moment's thought. I will ride down as fast as possible to the post and gain what information I can there. Then, spreading a body of men to the westward, we will sweep all the trails up to this spot. You and as many of your people as can be spared from the house may come on to meet us, setting out in an hour. But for heaven's sake, do not leave this dear girl alone. I fear not. I fear not for myself, replied Edith. Only seek for Walter, obtain some news of him, "'and let us try to save him, if there be yet time to do so.' "'Covering her eyes with her handkerchief, "'which was sometimes wetted with her tears, "'Edith took no more part in what was going on, "'but gave herself up to bitter thought, "'and many and complex were the trains which it followed. "'While Edith remained plunged in these gloomy reveries, "'an active but not less sad consultation "'was going on at the other side of the room, which ended in the adoption of the plan proposed by Lord H., very slightly modified by the suggestions of Mr. Prevost. An orderly whom Captain Hammond had brought with him was left at the house as a sort of guard for Edith, it being believed that the sight of his red coat would act as a sort of intimation to any Indians who might be in the woods that the family was under the protection of the British government. Lord H. and the young officer set out together for the boatman's village, whence Walter had departed for Albany, and where a small party of English soldiers were now posted, intending to obtain all the aid they could and sweep along the forest till they came to the verge of the recent fire, leaving sentinels on the different trails, which, the reader must understand, were so numerous throughout the whole of what the Iroquois called their long house, as often to be within hail of each other. Advancing stealthily along these narrow paths, Lord H. calculated that he could reconnoitre the whole distance between the great river and the fire with sufficient closeness to prevent any numerous party of Indians passing unseen, at least till he met with the advancing party of Mr. Prevost, who were to search the country thoroughly for some distance around the house, 
and then to proceed steadily forward in a reverse course to that of the young nobleman and his men. No time was lost by Lord H. and Captain Hammond on the road, the path they took being for a considerable distance the same by which Lord H. had first arrived at Mr. Prevost's home, and throughout its whole length the same which the young officer had followed in the morning. It was somewhat longer, it is true, than the Indian trail by which Woodchuck had led them on his expedition, but its width and better construction more than made up for the difference in distance, and the rain had not been falling long enough to affect its solidity to any great extent. Thus little more than an hour and a half sufficed to bring the two officers to the spot where a company of Lord H.'s regiment was posted, and the first task, that of seeking some intelligence of Walter's movements after landing, was more successful than might have been expected. A settler who supplied the boatmen with meal and flour was even then in the village, and he averred truly that he had seen young Mr. Prevost and spoken with him just as he was quitting the cultivated ground on the bank of the river and entering the forest ground beyond. Thus his course was traced up to a quarter before three o'clock on the Thursday preceding, and to the entrance of a government road, which all the boatmen knew well. The distance between that spot and Mr. Prevot's house was about fourteen miles, and from the boatman's village to the mouth of the road, through the forest, some six or seven. Besides the company of soldiers, numbering some seventy-three or seventy-four men, there were at least forty or fifty stout, able-bodied fellows amongst the boatmen, well acquainted with all the intricacies of the roads round about, and fearless and daring from the constant perils and exertions of their mode of life. These were soon gathered round Lord H., whose rank and military station they now learned for the first time, and he found that the tidings of the disappearance of Walter Prevost, whom most of them knew and loved, excited a spirit in them, which he had little expected. He addressed a few words to them at once, offering a considerable reward to each man who would join in searching thoroughly the whole of that part of the forest, which lay between the spot where the young man was last seen and his father's house. But one tall, stout man of about forty stepped forward and spoke for the rest, saying, "'We want no reward for such work as that, my lord. I guess there's not a man of us who will not turn out to search for young Walter Prevost, if you'll but leave redcoats enough with the old men to protect our wives and children in case of need.' "'More than sufficient will remain,' replied Lord H. "'I cannot venture for anything not exactly connected with the service to weaken the post by more than one quarter of its number.' "'but still we shall make up a sufficient party to search the wood sufficiently, "'if you will all go with me.' "'That we will! That we will!' exclaimed a dozen voices, "'and everything was soon arranged. "'Signals and modes of communication and cooperation were speedily agreed upon, "'and the practical knowledge of the boatmen proved fully as serviceable "'as the military science of Lord H. "'He was far too wise not to avail himself of it to the fullest extent.' and soon, with some twenty-eight regular soldiers and thirty-seven or thirty-eight men from the village, each armed with his invariable rifle and hatchet, and a number of good, big, active boys who volunteered to act as a sort of runners and to keep up the communication between the different parts of the line, he set out upon his way along the edge of the forest and reached the end of the government road near which Walter had been last seen, about one o'clock in the day. Here the men dispersed, the soldiers guided by the boatmen, and the forest was entered at some fourteen different places, wherever an old or a new trail could be discovered. Whenever an opportunity presented itself by the absence of brushwood, or the old trees being wide or far apart, the boys ran across from one party to another, carrying information or directions and though each little group was often hidden from the other as they advanced steadily onward, Still, it rarely happened that many minutes elapsed without their catching a sight of some friendly party, on the right or left, while a whoop and halloo marked their progress to each other. Once or twice the trails crossing brought two parties to the same spot, but then, separating again immediately, they sought each a new path and proceeded as before. Few traces of any kind could be discovered on the ground, for the rain, though it had now ceased, had so completely washed the face of the earth that every print of shoe or moccasin was obliterated. 
the tracks of cartwheels, indeed, seemingly recent, and the footmarks of a horse and some oxen were discovered along the government road, but nothing more, till, at a spot where a large and deeply indented trail left the highway, the ground appeared a good deal trampled by hoof-marks, as if a horse had been standing there some little time, and, under a thick hemlock tree at the corner of the trail, sheltering the ground beneath from the rain, the print of a well-made shoe was visible. The step had evidently been turned in the direction of Mr. Prevost's house, and up that trail Lord H. himself proceeded with a soldier and two boatmen. No further step could be traced, however, but the boatman who had been the spokesman a little while before insisted upon it that they must be on young Master Walter's track. "'That's a New York shoe,' he said, made that print, I am sure, and, depend upon it, we are right where he went. Keep a sharp look under all the thick trees at the side, my lord. You may catch another track. Keep behind, boys, you'll brush em out. Nothing more was found, however, though the man afterward thought he had discovered the print of a moccasin in the sand, where it had been partly protected. But still some rain had reached it, and there was no certainty. The trail they were then following was, I have said, large and deeply worn, so that the little party of Lord H. soon got somewhat in advance of all the others, except that which had continued on the government road. "'Stay a bit, my lord,' said the good boatman, at length. "'We are too far ahead, and might chance to get a shot, if there be any of them red devils in the wood. I know them well, and all their ways, I guess, having been among them man and boy these thirty years.' "'and it was much worse when I first came. "'They'll lie as close to you as that bush, "'and the first thing you'll know of it "'will be a ball whizzing into you. "'But if we all go on in time, "'they can't keep back, "'but will creep away like mice. "'But what I can't understand is "'why they should try to hurt young Walter, "'for they were all as fond of him "'as if he were one of themselves. "'The fact is, my good friend,' "'replied Lord H. in a low tone, the day I came down to your landing last, one of the Anidas was, unfortunately, killed, and we are told that they will have some white man's blood in retaliation. "'To be sure they will,' said the man, with a look of consternation. "'They'll have blood for blood, if all of them die for it. But did Walter kill him?' "'No,' replied Lord H. "'It was our friend, the woodchuck, but he did it entirely in self-defence. "'What, Brooks?' exclaimed the boatman, in much surprise. "'Do let's hear about it, and I guess I can tell you how it will all go, "'better than any other man between this and Boston.' "'And he seated himself on the stump of a tree, in an attitude of attention. "'Very briefly, but with perfect clearness, "'Lord H. related all that had occurred on the occasion referred to. "'The boatman listened with evident anxiety, "'and then sat for a moment in silence "'with the air of a judge pondering over the merits of a case "'just pleaded before him.' "'I'll tell you how it is, my lord,' he said, at length, in an oracular tone. "'They've got him, depend on it. "'They've caught him here in the forest. "'But, you see, they'll not kill him yet. "'No, no, they won't. "'They've heard that Woodchuck has got away, "'and they've kidnapped young Walter to make sure of someone. "'But they'll stay to see if they can't get Brooks into their clutches somehow. "'They'll go dodgering about all manner of ways "'and try every trick you can think of to have him back. "'Very like you may well hear they've killed the lad, "'but don't you believe it for a good many months to come, "'for I guess it's likely they'll set this story afloat "'just to get Brooks to come back, "'for then he'll think that they've had all they wanted, "'and will know that he's safe from all but the father or the brother "'or the son of the man he has killed. "'But they'll wait and see. "'Oh, they're the most cunningest set of quitters that ever lived, "'and no doubt of it.' "'But let's get on, for the others are up. "'There's a red coat through the trees there, "'and they may, perhaps, have scalped the boy, "'though I don't think it's no-how likely.' "'Thus saying, he rose and led the way again "'through the dark glades of the wood, "'till the clearer light of day shining amidst the trunks "'and branches on before, "'showed that the party was approaching the spot "'where the late conflagration had laid "'the shady monarchs of the forest low.' Suddenly, at a spot where another trail crossed, the soldier who was with them stooped down and picked up something off the ground, saying, "'Here's a good large knife, anyhow.' "'Let me see, let me see,' cried the boatman. 
"'That's his knife for a score of dollars. "'Aye, Warner London. "'That's the maker. "'It's his knife. "'Now that shows nothing. "'He might have dropped it, "'but he's come precious near the fire. "'He surely would never try to break through "'and get himself burned to death. "'If the Injuns had got him, "'I should have thought they'd caught him farther back. "'Hello, what are they all doing on there? "'They've found the corpse, I guess.' The eyes of Lord H. were bent forward in the same direction, and though his lips uttered no sound, his mind had asked the same question and come to the same conclusion. Three negroes were standing gathered round some object lying on the ground, and the figure of Mr. Prevost himself, partly seen, partly hidden by the slaves, appeared sitting on a fallen tree, with his head resting on his hand, contemplating fixedly the same object which seemed to engage all the attention of the negroes. Lord H. hurried his pace and reached the spot in a few moments. He was somewhat relieved by what he saw when he came nearer, for the object at which Mr. Prevost was gazing at so earnestly was Walter's knapsack and not the dead body of his son. The straps which had fastened it to the lad's shoulders had been cut, not unbuckled, and it was, therefore, clear that it was not by his own voluntary act that it had been cast off but it did not appear to have been opened, and the boatman, looking down at it, muttered, "'No, no, they would not steal anything, not they. "'That was not what they wanted. "'It's no use looking any farther. "'The case is clear enough.' "'Too clear,' said Mr. Prevost in a dull, stern tone. "'That man Brooks has saved his own life "'and sacrificed my poor boy.' "'The tears gushed into his eyes as he spoke, "'and he turned away to hide them. Lord H. motioned to the negroes to take up the knapsack and carry it home, and then, advancing to Mr. Prevost's side, he took his hand, saying in a low tone, "'There may yet be hope, my dear sir. Let us not give way to despair, but exert ourselves instantly and strenuously to trace out the poor lad and save him. Much may yet be done. The government may interfere. He may be rescued by a sudden effort.' Mr. Prevost shook his head heavily and murmuring, are all my family destined to perish by Indians? Took his way slowly back toward his house. Nothing more was said till he was within a quarter of a mile of his own door, but there, just emerging from the cover of the wood, the unhappy father stopped and took the hand of Lord H. Break it to her gently, he said in a low tone. I am unfit. Misfortunes, disappointments and sorrows have broken the spirit which was once strong and cast down the energies which used never to fail. It is in such moments as these that I feel how much I am weakened. Prepare her to leave this place, too. My pleasant solitude has become abhorrent to me, and I cannot live here without a dread and memory always upon me. Go forward, my good lord. I will follow you soon. End of chapter 10《Chapter Eleven of Ticonderoga by George Payne Rainsford James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eleven. With great pain, Lord H. contemplated the task before him, but his was a firm and resolute heart, and he strode forward quickly to accomplish it as soon as possible. Fancy painted as he went all the grief and anguish he was about to inflict upon Edith, but Fancy hardly did her justice for it kept out of the picture many of the stronger and finer traits of her character. The beautiful girl was watching from the window and at once recognised her lover as he issued from the wood alone. Her heart sank with apprehension, it is true, but nevertheless she ran out along the little path to meet him in order to know the worst at once. Before they met, slowly and heavily her father came forth from the wood, with a crowd of boatmen and soldiers following in groups of six or seven at a time, and with wonderful accuracy she divined the greater part of what had occurred. She instantly stopped till Lord H. came up, and then inquired in a low and trembling voice, "'Have you found him? Is he dead or living?' "'We have not found him, dear Edith,' said Lord H., taking her hand and leading her towards the house." "'but your father conceives there is great cause for apprehension "'of this very worst kind, from what we have found. "'I trust, however, that his fears go beyond the reality "'and that there is still—' 
oh dear george do not keep me in suspense said edith let me hear all at once my mind is sufficiently prepared by long hours of painful thought i will show none of the weakness i displayed this morning what is it you have found his knife and his knapsack replied lord h he may have cast it off from weariness said edith catching at a hope i fear not replied her lover unwilling to encourage expectations to be disappointed the straps of the knapsack were cut not unbuckled and your father has given himself up entirely to despair although we found no traces of strife or bloodshed poor walter said edith with a deep sigh but she shed no tears and walked on in silence till they had reached the little veranda of the house then suddenly she stopped roused herself from her fit of thought and said raising her beautiful and tender eyes to her lover's face i have now two tasks before me to which i must give myself up entirely to console my poor father and to try to save my brother's life forgive me george if in executing these especially the latter i do not seem to give you as much of my thoughts as you have a right to you would not i know have me neglect either god forbid said lord h warmly but let me share in them edith there is nothing within the scope of honour and of right that i will not do to save your brother i sent him on this ill-starred errand to gratify me was that unfortunate expedition made through the wood but it is enough that he is your brother and your father's son and i will do anything undertake anything if there be still a hope go to your father first my love and then let us consult together i will see these men attended to for they want rest and food and i must take liberties with your father's house to provide for them do do she answered use it as your own and leaving him in the veranda she turned to meet her father for the time edith knew well mr prevost's mind was not likely to receive either hope or consolation all she could give him was tenderness and lord h who followed her to speak with the soldiers and boatmen soon saw her disappear into the house with mr prevost when he returned to the little sitting-room edith was not there but he heard the murmur of voices from the room above and in about half an hour she rejoined him she was much more agitated than when she left him and her face showed marks of tears not that her fears were greater or that she had heard anything to alarm her more but her father's deep despair had overpowered her own firmness all the weaker affections of human nature are infectious fear despair dismay and sorrow peculiarly so edith still felt however the importance of decision and action and putting her hand to her head with a look of bewilderment she stood for an instant in silence with her eyes fixed on the ground seemingly striving to collect her scattered thoughts in order to judge and act with precision one of the boatmen edith said lord h leading her to a seat has led me to believe that we shall have ample time for any efforts to serve your brother if he has as there is too much reason to fear fallen into the hands of these revengeful indians the man seems to know well what he talks of and boasts that he has been accustomed to the ways and manners of the savages since boyhood is he a tall handsome man with two beautiful children asked edith he is a tall good-looking man answered lord h but his children i did not see if he be the man i mean he can be fully depended upon answered edith and it may be well to ask his opinion and advice before he goes but for the present george let us consult alone perhaps i can judge better than you of poor walter's present situation that is first to be considered and then what are the chances what the means of saving him he is certainly in the hands of the indians of that i have no doubt but i think black eagle knew it when he guided us through the forest yet i do not think that he would willingly lift the tomahawk against my brother it will be at the last extremity when all means have failed of entrapping that unhappy man brooks we shall have time yes we shall certainly have time then the first step to be taken said lord h will be to induce the government to make a formal and imperative demand for his release i will undertake that part of the matter it shall be done at once 
Edith shook her head sadly. You know them not, she said. It would only hurry his fate. And after dropping her voice to a very low tone, she added, They would negotiate and hold councils, and Walter would be slain while they were treating. She pressed her hands upon her eyes as she spoke, as if to shut out the dreadful image her words called up. And then there was a moment or two of silence, at the end of which Lord H. inquired if it would not be better for him to see Sir William Johnson and consult with him. "'That may be done,' said Edith. "'No man in the province knows them as well as he does, and his advice may be relied upon. But we must take other measures, too. A tater must be told and consulted. Do you know, George,' she added, with a melancholy smile, I have lately been inclined at times to think that there is no small love between Walter and the Blossom, something more than friendship, at all events. "'But of course she will hear of his capture, and do the best she can to save him,' replied the young nobleman. Edith shook her head, answering, "'Save him she will, if any human power can do it, but that she knows of his capture I much doubt. These Indians are wise, George, as they think.' and never trust their acts, their thoughts, or their resolutions to a woman. They will keep the secret from a tater just as Black Eagle kept it from me, but she must be informed, consulted, and perhaps acted with. Then I think, too, that poor man Woodchuck should have tidings of what his act has brought upon us. I see not well, said Lord H., what result that can produce. Nor I, answered Edith, but yet it ought to be done in justice to ourselves and to him. He is bold, skilful, and resolute, and we must not judge of any matter in this country as we should judge in Europe. He may undertake and execute something for my brother's rescue, which you and I would never dream of. He is just the man to do so and to succeed. He knows every path of the forest, every lodge of the Indians. He is friendly with many of them and saved the lives of some of them. I have heard him say, and conferred great obligations upon others, and I believe that he will never rest till he has delivered Walter. "'Then I will find him out and let him know the facts directly,' said Lord H. "'Perhaps he and Otatza may act together, if we can open any communication with her.' "'She will act by herself and for herself, I am sure,' replied Edith, "'and some communication must be opened at any and all risk.' But let us see this man, George. Perhaps he may know someone going into the Indian territory who may carry a letter to her. It is a great blessing she can read and write, for we must have our secrets too, if we would frustrate theirs. Lord H. rose and proceeded to the hall, where the men whom he had brought with him were busily engaged in dispatching such provisions as Mr. Prevost's house could afford on the spur of the moment. The man he sought for was soon found, and when he had eaten the morsel almost between his teeth, he followed the young nobleman into the lesser room, and was soon in full conference with Edith and her lover. He again expressed the opinion that no harm would happen to young Walter Prevost for some months at the least. "'They have caught someone,' he said, to make sure of their revenge, and that is all they wanted for the present. Now they will look for the man that did it, and catch him if they can.' "'Can you tell where he is to be found?' asked Lord H. in a quiet tone. "'Why, you would not give him up to them,' said the man sharply. "'Certainly not,' replied Lord H. "'He is in safety, and of that safety I have no right to deprive him. "'It would make me an accessory to their act. "'But I wish to see him, to tell him what has occurred, "'and to consult him as to what is to be done.' "'That is a very different case,' replied the man gravely. "'And if that's all you want, I don't mind telling you "'that he is in Albany at the public house of the three boatmen. "'Our people who wrote him down said he did not intend to leave Albany for a week or more.' "'And now, Robert,' said Edith, "'can you tell me where I can get a messenger to the Oneidas? "'I know you loved my brother Walter, and I think if you can get somebody to go for me, "'we may save him.' "'I did indeed love him well, Miss Prevost,' replied the stout man, with his hard, firm eye moistening, "'and I'd do anything in reason to save him. "'It's a sad thing we did not know of this yesterday, "'for there was a half-breed Onondaga runner passed by and got some milk from us, "'and I gave him the panther-skin which you told some of our people to send, my lord, in the poor lad's name, 
to the daughter of the old chief Black Eagle. Edith turned her eyes to her lover's face, and Lord H. replied to their inquiring look, saying, It is true, Edith. Walter shot a panther in the woods, and wished to send the skin to Otezza. We had no time to lose at the moment, but as we came back I induced the guides to skin it, and made them promise to dry and send it forward by the first occasion. "'I strapped it on his back myself,' said the man, whom Edith called Robert, "'and gave him the money you sent for him too, my lord. "'He would have taken my message readily enough, and one could have trusted him. "'But it may be months before such another chance offers, I guess. "'Look here, Miss Edith,' he continued, turning toward her with his face full of earnest expression. "'I would go myself, but what would come of it? "'They would only kill me instead of your brother.' "'for one man is as good as another to them in such cases, "'and perhaps he mightn't get off either. "'But I have a wife and two young children, ma'am, "'and that makes me not quite so ready to risk my life "'as I was a few years ago.' "'It is not to be thought of,' said Edith calmly. "'I could ask no one to go but one at least partly of their own race, "'for it must be the blood of a white man they spill, I know. "'All I can desire you to do is, for Master Walter's sake, and mine to seek for one of the indian runners who are often about albany and about the army and send him up to me you see miss prevost replied the man there are not so many about as there used to be for it is coming on winter and as to the army when lord loudon took it to halifax almost all the runners and scouts were discharged some of them remained with webb it is true but a number of those were killed and scalped by montcalm's hurons However, I will make it my business to seek one, night and day, and send him up. "'Let it be someone on whom we can depend,' said Edith, "'someone whom you have tried and can trust.' "'That makes it harder still,' said the man, "'for though I have tried many of them, I can trust few of them. However, I will see, and not be long about it either. But it would be quite nonsense to send you a man who might either never do your message at all or go and tell those you don't want to hear it. It would indeed, said Edith sadly, as all the difficulties and risks which lay in the way of success were suggested to her by the man's words. Well, do your best, Robert, she said at length, after some thought, and as you will have to pay the man, here is the money for— You can pay him yourself, ma'am, replied the boatman bluntly. "'As for taking any myself for helping poor Master Walter, that's what I won't do. "'When I've got to take an oar in hand or anything of that kind, "'I make the people pay fast enough what my work is worth. "'Perhaps a little more sometimes,' he added with a laugh. "'But not for such work as this. No, no, not for such work as this. "'So good-bye, Miss Prevost. Good-bye, my lord. "'I won't let the grass grow under my feet in looking for some messenger.' Thus saying, he left the room, and Edith and Lord H. were once more left alone together. Sad and gloomy was their conversation, unchequered by any of those light beams of love and joy which Edith had fondly fancied were to light her future hours. All was dim and obscure in the future, and the point upon which both their eyes turned most intently in the dark, shadowy curtain of coming time, was the murkiest and most obscure of all. Still, whatever plan was suggested, whatever course of action was thought of, difficulties rose up to surround it, and perils presented themselves on all sides. Nor did the presence of Mr. Prevost, who joined them soon after, tend in any degree to support or to direct. He had lost all hope, at least for the time, and the only thing which seemed to afford him a faint gleam of light was the thought of communicating immediately with Brooks. "'I fear Sir William Johnson will do nothing,' he said. "'He is so devoted even to the smallest interests of the government. "'His whole mind is so occupied with this one purpose "'of cementing the alliance between Britain and the Five Nations "'that on my life I believe he would suffer any man's son to be butchered "'rather than risk offending an Indian tribe.' "'In his position it is very difficult for him to act,' said Lord H., "'but it might be as well to ascertain his feelings and his views "'by asking his advice.' as to how you should act yourself. Counsel he will be very willing to give, I am sure, and in the course of conversation you might discover how much and how little you may expect from his assistance. But you said, my dear lord, that you were going yourself to Albany tomorrow to see poor Brooks, 
said Mr. Prevost. I cannot leave Edith here alone. All three mused for a moment or two, and Edith perhaps the deepest of all. At length, however, she said, I am quite safe, my father. Of that I am certain, and you will be so, I am sure, when you remember what I told you of Black Eagle's conduct to me on that fatal night. He threw his blanket around me and called me his daughter. Depend upon it, long ere this, the news that I am his adopted child has spread through all the tribes, and no one would dare to lift his hand against me. I can easily, said Lord H., but Edith interrupted him gently, saying, "'Stay, George, one moment. Let my father answer. Do you not think, my dear father, that I am quite safe? In a word, do you not believe that I could go from lodge to lodge as the adopted daughter of Black Eagle, throughout the whole length of the long house of the Five Nations, without the slightest risk of danger? And if so, why should you fear?' "'I do indeed believe you could,' replied Mr. Prevost. Oh, that we could have extracted such an act from him to walk poor Walter. What Edith says is right, my lord. We must judge these Indians as we know them, and my only fear in leaving her here now would arise in the risks of incursion from the other side of the Hudson. Lord H. mused a little. It struck him there was something strange in Edith's way of putting the question to her father, something too precise, too minute to be called for, by any of the words which had been spoken. It excited nothing like suspicion in his mind, for it was hardly possible to look at the face or hear the tones of Edith Prevost and entertain so foul a thing as suspicion. But it made him doubt whether she had not some object, high and noble, he was sure, beyond the immediate point, which she did not think, as yet, to reveal. "'I was about to say,' he replied at length, to the last words of Mr. Prevost, "'that I can easily move a guard up here sufficient to protect the house. "'And I need not tell you, my dear sir,' he continued, taking Edith's hand, "'as the whole treasure of my happiness is here, "'that I would not advise you to leave her for an hour "'unless I felt sure she would be safe. "'I will send down by some of the men who are still in the house,' an order to Captain Hammond to march a guard here as early as possible tomorrow morning, under a trustworthy sergeant. As soon as it arrives, I will set out for Albany, and I think you can go to Johnson's Castle in perfect security. So it was arranged, and all parties felt no inconsiderable relief when some course of action was thus decided. Effort in this world is everything. Even the waters of joy will stagnate, and the greatest relief to care or sorrow. The strongest in danger or adversity is effort. The morning of the following day broke fresh and beautiful. There was a bright clearness in the sky, a brisk elasticity in the air that had not been seen or felt for weeks. Everything looked sparkling and sharp and distinct. Distances were diminished. Woods and hills which had looked dim appeared near and definite, and the whole world seemed in harmony with energy and effort. The heavy rains of the preceding morning had cleared the loaded atmosphere, as tears will sometimes clear the oppressed breast, and when Lord H. and Mr. Prevost mounted their horses to set out, it seemed as if the invigorating air had restored to the latter the firmness and courage of which the grief and horror of the preceding day had deprived him. Edith embraced her father and gave her cheek to the warm touch of her lover's lips, and then she watched them as they rode away till the wood shut them out from her sight. The soldiers were by this time installed in the part of the house destined for them, and some of the negroes were busy in preparing for their accommodation. But old Agrippa and the gardener boy and a woman servant stood near, watching their master and his guests as they departed. As soon as the little party was out of sight, however, Edith turned to Agrippa, saying, "'Send Chowder to me in the parlour. I want to speak with him.' As soon as the man appeared, she gazed at him earnestly, saying, "'How far is it to Oneida Lake, Chowder? Have you ever been there?' "'Oh, yes, Missy, often when I was a little boy. Why, you know, my father ran away and lived with Injuns long time, cause he had bad master.' "'but Injuns cuff him and thump him more nor worse, master, in the world. "'And so he come back again. "'How far be it? Oh, long way. "'Twice so far as Johnson Castle or more. "'Oh, yes, three times so far.' 
Edith knew how vague a negro's ideas of distance are, and she then put her question in a form which would get her a more distinct answer. "'Bethink you, Chowdo, she said, "'how long it would take me to reach the lake, "'how long it would take any one. "'Consider it well and let me know.' "'You, Missy, you!' cried the negro in great astonishment. "'You never think of going there.' "'I don't know, Chowdo, she replied. "'It might be needful, and I wish to know how long it would take.' "'That pend how you go, Missy,' replied the man. "'Ride so far as Johnson Castle, but can't ride no further. "'Dem walk as I walk? You never do that, and if you do, take you five days, and walk hard, too.' Poor Edith's heart sank. "'A takes a walks,' she said in a desponding tone. "'But it is true she can do much that I cannot do.' "'She walk? Oh, dear, no, Missy,' replied the negro. "'She walked little bit away from what they call Wood Creek or from de Mohawk. "'She walked no farther. "'All the rest she go in canoe, sometimes on Mohawk, sometimes on lake, sometimes on creek. "'She came here once in three day. "'I hear old grey buzzard, de pipe-bearer, say, "'that time when de Satchem come with his warriors.' "'And can I do the same?' asked Edith eagerly. "'Sure you can, if you get a canoe,' answered Chowder. "'But, oh, Missy, think of the Indians. "'They kidnap Massa Walter. "'They kill you, too.' "'There is no fear, Chowdo,' replied Edith. "'Even my father owns that I could safely go from one lodge to another "'through the whole land of the Five Nations "'because Black Eagle has put his blanket round me "'and made me his daughter.' "'Massa knows best,' said Chowdo. "'But if so, why they kidnap Massa Walter?' "'Black Eagle refused to make him his son, or my father his brother,' said Edith, with the tears rising in her eyes. "'But the truth is, Chowder, that I go to try if I can save poor Walter's life. "'I go to tell the Blossom that they hold my Walter, her Walter, a prisoner, "'and see whether she cannot find means to rescue him.' "'I see, I see, Missy,' said the man gravely. "'And then, after pausing for a moment, he asked abruptly, "'I go with you?' "'Someone I must have to show me the way,' replied Edith. "'Are you afraid, Chowdo?' "'Afraid?' cried the man, bursting into a fit of joyous laughter. "'Oh, no, not afraid. Injuns no hurt nigger. "'Kick him, cuff him, no scalp him, "'cause nigger got no scalp lock. <laughs> "'I go help save Massa Walter. "'I never have no good thing, but he give Chowdo some. "'Oh, I'll manage all for you.' We find plenty canoe, Mohawk canoe, and Ida canoe, if we say you Black Eagle's daughter going to see your sister Otatsa. When you go, Missy. Very soon, Chowdo, replied Edith, and proceeded to explain her plan to him still farther. She said that she wished to set out that very day, and as soon as possible, in order first to communicate the tidings of Walter's capture to Otatsa without delay, and secondly to save her father as many hours of anxiety as possible. She did not absolutely tell the man that she had not informed her father of her intention, but he divined it well. Nevertheless, when he heard somewhat more at large the conduct of Black Eagle toward her on the night of poor Walter's capture, he was quite satisfied of her safety as far as the Indians were concerned. He urged her, however, to go in the first place to Johnson Castle, where she could procure a canoe, or even a bateau, he felt certain and it was long before he comprehended her objection to that course. At length, however, his usual, "'I see, I see,' showed that he had caught a light at last, and that he was soon ready with his resources. "'Then we walked to the nearest end of Little Pond, only three mile,' he said, "'fishing canoe all ready. Next we go down Little Pond and de Creek into Lake. Keep by north side, and then walk to Mohawk, three mile more. I carry canoe across my back. Then, Injun or no Injun, we get along. If Missy like to take other nigger, too, we get on very fast, and he carry bundle. I must have one of the women with me, said Edith, in a thoughtful tone. But which? The negro's countenance fell a little. He was very proud of the confidence placed in him, and he did not like to share it with a white woman. His tone, then, was rather dejected, though submissive, when he asked, Do Missy take white woman Sally with her? "'Sally no walk, Sally no run, Sally no paddle when Chowdo is tired.' 
No, replied Edith at once. I can take no white person with me, Chowder, for it would risk her life. And even to save my poor brother, I must not lure another into sad peril. One of your colour, Chowder, they will not hurt, for it is a white man's blood they will have for a white man's act. Then take Sister Bab, cried Chowder, rubbing his hands with the peculiar low negro chuckle. Sister Bab walk, run, carry bundle, and twelve paddle with anybody. Now Bab was a stout negro woman of about forty years of age, with a pleasant countenance and very fine white teeth, who rejoiced in the cognomen of sister, though, to the best of Edith's knowledge, she was sister to no one, in the house at least. Her usual occupations were in the farmyard, the dairy, and the pigsty, so that Edith had not seen very much of her, but all that she had seen was pleasant, for Sister Bab seemed continually on the watch to do everything for everybody, receiving every order, even from Master Walter, who was sometimes a little inconsiderate, with a broad, good-humoured grin, and her constant activity and indefatigable energy promised well for an undertaking such as that in which Edith was engaged. "'Well, Chowdo,' said the young lady, "'I do not know that I could make a better choice.' "'Send Sister Bab to me, for where dangers such as these are to be encountered, "'I will not take any one without her own free consent.' "'Oh, she go, I talk with her,' said Chowder. "'You never trouble yourself, Missy. she will go to the world's end for Miss Edith, "'and fight like devil if, if there be need. "'I never saw a woman so good at catching fish. "'She took them out like cabbages.' "'That may be useful to us, too,' said Edith, with a faint smile. "'But send her to me, nevertheless, Chowder. I want to speak with her before I go. The good woman, when she came, made not the slightest objection, but on the contrary looked upon the expedition as something very amusing, which would give a relief to the tedium of her daily labours, and at the same time afford full occupation for her active spirit. She was as ready with suggestions as Chowder, told Edith everything she had better take with her, detailed all her own proposed preparations, and even begged for a rifle, declaring that she was as good a shot as Master Walter, and had often fired a gun when he had brought it home undischarged. Edith declined, however, to have a riflewoman in her train, and having told her two chosen attendants that she would be ready in an hour, retired to make her preparations and write a few lines to her father and her lover to account for her absence when they returned. Both letters were brief, but we will only look at that which she left for Mr. Prevost. "'My dear father,' she said, "'I am half afraid I am doing wrong "'in taking this step I am about to take "'without your knowledge or approbation. "'But I cannot sit still and do nothing "'while all are exerting themselves to save my poor brother. "'I feel that it is absolutely necessary "'to any hope for his safety "'that a tater should be informed immediately "'of his situation. "'It may be months before any Indian runner is found, "'and my poor brother's fate may be sealed.' Were it to cost my life, I should think myself bound to go. But I am the only one who can go in perfect safety, for while promising his protection to me, and insuring me against all danger, the Black Eagle refused to give any assurance in regard to others. You have yourself acknowledged, my dear father, that I shall be perfectly safe, and I have also the advantage of speaking the Indian tongue well. In these circumstances, would it not be wrong— would it not be criminal in me to remain here idle when I have even a chance of saving my poor brother? Forgive me, then, if I do wrong on account of the motives which lead me. My course is straight to the Mohawk, by the little pond and the lake, and then up the Mohawk and Wood Creek as far as they will carry me, for I wish to save myself as much fatigue as possible, and I venture to take the canoe from the pond. I have asked Chowdo and Sister Bab to accompany me, as I know you would wish me to have protection and assistance on the way, in case of any difficulty. I hope to be back in six days at the farthest, and if possible, I will send a runner to inform you of my safe arrival amongst the Anidas. Once more, my dear father, think of the great object I have in view, and forgive your affectionate daughter. When these letters were written, Edith dressed herself in full Indian costume, which had been given her by Otezza and a beautiful Indian maiden she looked, though the skin was somewhat too fair, and her hair wanted the jetty black. 
in the indian pouch or wallet she placed some articles of european convenience and a large hunting knife and then making up a small package of clothes for sister bab to carry she descended to the lower story here however she met with some impediments which she had not expected the news of her proposed expedition had spread through the whole household and caused almost an open revolt the white women were in tears old agrippa was clamorous and the fat black cook declared loudly that miss edith was mad and should not go so far indeed did she carry her opposition that the young lady was obliged to assume a stern and severe tone which was seldom heard in edith's voice and to command her to retire at once from her presence the poor woman was at once overawed for her courage was not very permanent and bursting into tears she left the room declaring she was sure she would never see miss edith again edith then gave all the keys of the house to old agrippa with the two letters which she had written chowdo took up the bag of provisions which he had prepared sister bab charged herself with a package of clothes and edith walking between them turned away from her father's house amidst the tears of the white women and a vociferous burst of grief from the negroes her own heart sank for a moment and she asked herself shall i ever pass that threshold again shall i ever be pressed hereafter in the arms of those i so much love but she banished such feelings and drove away such thoughts and murmuring my brother my poor brother she walked on End of chapter 11chapter twelve of ticonderoga by george payne rainsford james this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twelve leaving edith to pursue her way toward the united territory and mr prevost after parting with lord h at the distance of some three miles from his own house to ride on to johnson castle let us follow the young nobleman to albany where he arrived somewhat after nightfall his first duty, as he conceived it, led him to the quarters of the commander-in-chief, where he made a brief but clear report of all that had occurred in his transactions with the Indians. "'I found,' he said, from information communicated by Sir William Johnson, that there was no need of any concealment, and that, on the contrary, it would be rather advantageous to appear at the meeting with the Five Nations in my proper character.' the results were what i have told you there is one other point however which i think it necessary to mention and which if imprudently treated might lead to serious results he then went on to state generally the facts in regard to the death of the indian by the hands of woodchuck and the supposed capture of walter prevost by a party of the oneidas it would be uninteresting to the reader to hear the particulars of the conversation which followed suffice it to say that the government of the colony in all its departments was very well disposed to inactivity at that time and not at all inclined to exert itself for the protection of individuals or even of greater interests unless strongly pressed to do so this lord h was not at all inclined to do as he was well aware from all he had heard that no action on the part of the government short of the sudden march of a large body of troops would effect the liberation of walter prevost and that to expect such a movement which itself might be unsuccessful was quite out of the question with the officers who were in command at that time his conference with the commander-in-chief ended he declined an invitation to supper and went out on his search for the small inn where he had been told he would find the man whose act however justifiable had brought so much wretchedness upon mr prevost's family the city of albany in those days as we have reason to know from very good authority though not numbering by many thousands as great a population as it contains at present occupied a space nearly as large as the present city one long street ran by the river to the very verge of which beautiful and well-cultivated gardens extended and from the top of the hill down to this lower street ran another very nearly if not exactly of the same position and extent as the present state street on the top of the hill was the fort and built in the centre of the large descending street which swept round them on either side 
were two or three churches, a handsome market-place, and a guard-house. A few other streets ran down the hill in a parallel line with, with this principal one, and other small streets, lanes, and alleys connected them all together. Nevertheless, the population, as I have said, was comparatively very small, for between house and house, and street and street, throughout the whole town, were large and beautiful gardens filling up spaces now occupied by buildings and thronged with human beings. A great part of the population was at that time Dutch, and all the neatness and cleanliness of true Dutch houses and Dutch streets was to be seen in Albany in those days. Would we could say as much as present. No pigs then ran in the streets, to the horror of the eye and the annoyance of the passenger. No cabbage leaves or stalks disgraced the gutter, and the only place in which anything like filth or uncleanliness was to be seen was at the extremity of the literal street, where, naturally, the houses of the boatmen and others connected with the shipping were placed for the sake of approximating to the water. There, certainly, some degree of dirt existed, and the air was perfumed with the high savour of tar and tobacco. It was toward this part of the town that Lord H. directed his steps, inquiring for the inn called the Three Boatmen. Several times, however, he was frustrated in his attempt to obtain information by the ignorance of a great portion of the inhabitants of the English language, and the pipe was removed from the mouth only to reply in Dutch, I do not understand. At length, however, he was directed aright, and found a small and somewhat mean-looking house in which an adventurous Englishman from a purlieus of Clare Market had established a tavern for the benefit of boatmen. It had in former times belonged to a Dutch settler, and still retained many of the characteristic features of its origin, while four trees stood in line before the door, with benches underneath them for the convenience of those who chose to sit and poison the sweet air of the summer evening with the fumes of tobacco. Entering through a swing door into the narrow, sandy passage, which descended one step from the street, Lord H. encountered a negro tapster with a white apron, of whom he inquired if Captain Brooks was still there. "'Oh, yes, Massa Officer,' said the man, with a grin. "'You mean Massa Woodchuck,' he continued, showing that the good man's Indian nickname was very extensively known. "'You find him in there, in de coffee-room, and he pointed to a door, once white, now yellow and brown with smoke, age, and dirty fingers. Lord H. opened the door and went in amongst as strange and unprepossessing an assemblage of human beings as it had ever been his chance to light upon. The air was rendered obscure by smoke, so that the candles looked dim and red, and it was literally difficult to distinguish the objects around. What the odour was, it is impossible to say, for it was as complicated as the antidote of Mithridates. But the predominant smells were certainly those of beer, rum, and Holland gin. Some ten or twelve little tables of exceedingly highly polished mahogany, but stained here and there by the contaminating marks of wet glasses, divided the room amongst them, leaving just space between each to place two chairs back to back, and in this small den not less than five or six and twenty people were congregated, almost all drinking, almost all smoking, some talking very loud, some sitting in profound silence, as the quantity of liquor imbibed or the national characteristics of the individual might prompt. Gazing through the haze upon the scene, which, besides the sturdy and coarse but active Englishman, and the heavy phlegmatic Dutchman, contained one or two voluble Frenchmen, deserters from the Canadas, none of them showing themselves in a very favourable light. Lord H. could not help comparing the people before him with the free, wild Indians he had lately left, and asking himself, which are the savages? At length his eye, however, fell upon a man sitting at the table in the corner of their room next to the window. He was quite alone, with his back turned to the rest of the people in the place, his head leaning on his hand, and a short pipe laid down upon the table beside him. He had no light before him, as most of the others had, and he might have seemed asleep. So still was his whole figure, had it not been that the fingers of his right hand, which rested on the table, beat time to an imaginary tune. 
Approaching close to him, Lord H. drew a seat to the table and laid a hand upon his arm. Woodchuck looked round, and a momentary expression of pleasure, slight and passing away rapidly, crossed his rugged features. The next moment his face was all cold and stern again. "'Very kind of you to come and see me, my lord,' he said in a dull, sad tone. "'What do you want with me? Have you got anything for me to do?' "'I'm sorry to see you looking so melancholy, Captain,' said Lord H., evading his question. "'I hope nothing else has gone amiss.' "'Haven't I cause enough to be melancholy?' said the other, looking round at the people in the room, cooped up with a penful of swine. "'Come out. Come out to the door. It's cold enough out, but the coldest wind that ever blew is better than the filthy air of, of these pigs.' As he spoke, he rose, and a little pert-looking Frenchman, who had overheard him, exclaimed in a bantering tone why you call us pigs more nor yourself de great dog get out of my way for fear i break your back said woodchuck in a low stern voice if your neck had been broken long ago it would have been better for your country and for mine and taking up the little frenchman by the nape of the neck and one arm he set him upon the table from which he had just risen a roar of laughter burst from a number of the assembled throats the little Frenchman sputtered with wrath, without daring to carry the expression of his indignation farther, and Woodchuck strode quietly out of the room, followed by his military visitor. "'Here, let us sit down,' he said, placing himself on a bench under a leafless tree, and leaving room for Lord H. by his side. "'I'm gloomy enough, my lord, and haven't I reason to be so? Here I am for life.' This is to be my condition with the swine that gather up in these styes of cities, suffocating in such dens as these. I guess I shall drown myself some day when I am driven quite mad. I know a man has no right to lay hands upon himself. I learnt my Bible when I was young, and know what's God's will, so I shan't do anything desperate so long as I be right here. And he laid his finger on his forehead. No, no. "'I'll just take as much care of my life,' he continued, "'as though it were a baby I was nursing. "'But unless them Injuns catch some other white man and kill him, "'which, God forbid, I've got to stay here for life, "'and even if they do, it's no more nor a chance they'll kill me too, "'if they got me. "'And when I think of them beautiful woods and pleasant lakes, "'with the pictures of everything round painted so beautiful on them, "'when they are still,' and the streams that go dancing and splashing along over the big black stones, and the small white pebbles, seeming for all the world to sing as if for pleasure at their freedom, and the open, friendly air of the hillside, and the clouds skimming along, and the birds glancing through the branches, and the squirrels skipping and chattering as if they were mocking everything, not so nimble as themselves. I do often believe I shall go crazed to think I shall never see those things again. Lord H. felt for him much, for he had in his own heart a sufficient portion of love for the wilder things of nature, to sympathise in some degree with one who loved them so earnestly. "'I trust, Woodchuck,' he said, "'that we shall be able to find some employment for you with the army, if not with my own corps, with some other, which may give you glimpses at least of the scenes you love so well, and of the unconfined life you have lived so long.' but I have come to consult you upon a subject of much and immediate importance, and we must talk of that the first thing. "'What is that?' asked Brooks, in an indifferent tone, fixing his eyes upon the stones of the street, faintly lighted by the glare from within the house. Lord H. began his account of what had happened between the Mohawk and the Hudson, with some circumlocution, for he did not feel at all sure of the effect it would produce upon his companion's mind, and the woodchuck seemed to fall into one of those deep reveries in which one may be said to hear without hearing. He took not the slightest notice of what his noble visitor said regarding the burning of the wood, or the danger of Mr. Prevost and Edith. It seemed to produce no more distinct effect than would the wind whistling in his ears. He sat calm and silent without an observation, but he grew more attentive, though only in a slight degree, when the narrator came to mention the anxiety of the family at the protracted absence of Walter, and when at last Lord H. described the finding of the knife and the knapsack, and told the conclusions to which the whole family had come, 
He started up, exclaiming, "'What's that? What's that?' And then, after a moment's pause, he sank down upon his seat again, saying with a groan, "'They have got him. They have got him, and they will tomahawk him. The bloody barbarous critters! Couldn't they have chosen some more worthless thing than that?' Pressing his hand tight upon his forehead, as if he fancied the turbulent thoughts within would burst it, he remained for a moment or two in silence, till Lord H. asked if he imagined they would execute their bloody purposes speedily. "'No, no,' cried the man. "'No fear of that. They'll take time enough. That's the worst of the savages. It's no quick rage, no angry heat with them, no word and a blow. It's cold, bitter, long premeditated hatred they wouldn't have half the pleasure if they didn't draw out their revenge by the week and the month but what's to be done now gracious god what's to be done now that is precisely what i came to consult you upon said lord h but let us talk over the matter calmly my good friend this is a case where grief anger and indignation can do nothing but where deliberate thought reason and policy even cunning such as their own, for, if we could arrive at it, we should be quite justified in using it, may perhaps do something to save this poor boy. "'How the devil would you have me calm?' exclaimed the man vehemently, and then, suddenly checking himself, he said, "'You're right, you're right. I am forgetting my old habits in these smoky holes. Thought, cunning, those are the only things to do with an Indian.' It's tarnation hard to outwit them, but it may be done when one knows his tracks well. I can't get my brain to hold steady tonight. This story has upset all my thoughts, and I've got no consideration in me. You must give me a night and a day to think over the matter, and then I'll see what's to be done. By the Lord, Walter shan't die, poor fellow. What should he die for? However, I guess it's no use talking in that sort of manner. I must think of what's to be done. That's the business in hand. I'll think as soon as I can, my lord. Only you just now tell me all you have done, if you've done anything. As for Prevost, I don't suppose he's had time to do much, for though he's always right in the end, and no man's opinion is worth more, yet if you touch his heart and his feelings, as you call them, his wits get all in a work, just like mine at this minute. "'More fool he, and I, too.' "'We have done something,' said Lord H. in reply. "'Mr. Prevost set out this morning to see Sir William Johnson.' "'He's no good,' growled Woodchuck impatiently. "'I came hither to consult with you,' continued Lord H., "'and we have commissioned the boatman, whom they call Robert, a tall stout man.' "'I know him, I know him,' said Woodchuck. "'Passably honest, the best of them.' "'Well,' "'We have commissioned him,' resumed the young nobleman, "'to seek for some Indian runner, or half-breed, "'to carry news of this event to Etatsa, "'whom Edith believes the tribe will keep in the dark "'in regard to the capture of Walter.' "'Likely, likely,' said Woodchuck. "'Miss Prevost understands them. "'They'll not tell the women anything, "'for fear they should meddle. "'They've a poor opinion of squaws.' "'But the girl may do a great deal of good, too, if you can get tidings to her. "'She's not as cunning as the rest of them, but she has more heart and soul, and resolution, too, "'than a whole tribe of Indian women. "'That comes of her mother being a white woman.' "'Her mother a white woman?' exclaimed Lord H. "'Ay, didn't you know that?' said Woodchuck. "'Just as white as Miss Prevost, and quite a lady, too, she was, to look at or to speak to.' though she was not fond of speaking with white men, and would draw back to the lodge whenever she saw one. I did speak to her once, though, when she was in a great fright about Black Eagle, who had gone to battle against the French, and I, happening to come that way, gave her some news of him. But we are getting astray from what's of more matter than that. The girl will save him, take my word for it, if there's strength enough in that little body to do it. But let me see, you talk of Indian runners— where is one to be found who can be trusted? They're generally a bad set, the scum of the tribes. No real warrior would take up on such a trade. However, what's to be done? No white person can go, for they'll scalp him to a certainty, and he would give his life for Walter's, that's all. 
"'On my life it would be as well to give the dangerous errand to some felon, "'as I have heard say they do in despotic countries, "'give criminals some dangerous task to perform, "'and then, if they succeed and escape, so much the better for them. "'If they die, so much the better for the community. "'But I'm getting wandering again,' he continued, rising. "'Now, my lord, this is no use. "'Give me a few hours to think. "'Tomorrow at noon, if you will.' "'and then I'll come and tell you what my opinion is.' "'As he spoke, he turned abruptly toward the house "'without any ceremonious leave-taking, "'and only looked round to put one more question. "'At the fort, I suppose?' he said. "'Lord H. assented, and Brooks entered the house "'and at once sought his own chamber. "'End of chapter 12《ハッタ13 of Ticonderoga by George Payne Rainsford James。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。Chapter 13 In a small room, under a roof which slanted out in a straight line, but made an obtuse angle in the midst of descent, lighted alone by a horn lantern, such as was used on board the river boats at night, sat the stout man whom we have described under the name of Brooks. Little furniture of any kind did the room contain. There was a small half-tester bed, with its dull curtains of a broad red and white checkered stuff. There was the little table at the side of the room, jammed close against the wall. There was the solitary chair, the washstand, with its basin and its ewer, both somewhat maimed. There was the little looking-glass hanging from a nail driven in the wall, with its narrow, badly gilt frame and its plates so distorted that when one looked in it the reflection seemed to be making faces at the original. Dull with imbibing many a year's loaded atmosphere were those faded walls, and many a guest had written upon them, in pencil, his own name or the name of his sweetheart, permanent memorials of transitory tenants, long-cherished memories of affections gone to the grave. There were two or three distiches, too, and a quatrain somewhat more polished. But the man who sat there noted none of these things. The dim light, the gloomy aspect of the room, might sink in upon his spirit, and render the darkness within more dark. The strange, ill-looking double arch of the ceiling, the obtrusive two straight lines instead of one, with the blunt, unmeaning angle between them, giving an aspect of brokenness to the roof, as if it were ready to bulge out and then crash down, might irritate without his knowing why, but still he noted them not with anything like observation. His mind was busy with things of its own, things of which feelings took a share, as well as thought, and he was, if not dead, sleeping to the external world. Even his beloved woods and streams, the fresh air and open skies, were forgotten for the time. He argued with himself a case of conscience hard to solve. He was as brave a man as ever lived, habituated all his life to perils of many kinds, and had met them all fearlessly. Wake him in the woods at midnight, you would find him ready. Deafen his ear with the drum or the war whoop, you could not make him start. He blinked not at the cannon flash or the blaze of the lightning, and would have faced the fiery-mouthed platoon without a wavering step and yet the love of life was strong in him. He had so many joys in the bright treasury of nature. To his simple, nay, wild tastes, there were so many pleasures in the wide world that to part with them was hard, very hard. He had never known how valuable earthly existence was to him till that hour. He had never felt how different a thing it is to hazard it in bold daring or to contemplate the throwing of it away in reckless passion, or disappointment and despair, from calmly and deliberately laying it down as a sacrifice, whatever be the end, the inducement, or the duty. What was the case of conscience he proposed to himself? Simply this, whether he should suffer another to die for his act, or place himself not only in the peril from which he had lately escaped, but in the actual grasp of death. Some men of enthusiastic spirit and great constitutional fearlessness might have decided the matter at a dash, and, with the first impulse of a generous nature, cast themselves under the uplifted tomahawk 
to save their innocent friend. But he was not such, and I do not intend so to represent him. He was not a man to do anything without deliberation, without calculating all things, though he was as generous as most men, as this world goes. All his habits, the very course of his previous life, disposed him to careful forethought. Every day had had its watchfulness, every hour its precaution. The life of the woods in those days was a life of peril and preparation, where consideration might be very rapid, but was always needful. And now he debated the question with himself. Could he live on and suffer Walter Prevost to die in his place? There were strenuous advocates on both sides, but the love of life was the most subtle, if generosity was the most eloquent. Poor boy, he thought, why should he die for what I have done? Why should he be cut off so soon from all life's hopes and blessings? Why should his father's eyes be drowned in tears, and his sister's heart wrung with grief, when I can save them all? And he so frank and noble too, so full of every kindly feeling and generous quality, so brave, so honest, so true-hearted, innocent too, innocent of every offence, quite innocent in this case. But then spoke self, and he thought, Am I not innocent too, as innocent as he is? Did I ever harm the man? Did I provoke the savage? Did I not slay him in pure defence? And shall I lay down the life I then justly protected at the cost of that of another human being, because a race of fierce Indians, unreasoning, bloodthirsty savages, choose to offer a cruel sacrifice to their god of revenge, and have found a victim? Still, he continued, taking the other side, it is for my act the sacrifice is offered, and if there must be a sacrifice, ought not the victim to be myself? Besides, were it any worthless life that was in jeopardy, were it that of some desperate rover, some criminal, some man without ties or friendships or affections, one might leave him to his fate, perhaps without remorse. But this poor lad, how many hopes are centred in him? What will not his family lose? What will not the world? And I, what am I, that my life should be weighed against his? Is he not my friend, too, and the son of my friend, one who has always overflowed with kindness and regard toward me? His resolution was almost taken, but then the cunning pleader, vanquished in direct argument, suggested a self-deceit. It is strange, he thought, that these Indians, and especially their chief, should fix upon one with whom they have ever been so friendly, should choose a youth whom they have looked upon as a brother, when they might surely have found some other victim. Can this be a piece of their savage cunning? They know how well I love the lad, and how much friendship has been shown me by his father. Can they have taken him as a bait to their trap, without any real intention of sacrificing him, and only in the hope of luring me into their power? At first sight the supposition seemed reasonable, and he was inclined to congratulate himself that he had not precipitately fallen into the snare. How they would have yelled with triumph when they found me bringing my head to the hatchet! But speedily his knowledge of the Indian character and habits undeceived him. He knew that in such cases they always made sure of some victim, and that the more near and dear he was to the offender, the better for their purpose. Himself first, a relation next, a friend next, and he cast the self-fraud away from him. But the love of life had not yet done, though obliged to take another course and suggest modifications. Was there no middle course to be taken? Was it absolutely necessary that he should sacrifice his own life to save that of Walter Prevost? Could the object not be effected without his giving himself up to the savages? Might not someone else fall into their hands? Might not the lad be rescued by some daring effort? This was the most plausible suggestion of all, but it was the one that troubled him the most. He had detected so many attempts in his own heart to cheat himself, that he suspected he might be deceiving himself still, and his mind got puzzled and confused with doubts. 
He went to bed and lay down in his clothes, but he could not sleep without taking some resolution, and rising again, he pressed his hands upon his aching temples, and determined to cast away self from the question altogether, to look upon it as if it affected some other person and Walter Prevost, and judge accordingly. His plan succeeded. He separated the truth from the falsehood, and came to the conclusion that it would be folly to go and give himself up to certain death, as long as there was a chance of saving his young friend by other means but that it was right to do so if other means failed, and that neither by delay nor even uncertain efforts must he risk the chance of saving him by the ultimate sacrifice. He made up his mind accordingly to re-enter the Indian territory in spite of every peril, to conceal himself as best he could, to watch the Indians as he would watch a wild beast, and to be ready for any opportunity or for any decision and when his resolution was finally taken, he lay down and slept profoundly. End of chapter 13after it was over, massed together in its extraordinary rapidity and seen but from one point at the end? Swiftly skimming in a bark canoe upon the glossy bosoms of the lovely lakes, which reflected every hue of herb and tree, and sky and mountain, darting along bright and sparkling streams, sometimes beneath the overhanging canopy of boughs, sometimes under the pure dark eye of heaven, often struggling with a rapid, often having to pass along the shore to turn a waterfall, at times walking along through the glowing woods burning with the intense colouring of autumn, at times surrounded by a number of Indians, each rendering quiet, earnest service to the adopted daughter of the great Oneida chief, at times wandering on in the dim forest, with no one but her two dark attendants near, now the fierce howl of the midnight wolf sounding in her ear, now the sharp garrulous cry of the blue jay, now the shrill scream of the wood hall, now the Indian lodge or castle, as the Iroquois sometimes called their dwellings, now the brown canopy of the autumn wood covered her, but still, under the skilful guidance, and with the eager help of the two negroes, she went forward with extraordinary rapidity, leaving miles and miles behind her every hour. It seemed almost like a pleasant dream, or at least it would have seemed so, had the sad and fearful motives which led her on been ever banished from her mind. Even as it was, the variety of the objects, the constant succession of new matters of interest, the events, small in themselves but important to her, which occurred to facilitate or impede her progress, were all a relief to her overcharged mind, and she reached the Oneida territory less depressed than when she set out from her home. One cause, perhaps, of the feeling of renewed strength which she experienced was a renewal of hope from the conduct of the Indians toward her wherever she met them. She found that even amongst the Mohawks she was recognised at once as the adopted daughter of the great Oneida chief, and it was evident that he had spread far and wide, as he returned to his own abode after the conference at Johnson Castle, the fact of his having adopted the daughter of the pale-faced Prevost. There is always something, too, in the fact of an enterprise being actually commenced, which gives spirit to pursue it to the end. While we stand and gaze at it from a distance, hesitating whether we shall undertake it or not, the difficulties are magnified, the facilities obscured, the rock and precipice rise up threateningly to our imagination, while the small paths by which they may be surmounted are unseen. Day had yet an hour of life when Edith approached what we find called in the history of the times the Castle of the Oneidas. Wigwam, it is customary to name all the Indian villages, giving an idea of insignificance and meanness and completely savage state, which the principal residences of the five nations did not at that time merit. Most of them were very like that which Edith now approached. It was built upon a slight elevation near the lake, with a large protruding rock near it, for the Anidas always affected near their dwelling 
some symbol significant of their favourite appellation, the children of the stone. Around it were high palisades, enclosing a considerable area, within which the huts of the Indians were constructed. Rising considerably above the rest were two wooden buildings, in the erection of which European workmanship was apparent. The one was a large oblong building, regularly roofed and singled, like that of any English settler. It consisted of two stories, and in the upper one regular framed windows were to be seen. In the lower story there were none, light being admitted by the door. That lower story, however, was floored by plain pine boards, and divided by a sort of curtain into two equal compartments. The other building bore the appearance of a church in miniature, with a small cottage or hut attached, which was, in reality, the residence of the missionary Mr. Gore. Even Edith was surprised to see the home of a Tetzer so different from the ideas conveyed to her by the wandering traders, who even while carrying on commercial intercourse with the tribes were in a state of semi-hostility toward the Indians, representing them as bloody savages, and cheating them whenever they could. Slowly walking on between her two negro companions, for she was tired with a longer walk than usual, Edith approached the open gates of the castle, and met with no opposition in entering. A tall, handsome warrior passed out, fully clothed in Indian costume, and only marked out from any civilised man by the shaved head and the painfully significant scalp-lock. His step was stately and calm, and his air grave and reserved. Twice he turned his eyes upon Edith's face with a look of evident wonder and admiration, but he took no farther notice and passed on. He was the only man whom she saw on entering the village, till after passing through many huts where women and children were to be seen busily employed, she came in sight of the door of the chief's house, and beheld there a figure seated on the ground, quietly engaged in the art of embroidery, after the fashion in which the Indian women so greatly excel. It was a figure which she knew well, and the tranquil air and easy grace, as well as the quiet, peaceful employment, showed Edith at once that she had not been mistaken in, in supposing that Tetsa was altogether ignorant of the peril of one dear to them both. As she came near, she heard the Indian girl, in her happy ignorance, singing a sweet but somewhat plaintive song, and the next moment Tetsa, raising her eyes, beheld the three figures, and at once perceived that they were not of her people. For an instant she did not recognise Edith in her Indian garb, but when she did recognise her, the emotion produced was alarm rather than joy. She felt at once that some great and important event, some occurrence full of peril or of sorrow, must have brought Edith thither. The beautiful lips parted with a tremulous motion. The large, dark eye, Indian in its colour but European in its form, became full of anxiety, the rosy colour of her cheek, which probably had obtained for her the name of the blossom, faded away. The paleness spread over the clear brown skin. Starting up, however, she cast the embroidery away from her, and springing forward, threw her arms around Edith's neck. Then, as her hand rested on her fair companion's shoulder, she asked in a whisper, "'What is it, my sister? There must be a storm in the sky. There must be lightning in the cloud.' What tempest wind has swept my sister hither? What flood of sorrow has borne Edith to Atezza? Hush, said Edith in a low tone, for there were some other Indian women near. I will tell my sister where no ears can hear but her own. There is tempest in the sky. A pine tree has fallen across the threshold of my father's house, and we are sad for fear the hatchet of the woodman should lop all its green branches away. "'Can I speak with the blossom speedily and in secret?' "'Instantly,' answered Otatsa. "'The warriors have all gone forth to hunt for three days, "'the bear and the moose. "'The black eagle is with them. "'There are but three men of deeds in the castle now, "'and why they are women now and go not forth to the hunting with the rest, "'I cannot tell. "'But they are little within the palisade. "'Daily they go forth and remain absent long. "'Come in hither, my sister,' "'for though few here speak the tongue we speak, "'it were better not to let the wind hear us.' 
"'Can some of the women give food and lodging to these two Negroes?' asked Edith, adding, "'They have been well worn, and know that a life depends upon their silence.' Otetsa called to an elderly Indian woman who was cooking at the door of a cabin near, and placed Chowdo and his companion under her charge. She then turned to Edith, saying, "'Come, my sister!' But before they entered the building, Edith inquired if Mr. Gore was there, saying, "'Perhaps he might give us counsel.' "'My father sent him away some days ago,' answered Otetsa. "'He will not be back for a month, perhaps longer. "'I think he has sent him to secure him from danger.' alas said edith that the danger should have fallen upon others alas alas said otetsa and edith felt her hand tremble much as she led her into the building a staircase rude indeed but still a staircase led from the more barn-like part of the building below to the upper floor and in this respect appeared the first difference between this house for it deserved the name and the lodge or castle of king hendrick the younger though both had been built by European workmen, and that of King Hendrick at the cost of the British government, which was not the case of the dwelling of the Oneida chief. As soon, however, as you reached the upper floor, the differences became more frequent and more remarkable. It was partitioned off into rooms with regular doors between them, and when Edith entered the chamber of Otetsa, she saw at once how she acquired European habits of rude manufacture but still very correct as imitations and not without a certain degree of uncouth ornament were chairs tables and writing materials a bedstead and a bed and from the wooden pegs driven into the partition depended some sketches some coloured some in pencil but all very different from the gaudy daubs which at a later period peddlers were accustomed to take into the indian territory as articles of barter as Edith's eye glanced round, it gleaned a general notion of all these things, but her mind was too full of deeper and sadder thoughts to suffer even curiosity to turn it from its course for a moment. "'There is no one in any other chamber here,' said Otetsa. "'None comes up these stairs but myself and my father. "'Now, Edith, speak, for Otetsa's heart is very heavy and her mind misgives her sadly. "'Is it your father they have taken?' "'No, oh, no,' answered Edith, "'but one as dear,' and she went on briefly to relate all that had occurred, endeavouring to soften and prepare the way for intelligence, which she feared would affect the Indian girl much. But her tates had darted at her own conclusions, divining the whole truth almost as soon as the words were spoken. She was far more affected than Edith had anticipated. She cast herself upon her fair companion's neck and wept aloud. "'He was mine, Edith,' she said, in the full confidence of sorrow. "'He was mine, my betrothed, my loved. "'And they have hidden it from me, hidden it all from the Indian women here, "'for they knew that everyone in the tribe loved him, though not as well as I. "'Where was the poor wanderer who passed your house with her infant on her back, "'who did not receive kindness from Walter Prevost? "'Where was the Indian girl who could say he did not treat her with as kindly gentleness as the highest white woman in the land. He was the tree which had grown up to shelter the hut of the woodman, giving him cool shade and comfort in the days of summer and of gladness, to be cut down and burnt for fire when the winter winds are singing in the bare branches. Oh, my brother, my brother, bad is the return they make thee, and hard the measure that they deal. But shall Altaitza suffer this? she cried, rising vehemently, and casting her arms abroad shall the black eagle let the ravens pick out the eyes of his young in his own nest no my sister no they shall take otetsa's blood first they shall take the blossom from the old bough that is no longer able to bear it up against the winds of heaven if the black eagle can no longer protect even his daughter's husband let him cast away the tomahawk let him lay down the rifle and be a woman amongst the chiefs of his people it was impossible for some minutes to stop her vehement burst of passionate sorrow, but at length Edith succeeded in somewhat calming her, beseeching her to still her agitation and her anger, and to bend her whole mind to the consideration of what means could best be used to discover whither Walter had been taken, and to rescue him from the peril in which he was placed. 
As soon as Otetsa could listen, however, or rather, as soon as she caught the sense of Edith's words, and appreciated their importance, it was wonderful how rapidly she became calm, how soon she stilled all the strong and struggling emotions in her heart, and directed every effort and energy of her spirit to the one great object before her. Enough of the Indian blood flowed along her veins, enough of Indian characteristics had been acquired in early youth to give her a portion of that strong, stoical self-command which characterized the Indian warrior rather than the woman of the race. The first burst of grief showed the woman, and perhaps in some degree, not the pure Indian, but the moment after, those who knew the character of the five nations best might have supposed her not only a pure Indian, but a man and a chief, so quietly did she reason upon and ponder the means of accomplishing her purpose. She remained at first for two or three minutes in perfect silence, revolving all the circumstances in her mind, and calculating every chance. But then she said, "'The first thing, Edith, is for you to go back to your poor father. Not that you are in any danger, but it were well, if possible, that no one knew you had been with me, at least till I have discovered where they have hid our poor brother. The women here will all aid me, and never part their lips, if I desire them not. For though the men think they are very shrewd in hiding the secrets of the nation from their wives and daughters, the women, when they please, can be as secret and as resolute too. At all events, whether your coming be known or not, it would be better you should go back before the chiefs return. They have gone forth to hunt, they say but whether it be the black bear, or the brown deer, or the white man, is in great doubt, dear Edith. At all events, they will not know the object of your coming. They may suspect, and probably will, that you came to inquire for your brother, but knowing that I was ignorant of his capture, and am still ignorant of where they keep him, they will think you have gone back disappointed and in sorrow, and leave me unwatched to act as I will." "'But can I do nothing to aid?' asked Edith. "'Remember, dearest Blossom, what it is to remain inactive and ignorant "'while the fate of one so near and so dear hangs in the balance.' "'You shall not remain in ignorance, dear Edith,' replied Otetsa. "'With every possible opportunity, and I will find many, "'my sister shall know what the Blossom does. "'And if there be any way by which you could give help, "'you shall have instant tidings.' At present, I know not what is to be done to save our Walter from the power of the snake. I know not even what they have decided themselves, or whether they have taken any decision. And I have much to think of, much to do. I must seek out those in whom I can place confidence. I must employ many, probably, to obtain me information. I must try some, consult with others, and judge what is to be done. You can rest here, my Edith, for this day, but to-morrow you must speed home again. But be sure of one thing. If Walter dies, Otetsa is dead too. That is no consolation, said Edith, throwing her arms round Otetsa's neck with tears in her eyes. Oh, do not do anything rash, dear Blossom. Remember, you are a Christian, and many things are forbidden to Christians as sins which are regarded as virtues by pagan nations. "'Nothing can be rash, nothing can be a sin,' answered Otetsa, "'which can save a life innocent and good and noble. "'I will not willingly offend my sister, "'but my heart is open to God, and he will judge me in mercy, "'seeing my motives. "'And now, dear sister, sit you here, and I will send you food, "'such as we poor Indians eat. "'I myself may be away for a time, for there must be no delay. "'But I will return as soon as possible,' and you shall know all that is done before you go. Do these blacks who are with you understand the Indian tongue? One of them certainly does, replied Edith. That is to say, the language of the Mohawks. Tis the same, answered Otetsa, or nearly the same. We may have altered a little, but amongst the five nations, he who speaks one tongue understands all. Is it the man or woman, and can we trust? It is the man, answered Edith, and I do believe he can be trusted. Then I go, answered Otetsa, and leaving Edith, she descended to the room below, and then issued forth amongst the Indian huts, gliding from one to another, and stopping generally for a few moments at those lodges 
before which was to be seen a high pole bearing the ghastly trophies with which the Indians signalized the death of an enemy. Edith, in the meanwhile, remained for some time in sad meditation, until her eyes turned toward the sketches hanging round the room. On one in particular she reflected the light from the surface of the lake streamed as it passed from the window, and Edith, going near, examined it attentively. It represented the head of a young man, apparently from seven and twenty to thirty years of age, and was done well, though not exactly in a masterly manner. It was merely in pencil, but highly finished, and there seemed something in it very familiar to Edith's eye. The features were generally like those of her brother Walter, so like that at first she imagined the drawing must be intended to represent his head. But the nearer view showed that it was that of a much older man, and the dress was one long gone out of fashion. She was still gazing and puzzling herself with the questions of whence these drawings could come, and whether they could be a Tates's own productions, when several Indian women entered with their silent and noiseless tread, and placed some carved bowls filled with different kinds of food before her. It was all very simple, but she was much exhausted, for she had tasted nothing from an early hour of the day, and the refreshment was grateful to her. The women spoke to her, too, in the Iroquois tongue, and their sweet low-toned voices, murmuring in the sort of sing-song of the tribes, was pleasant to her ear. It spoke of companionship. Their words, too, were kind and friendly, and she gathered from them that Otatsa, in order to veil the real object of her coming, had been making inquiries as to whether any one had seen Walter Prevost. They assured Edith that they had not seen him, that he could not have come into the Oneida country, or someone in the castle must have heard of him. A pale face amongst them was very rare, they said, but the coming of Walter Prevost, whom so many knew and loved much, must have been noised abroad immediately. They said that his absence from his home was certainly strange, but added, laughing, that young warriors would wander, as Edith would discover when she was old enough. Thus they sat and talked with her, lighting a lamp in a bowl, till Otatsa returned, and then they left the two friends alone together. Otatsa was agitated, evidently, though she tried hard to hide, if not to suppress her emotions under Indian calmness. But her agitation was evidently joyful. She laid her lovely small hand upon Edith's and pressed it warmly. "'I have found friends,' she said, and those who will work for me and with me. My father's sister, who knew and loved my mother, and who is supposed by some to have a charm from the great spirit, to make men love and reverence her. The wife of the sachem of the bear, the young bride of the running deer, and the wife of the grey wolf, as well as the wife of Lynxfoot, and many others. All these have vowed to help me, whatever it may cost. They all know him, my sister. They all have called him brother, and they are all resolute that their brother shall not die. But I must work first for him myself, dear Edith, she continued, and then, clasping her hands together with a burst of joy at the hope lighted up in her young, warm heart, she exclaimed, Oh, that I could save him all by myself, that I might buy him from his bonds by my own acts alone, ay, or even by my own blood. <laughs> that were joyful indeed! Edith could hardly raise her mind to the same pitch of hope, but still she felt more satisfied. Her object was accomplished. Otatsa was informed of Walter's danger, and the bright, enthusiastic girl was already actively engaged in the effort to deliver him. There was something, too, in the young Indian, an eagerness, an energy unusual in the depressed women of her race, probably encouraged by the fond, unbounded indulgence of the chief, her father, which seemed to breathe of hope and success, and it was impossible to look into the eager and kindling eyes when the fancy that she could deliver her young lover all alone took possession of her, without believing that if his deliverance was within human power, she would accomplish it. Edith felt that her duty so far was done toward him, and that her next duty was toward her father, who, she well knew, would be painfully anxious till she returned, however confident he might have felt, for her safety in the hands of the Indians, so long as there seemed no immediate chance of her being placed in such a situation. She willingly, therefore, agreed to Otatsa's suggestion to set out with the first ray of light on the following morning, 
a taste so promising that some Indian women should accompany her a day's journey on the way, who, by their better knowledge of the country and their skill in the management of the canoe, would greatly facilitate her progress. About an hour was spent in conversation, all turning upon one subject, and then the two beautiful girls lay down to sleep in each other's arms. End of chapter 14「Fifteen of Ticonderoga by George Payne Rainsford James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter fifteen. On the very same night which was passed by Edith Prevost in the lodge of the Black Eagle, some eight or ten wild-looking savages, if they could be so called, assembled, apparently to deliberate upon a great and important question. The place they took for their meeting lay nearly twenty miles in a direct line from the Oneida Lake, and was, even in the daylight, a scene of remarkable beauty and grandeur. At the hour of their meeting, however, which was about forty minutes after the sun went down, the surrounding objects were illuminated by a different and more appropriate light. Their council fire had been kindled on the top of a large, flat mass of stone, fallen from the high rocks of a very narrow dell, or pass, separating a rugged and forest-bearing mountain from a spur of the same range which seemed to have been riven off from the parent chain by some rude and terrible convulsion of nature. Forty yards at the widest part was the expanse of this fissure, and on either side were huge masses of rock tumbled about in chaotic confusion, and blocking up the greater part of the bottom of the dell. About halfway through the glen was the large flat stone, a sort of natural altar on which the Indians had lighted their fire, and strange and wild was the scene as those swarthy men, armed as if for battle, but not painted, sat around in the broad glare, each with his rifle resting on his arm, and each still and motionless, as if a statue hewn out from the brown rock. Up went the towering flame from the great pile of dry wood, sending a flickering light over tree and precipice. And yet no one stirred, no one spoke for several minutes, each eye was fixed upon the fire, not as if watching it was an object of interest, but with the steady, thoughtful gaze which showed that the mind was busy with other things, and there was something very awful in that stone-cold silence. At length the Black Eagle began to speak, without moving from his seat, however, at least at first. His tone, too, was low and sad, though every word in the sharp, guttural language of the Iroquois was clear and distinct. "'For more than fifty winters,' he said, "'I have hovered over the land of the Oneidas, "'and my wing has not failed in its flight. "'My eyes have not been dazzled by the blaze of the sun, "'nor dimmed by the light of the moon. "'The dew has fallen upon me, "'and the summer's sun and the winter's snow, "'and still are my feathers unruffled, "'and my flight as strong as in my youth. "'I am not a woman that I should spare, nor a child that I should weep. Who has seen a tear in my eye, or who has seen the tomahawk uplifted not to strike? Have I asked anything of my children but to be the first in the battle? Have I ever forgiven the enemies of the children of the stone? But we have made alliance with a great nation. We have taken presents from them. We have promised them to live with them as brothers in the time of peace, to go to battle with them as brothers in the time of war. Our children are their children, and their children are ours. Moreover, with some of this nation our chiefs have entered into more strict bonds of friendship. We have sat by their fires, we have smoked the pipe of peace together. We are their brothers. One family came and built their lodge amongst us, swept down the forest and planted the cornfield. Their door was always open to the red man. Their food was always shared with him. They said not, This is mine, and that is thine, but they opened their arms, and they said, Thou art my brother. The children of the stone loved them well. They were dear to the bold eagle, as his own eaglets. The mat in the house of Prevost was a pleasant resting place to his forehead when he was tired. His daughter was my daughter, and his son as of my blood and bone. A man came to his hearth whom we all know, a good man, a friend to the red man. 
should my brother prevost refuse to the woodchuck room to burrow for one night he went away and far from the house of our brother he met an oneida of the totem of the tortoise a man who had robbed him and who had a lying tongue a snake who hated him whom he had stung the tomahawk was bare and the oneida was killed but the man took not his scalp he sung no song of triumph over the children of the stone he slew him not as an enemy but in self-defence otherwise he would have twisted his finger in the scalp lock and the oneidas would have mourned over a disgrace it is right that there should be blood for blood that the man who sheds the blood of the red man should die for his act and that if he or none of his relatives could be found some other man of his nation should be made the sacrifice but what have i done that the son of my brother should be taken have i led you so often in the battle have i covered my war post with the scalps of your enemies that the tree i planted should be rooted up when the forest is full of worthless saplings was there no other white man to be found in the land that you must take the child of him who loved and trusted us had a moon passed had a week that you might know that there was none but the beloved of the black eagle whom you might use for your sacrifice had you made sure even that you could not catch the murderer himself and take his blood in requital of the blood he shed is the wisdom of our people gone by is their cunning a thing of other days that they could not lure the man they sought into their power that they could not hunt any other game that they did not even try to find any one but the one we loved the best remember my children that you are not rash and hasty like the pale face that you are the children of the stone and though like it immovable and strong you should be calm and still likewise i have said there was a pause of several minutes before any one answered and then a man of the middle age not so tall as the black eagle by several inches but with a particularly cunning and serpent-like look about his eyes rose slowly from his seat and standing on the very point of the rock where he was placed said in a hard cold tone the black eagle has spoken well we are allies of the white man the pale face calls us his brother he takes our hunting grounds he plants his corn and feeds oxen amongst us where our foot was free to go is ours no longer it is his he has taken it from under us and he is our brother the black eagle loves the pale face he took a pale face for his wife and he loves all the race he loves their religion his daughter is of the religion of the white man he himself has faith in their god their great spirit he adores and he has made their medicine man his son by adoption is the religion of the white man the same as the religion of the children of the stone is their great spirit our great spirit no for i have heard his words spoken and they are not the words that we are taught the white man's spirit tells us that we shall not do that which our great spirit tells us to do it bids men to spare their enemies and to forgive ours tells us to slay our enemies and to avenge which is the true spirit ours for the pale face does not believe in his own spirit nor obey his commands he does not spare his enemies he does not forgive but he takes vengeance as fiercely as the red man and against his own law let us then obey the voice of our own great spirit and do according to our own customs for the white man knows his god to be false or he would obey his commandments now what would the black eagle have would he have us all turn christians or would he have us obey the voice of the manitou and follow the customs of our fathers have we not done according to our own laws what do our traditions tell us they say that then shalt appease the spirit of thy brother who is slain by pouring out the blood of the slayer if his blood cannot be had then that of one of his family or of his friends if his family and his friends are not then that of one of his nation so now what is the case chiefs and warriors of the oneidas you have a brother slain his soul goes to the land of spirits but his bow and his arrows hang idle at his back his heart is sad and desolate he howls for food and finds none he wanders round and round the happy hunting grounds and looks in in sorrow for he must not enter till the blood of atonement has been shed he cries to you from the other side of the grave with a great cry give me rest shall his brothers give him none shall they let him wander cold and hungry amidst frost and snows 
within sight of the blessed region, and prevent him from entering? Or shall we take the first man we find of the race of him who slew him, and by his blood poured out upon this very stone, appease the spirit of our dead brother, and let him enter the happy hunting-grounds where his soul may find repose? Ye men of the family of the snake, ye have done well to seize upon the pale-face whom ye first found, for ye have made sure of an atonement for the blood of your brother. And how could ye know that ye could find it if ye delayed your hand or abandoned your prey? And now let the chiefs and the warriors consider whether they will still keep their brother, who is dead, hungering and thirsting for months in the cold region, or whether they will make the atonement this very day and open the way for him into the happy hunting-grounds. I have said. Again a quiet silence took possession of the throng, and it lasted long, but the eyes of the black eagle moved hither and thither round the circle, watching every face, and when he gathered by a sort of kindling look in the eyes of one of the warriors, that he was about to speak, he himself interposed, rising this time to his full height, and saying, The medicine man has spoken, and he has explained the law, but he has counselled with words contrary to the law. The medicine man has the law in his heart, but his words are the words of foxes. He has not unfolded the role of the law into which the words of the Manitou were whispered, but he says truly that we are to shed the blood of the murderer of our brother to appease his spirit. If we cannot find him, we are to shed the blood of some one of his many kindred. If we cannot find one of them, the blood of one of his nation— but have ye sought for the murderer, ye brethren of the snake? Can ye say that ye have tried to catch him? Have ye had time? Will your brother who is gone be contented with the blood of the first pale face ye can find, when you might find the real murderer? Will he lap like a dog at the first pool in his way? Will he not rather say, Give us the sweet water that only can allay our thirst? Would ye sing in our ears and make us believe music? This is not the blood of him who shed our blood. This is not the blood of his kindred. The happy hunting grounds will not open to us for this blood. Onidas, it is the medicine man beguiles you from the customs of your fathers. They say, wait till ye have searched diligently. Make sure that ye offer the best atonement that ye can. Do not kill the fox because the panther has mangled the game. Do not shoot the oriole for the thing that the hawk has done. The son of my brother Prevost is no kin of the Yengi who slew the brother of the snake. His blood will not atone if he can find another blood more friendly to the murderer. The eyes of the Manitou are over all. He sees that ye have not sought as ye should seek. Some moments after he had spoken, but with a less interval than had hitherto occurred between any of the speeches, a fierce-looking young warrior arose and exclaimed, let him die. Why should we wait? The woodchuck is safe in the land of the Yengis. He has taken himself far from the arrow of the Anida. There is a cloud between us and him, and we cannot see through it. The woodchuck has no kindred. He has often declared so when he has sat by the fire and talked of the deeds he has done. He has boasted that he was a man alone, that his father was hay and his mother grass, and the hemlock and the oak his brothers and sisters. Neither him can we find, nor any of his kin, but we have taken what was nearest to him, his friend, and the son of his friend. This is the blood that will appease the spirit of our brother. Let him die, and die quickly. Does the black eagle ask if this boy was his friend? The black eagle knows he was. But moreover, it may be that he himself was the companion of the murderer, even when he killed our brother. They went forth together to seek some prey. Was it not the red man that the wolves hunted? They killed a panther and a man when they went forth together. That we know, for there were eyes of red men near. The blood of our brother was licked up by the earth. The skin of the panther was sent by this boy, our captive, to Atatsa, the daughter of the black eagle. I took it from the runner this very day. The man who brought it is near at hand. The skin is here, I have said and he threw the panther's skin down before him, almost into the flame of the fire. A buzzing murmur ran round the Indians, and the keen mind of the Black Eagle soon perceived that the danger of poor Walter Prevost was greatly heightened. "'Let the law be announced to us,' he said, 
The role of law is here, but let it not be read by the tongue of a fox. Let the man of ancient times read it. Let the warrior and the priest who kept it for so many years now tell us what it ordains, according to the interpretation of the old days, and not according to the rashness of boys who would be chiefs long before a scalp hangs at the door of their lodge. I can see, he cried in a loud voice, starting up from his seat and waving his arm, as if some strong emotion overpowered his habitual calmness, I can see the time coming when the intemperance of youth and the want of respect for age and for renown will bring low the power of the Oneidas, will crush the greatness of the five nations into dust. So long as age and counsel were reverenced, they were a mighty people, and the scalps of their enemies were brought from every battlefield. They were a wise people, for they listened to the voice of experience, and they circumvented their enemies. But now the voices of boys and striplings prevail, they take presents, and they sell themselves for baubles. They drink the firewater till they are no more men, till reason has departed, and courage and strength are not in them. They use the lightning, and they play with the thunder. But the tomahawk and the scalping knife are green rushes in their hands. Let the law be announced, then. Let it be announced by the voice of age and wisdom, and let us abide by his words, for they are good." Thus saying, he stepped across the little chasm which lay between him and the second speaker on this occasion, and took up a heavy roll which lay beside the priest or medicine man. It consisted of innumerable strings of shells sawn into long strips, like the pendants of an earring, and stained of three separate colours, black, red, and white. These were disposed in various curious groups, forming no regular pattern, but yet not without order, and so many were there in this roll that, though each was very small, the weight of the whole could not have been less than twenty or thirty pounds. Thus loaded and bearing this burden with the appearance of great reverence, Black Eagle carried the roll halfway round the circle and laid it upon the knees of a man evidently far advanced in life, although his shorn head and long white scalp-lock showed to an Indian eye, at least, that he still judged himself fit to accompany the warriors of the tribe to battle. The chief then slowly resumed his seat, and once more profound silence spread over the assembly. The eyes of all were, it is true, directed toward the old man whose exposition of their laws and customs was to be final, but not a limb stirred, and even the very eagerness of their gaze was subdued into a look of tranquil attention, except in the case of the young man who had spoken so vehemently, and whose relationship as a brother of the slain Indian excused, in the sight of the tribe, a good deal of unwanted agitation. For some two minutes after receiving the roll, the old priest remained motionless, with his eyes raised toward the flame that still towered up above him, licking and scorching the branches of a hemlock tree above. But at length his fingers began to move amongst the carved shells, and unloosing rapidly some thongs by which the roll was bound, he spread out the seemingly tangled mass in fair order. Then, bending down his head, he seemed to listen, as if for a voice. "'The law of the Oneidas cannot change,' he said at length. "'It is the will of Hawaneo, the great spirit. "'A white man must die for the blood spilt by a white man, "'but the spiller of the blood must be sought for, "'or our brother will be shut out from the happy hunting grounds. "'Listen not to the song of singing birds against the young man, "'thou brother of the snake.' Neither do thou make trouble in the five nations, because the blossom of the black eagle's tree cannot be reached by thy hand. The open allusion to that which he thought was one of the deep secrets of his bosom was too much for even the Indian stoicism of the brother of the snake, and he drew his blanket or mantle over his chest as if to hide what was within. Black eagle, however, though probably taken as much by surprise as any one by the old man's words, remained perfectly unmoved not a change of expression even appearing upon his rigid features, though the speaker paused for a whole minute, as if to let what he had said produce its full effect. "'Remember,' continued the priest, "'the prophecy of the child of the sky. Toganaweta, when our fathers, under his counsels, joined themselves together in a perpetual league, a lifetime before a pale face was seen in the land, he said, when the white throats shall come, if ye suffer dissensions among yourselves, ye shall pull down the long house of the five nations, 
cut down the tree of peace and extinguish the council fire for ever and wilt thou brother of the snake bring this cloud upon thy people thou shalt search for him who spilt thy brother's blood till the moon hath changed and waxed and waned again and then thou shalt come before the sachems of the eight totems and make manifest that thou hast not been able to find him or any of his kindred then shall the sachems choose a pale face for the sacrifice and let him die the death of a warrior by the stroke of the tomahawk but they shall make no delay for thy brother must not be shut out from the hunters gone before more than two moons hero i have spoken oe oe it is well said all the indians present but one and rising from their seats they raised the roll of their law reverently and one by one glided down the path which led to the opening of the dell End of chapter 15Chapter 16 of Ticonderoga by George Payne Rainsford James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 16 Slowly up the steep middle street of Albany walked the great powerful form of the woodchuck about the hour of noon. He was clothed in his usual shaggy habiliments of the forest, with his rifle on his shoulder, his hatchet, and his knife in his belt. His steps had none of the light activity, however, of former times, and his face, which always had a grave and sedate air, was now covered with heavy gloom. Altogether he was a very singular-looking man, but, though situated inland and in one of the most central situations of the provinces, the streets of Albany, from time to time, presented so many strange figures of different kinds, what between Indians, Negroes, half-breeds, scouts, soldiers, sailors, dutchmen englishmen and hunters that the wanderer however odd his appearance attracted very little attention as he went slowly he found his way up to the gates of the fort and easily obtained admission to the person he sought he found him in a mere barrack room with the simplest possible furniture and no ornament whatever to distinguish it as the dwelling of a man of distinction the little camp bed in one corner of the room the plain deal table, not even painted, at which he sat writing, the two or three hard wooden stools without backs, were all such as might have been used in a camp or carried with an army without adding much to the impedimenta. And yet there was something about the young nobleman himself which instantly informed a visitor that he was in the presence of no common man. He turned his head as Woodchuck entered, and as soon as he perceived who it was, he nodded, saying, Immediately, immediately, and resumed his writing. Captain Brooks drew a stool to some distance and fixed his eyes first of all upon the young soldier, seeming to examine his countenance and form with great care. He then turned to another person whom the room contained, and scanned him with great accuracy. That person was an Indian, if one might judge by complexion and features, and yet he was dressed like one of the followers of the British army. The sort of hunting tunic he wore was not the ordinary gaka'a, or Indian shirt, but a mere sort of cloth frock with sleeves fastened round his waist by a leathern belt. It was of a peculiar colour, then very much worn both by men and women, of the hue of dead leaves, and called philomot. And on his head he wore a curious sort of cap of untanned leather, much of the same hue. It was certainly a well-devised dress for the purpose of concealing a wanderer through the woods in the autumn season, but, as I have before said, it was assuredly not Indian, and the long hair, though black as jet, with a slight shading of moustache upon the upper lip, showed that in all probability there was some white blood in his veins, though not at all apparent on the surface. The man had much of the Indian impassable gravity, however, and though he must have seen that he was undergoing a very severe scrutiny by the eyes of Woodchuck, no movement of any of the muscles of the face betrayed his consciousness, and he remained still and statue-like, with his gaze turned earnestly forward upon Lord H. The young nobleman soon concluded his letter, and beckoning the man up, placed it in his hands with some money. "'Take that to Mr. Prevost,' he said, "'and tell him, moreover, that I shall myself be up to-morrow, before nightfall.' 
"'Stay a moment,' said Woodchuck. "'I may have something to say, too, that will make changes. "'I guess the half-breed had better wait outside a bit.' "'Go down to the guard-room,' said Lord H., turning to the man, "'and wait there till I send for you.' "'Then, giving an inquiring look to Woodchuck, he added, "'He tells me he can reach Mr. Prevost's house this night "'if he sets out at once.' "'To be sure he can,' answered Woodchuck. "'If he's the man I believe him to be, he'd go half as far again.' The runner took not the slightest notice of the conversation regarding himself and his own powers, nor indeed of the sort of intimation of recognition uttered by Captain Brooks. "'Is not your name Proctor?' said Woodchuck at last. "'I guess it be, though your age, since I saw you.' The other merely nodded his head, and Woodchuck continued, with a sort of grunt of satisfaction, "'That'll do. He can speak, my lord, though he never do, except at very rare times.' Them Injun devils are as silent as snakes themselves, but this man beats them all. I travelled some two hundred miles with him, ten year or more agone, and never heard the sound of his voice in the whole way but once, and then he said three words and a half and stopped. I know he can speak, said Lord H, for he told me how long he would take to go. Go down, Mr. Proctor, as I told you, and wait in the guard-room. You shall hear from me in a minute.' "'He runs like a deer,' said Woodchuck, as the man left the room. "'But his way is generally to jog on at a darnation swinging sort of rate, "'which doesn't seem to trouble his shanks at all. "'A sort of trot-like carries him through everything and over everything, "'brambles and bushes and hills and stones and rocks, "'land or water, all the same. "'I do believe he'd trot across the Hudson "'without much knowing or caring what was anything. "'The Indians call him Manguoka, but his father's father was an Englishman. We call him Proctor. But he can be relied upon, asked Lord H. He was recommended to me very strongly by General Webb, who employed him upon some difficult service. Woodchuck paused. Webb's recommendation, he said at length, is not worth much, for what would any give for any word out of the mouth of a man who would suffer a gallant comrade to fall and a noble garrison to be butchered without striking one stroke? or moving one step to their assistance. But, if I recollect right, this proctor is the runner who contrived to get through Montcalm's army, and all the savage devils that were with him, and carried poor Munro's dispatches to Webb. What became of the other one, nobody knows, but I guess we could find his scalp if we sought well amongst the Hurons. Yes, this must be the man, I think, and if it be, you couldn't find a better. At all events, you can trust him for holding his tongue, and that's something in a runner. He wouldn't get up words enough in ten years to tell any secrets you wanted to keep. And now, General, I've come to talk with you about what's to be done, and I think we had better settle that before the man goes. He'll get to Prevost tonight if he stays these two hours, and I guess we can settle sooner than that, for I've thought the matter over and made up my mind. And to what conclusion have you come? asked Lord H. Brooks looked down and rubbed his great hands upon his knees for a moment, as if he hesitated to give the resolution he had formed, after so painful a struggle, the confirmation of uttered words. "'Not a pleasant one,' he said, at length. "'Not one easily hit upon, my lord, but the only one. After all, the only one. I had a sore tussle with the devil last night, and he's a strong enemy. But I beat him, manful, hand to hand. He and I together.' and no one to help either of us. The young nobleman thought that his poor friend's wits were beginning to wander a little, and to lead him back from the diabolical encounter he spoke of, he said, changing the subject abruptly, I suppose I could send no one better than this man, Proctor. I'll tell you what it is, Lord H., answered Woodchuck. I must go myself. There's no one can save Walter Prevost but Brooks. He's the man who must do it. "'And do you think it possible?' asked Lord H., seeing the great probability of his companion himself being captured by the Indians, and yet hesitating whether he ought to say a word to deter him from his purpose. "'I do think it possible,' said Woodchuck, with a grim smile, "'for you see, if these Indians get the man they want, they can't and daren't take another.' Lord H. grasped the rough hand of the hunter, saying in a tone of much feeling, "'You are indeed a noble-hearted man, Captain Brooks, if I understand you rightly, "'to go and give yourself up to these savages to save your young friend. 
"'Nobody could venture to propose such a thing to you "'because his having fallen into their hands was not your fault, "'and life is dear to everyone, but... "'Stay, stay, stay,' cried Woodchuck. "'Don't get along too fast. "'You've said two or three things already that want an answer. "'As to life, it is dear to everyone, "'and I myself am such a fool that I'd rather buy a good bit "'go lingering on here amongst all this smoke and dirt.' and dull houses and rogues innumerable then walk up there and be tomahawked which is but the matter of a moment after all for them injuns isn't long about their works and do it completely howsoever one always clings to hope and so i think that if i can get up there amongst the woods and trails i know so well i may perhaps find out some means of saving the poor boy and my own life too and if i can i'll do it "'for I'm not going to throw away my life like a bad shilling. "'If I can't do it, why then I'll save his life, cost what it will. "'I shall soon know all about it when I get up there, "'for the squaws are all good, kind-hearted critters, "'and if I can get hold of one of them, "'she'll be my scout soon enough, "'and fish out the truth for me as to where the boy is "'and when they are going to make the sacrifice.' "'Lord bless you, they set about these things, then Injuns, "'just as orderly as a trial at law. "'They'll do nothing in a hurry, "'and so I shall have time to look about and see what's to be done "'without risking Walter's life in the meanwhile. "'Then, you see, my lord, I've got this great advantage. "'I shall have a walk or two in my own haunts among them beautiful woods. "'The snow will be out by that time, "'and to my mind there's no season when the woods look "'and the air feels so fresh and free.' as on a wintry day with the ground all white and wreaths of snow upon every vine and briar and them great big hemlocks and pines rising up like black giants all around me some folks don't like the winter in the woods but i could walk on or go on in a sleigh through them for ever why that month among the woods if i'm not caught sooner would be worth ever so many weeks in this dull dirty place or any other city for Albany, I take it, is as good as most of them, and perhaps better. But I am afraid in the winter your plan of getting information would not succeed very well, said Lord H. In the first place, the Indian women are not likely to go very far from their wigwams, amongst which you would hardly venture, and in the next place your feet would be easily tracked in the snow, for these Indians, I am told, are most cunning and pertinacious hunters, and will follow any tracks they see for miles and miles. "'I've dodged an Injun afore now,' said Captain Brooks, with a look of some self-importance, "'and in the snow, too. "'I've got the very snowshoes I did it in. "'I can walk in my snowshoes either way, one as well as t'other, "'and so I made him believe that I was going east when I was going west, "'and going west when I was going east. "'Sometimes I had the shoes on the right way, and sometimes the wrong, "'so they couldn't make nothing of it.' and they think still for lord help you they are sometimes as simple as children that the devil must have given me a lift now and then for when i got where the trees grew thick together so that the big branches touched and i could catch a great bough over my head by a spring i would get up and climb along from one to another like a bear or squirrel sometimes two or three hundred yards before i came down again i saw a set of them once upon the trail and when they came to where the track stopped, they got gaping up the tree with their rifles in their hands, as if they were looking after a painter. But I was a hundred yards off or more, and quite away from the right line. Then, as to the women, I've thought about that, and I've laid a plan in case I can't get hold of any of the women. Now, I'm going to tell you something very strange, my lord. You've heard of Freemasons, I dare say. Lord H. nodded his head with a smile, and Woodchuck continued. "'Well, they've got Freemasons among the Indians. "'That's to say, not exactly Freemasons, "'but what comes much to the same thing, "'people who have got a secret among themselves "'and who are bound to help each other in good or evil, "'in the devil's work or gods, "'against their own nation or their own tribe or their own family, "'and who, on account of some devil tree or other, "'dare not for the soul of them refuse what a brother asks them. "'It's a superstition at the bottom of it.' and it's very strange, but so it is. While he had been speaking, he had unfastened his coat at the collar, drawn his arm out of the sleeve, and bared it up above the elbow, where there appeared a small blue line tattooed on the brown skin. There, he said, there's the mark. 
"'You do not mean to say that you are one of this horrible association?' asked Lord H. with a grave look. "'Not exactly that,' answered Woodchuck. "'And as to its being a horrible association or not, that's as folks use it. "'It may be for bad, and it may be for good, and there are good men amongst them. "'I am a sort of half-and-half half member, and I'll tell you how it happened. "'I went once in the winter up into the woods to hunt moose, "'by a place where there's a warm spring which melts the snow and keeps the grass fresh, "'and the big beasts come down to drink and may have eat too.' "'Well, as soon as I got there, I saw that someone had been before me, "'for I saw tracks all about, and a sort of stable in the snow, "'made for the moose, such as hunters often make to get a number together "'and to shoot them down when they heard it. "'There were moose tracks, too, and some blood in the snow, "'and I thought that the Indians had killed some and scared the rest away. "'I was going back by another trail when I came upon an old man "'lying partly against a basswood tree.' "'just as quiet as if he was a corpse, "'and I should have thought he was dead as a statue "'if I hadn't seen his shining eyes move as I passed. "'Never a word did he say, "'and he'd have lain there and died outright rather than call for help. "'But I went up to him and found the old critter "'had been poked terribly by a moose, "'all about his chest and shoulders. "'So I built up a little hut for him with boughs "'and covered it over with snow "'and made it quite snug and warm.' I took him in and nursed him there, and as I was well stocked with provisions, parched corn and dry meat, and such like, I shared with him. I couldn't leave the poor old critter there to die, you know, my lord, and so I stayed with him all the time, and we got a couple of deer and fine venison steaks we had of them, and at last, at the end of five weeks, he was well enough to walk. By that time we had got quite friendly together, and I went down with him to his lodge, and spent the rest of the winter with him. I had often enough remarked a blue line tattooed upon his arm, and sometimes he would say one thing about it and sometimes another, for these Indians be like parrots. But at last he said he would tattoo a line on my arm, and when he had done it he told me it was the best service he could render me in return for all those I had rendered him. He said that if I ever met any of the five nations tattooed like that, and spoke a word which he taught me, they would help me against their own fathers. He told me something about them, and about their set, but he would not tell me all. I was quite a young lad then, and the old man died the next year, for I went to see him, and found him just as the last gasp. I have heard a good deal about those people, however, since, from other Indians, who all have a dread of them, and call them the children of the devil. So I take care not to show my devil's mark amongst them, and I have never had need to use it till now. "'How will it serve you now?' asked Lord H., not at all liking or confiding in the support of such men. "'Well, if I can get speech of one of them, even for an instant,' replied Woodchuck, "'I can get together a band of the only men who will go against the superstitions of their people, and help me to set the poor boy free, and they will do it, whether they be tortoises or bears or wolves or snipes or stags.' "'What? What?' exclaimed Lord H. in utter amazement. "'I do not understand what you mean.' "'Only names of their totems or tribes, my lord,' answered Brooks. "'These Indians are queer people. "'You must not judge of them or deal with them as you would other men, "'and these are the only critters amongst them I could get to help me, "'if their habits came in the way the least bit. "'Now you know, though I may do something by myself, "'I may not be able to do all. "'If I am to get the boy out of the hole where they have doubtless hit him, I have to find it out first, and to make sure that we are not followed and overtaken afterward. I would fain save my life if I can, my lord, he continued, looking up in the face of his noble companion, with a sort of appealing look. I think a man has a right to do that if he can. Assuredly, replied Lord H., the love of life is implanted in us by God himself, and all which can be expected of us by our country or our fellow man is in readiness to sacrifice it when called on to do so. But now, my good friend, I have another plan to propose. It is probable that hostilities have ceased for this year, and since I saw you last night, a small party of the scouts which you know we always have in pay has been put at my disposal for the very purpose we have in view. They are all acquainted with wood warfare, 
with Indian habits, and with the art of tracking an enemy or a friend. Would it not be better for you to have these six men with you, to give you assistance in case of need? Your own life, at all events, would be more secure. I think not, answered Woodchuck, musingly. They might cumber me. No, my lord, I had better go alone. As for my own life, I may as well tell you at once. I have made up my mind to save the boy or lose it. The devil put it hard to me that it was no fault of mine he was trapped, that my life was as good to me as his was to him, and a great deal more. But knowing it does not do to stand parleying with that gentleman, I said, Peter Brooks, it is your fault, for if you had not shot the engine, Walter would never have been taken. Your life is not as good to you or anybody else as his is to him and all the world. He's quite a lad and a young lad too, with many a bright year before him. You'll never see forty-eight again, and what shall fag end worth to any one? Not a stiver, answered Conscience, and so I resolved to go. Now, as to these men, some of them are capital good fellows, and might help me a good deal when once I'm in the thick of the business, but seven men can't get altogether into the Oneida country without being found out. But I'll tell you what, my lord, if you'll let me place them where I want, one by one, in different places, and they slip into the country quietly, one at a time, they may do good service and not be discovered. Will it not be dangerous so to divide your force? asked Lord H. Injun ways with Injun people, answered Woodchuck, but I don't think you understand the thing, my lord. You see, through a great part of this Injun territory, we English have built a little fort here, and a little fort there, all the way up the shores of Ontario, where they made sad work of it last year at Oswego. Well, if I stow away these scouts at different posts, the nearest I can to Oneida Creek, they will be only at arm's length and can stretch out their hand to help whenever they're called upon. They'll be able to get in one by one, too, quite easily, for I've a great notion some of these Injuns have got a spite at Walter and are not very likely to look for anyone in his place. If they caught me, they'd be obliged to have me, and if the scouts went all together, they'd stop them, for they don't like their number. But one at a time, they'll pass well enough, if they understand their business, which is to be supposed. I see your plan now, said Lord H, and perhaps you are right. You can concentrate them upon any point very rapidly. They shall be sent for and put under your command this very day. No need of command, answered Woodchuck. Scouts don't like to be commanded, and if they don't help with a good will, better not help at all. Just tell them what I'm about. Let them know that a young man's life is at stake, and they'll work well for me if they're worth a penny. And now, my lord, you call up that man Proctor and send him off to Prevost's house. Call him up here. Call him up here. I've got this large powder horn I want to send back, though it's of doubt whether the man can muster words enough to tell who it comes from, and I must get him to do so, one way or another. I can take it tomorrow myself, said Lord H, but Woodchuck shook his head. That won't do, he said with a shrewd look. The runner must take it. He'll tell Prevost before some of his negroes, and the negroes will tell any Indians that are prowling about and so it will get around that I've left the hunting-grounds for good, and I shall slip in the more easily. Always think of everything you can, and if you can't do that, think of as much as possible. A hunter's life makes one mighty cautious. I'm as careful as an old raccoon, who always looks nine ways before he puts his nose out of his hole. Lord H. called up the runner, and into his hands was delivered the powder-horn for Mr. Prevost, with Woodchuck's message repeated over and over again, with manifold injunctions not to forget it. "'Tell him I took it that unlucky day I shot the engine,' said Woodchuck, "'and I don't like to keep what's not my own. "'It's nearly as good as stealing, if not quite. "'There, Mr. Proctor, you can get up words enough to say that, can't you?' The man nodded his head and then turned to the door without any further reply, beginning his peculiar sort of trot before he reached the top of the stairs, and never ceasing it, till he arrived at the door of Mr. Prevost's house. In the meanwhile, Lord H. made Captain Brooks stay to partake of his own very frugal dinner, while the scouts were being collected and brought to the fort. They came about two o'clock, ready prepared, at least in part, for what was to follow. 
for in the little town of Albany such an adventure as had befallen Walter Prevost was a matter of too much interest not to spread to every house and to be told at every fireside. Most of the men, accustomed to continual action and enterprise of various kinds, were very willing to go, with the prospect of a fair reward before them. Life was so often perilled with them, dangers and difficulties so often encountered, that existence without activity was rather a burden than otherwise. Each probably had his selfishness of some kind, but only one, in whom it took the form of covetousness, thought fit to inquire what was to be his recompense, beyond the mere pay, for his uncovenanted service. "'Your recompense will be nothing at all,' answered Woodchuck at once, without waiting for Lord H. to speak. "'I won't have you with me. The man who can try to drive a bargain when a brave boy's life is at stake is not fit to have a share with us. There, go along and knit petticoats. You may get a dollar apiece for them. That's the sort of winter work fit for you.' The man shrunk sullenly out of the room, and all other matters were soon settled with his companions. The method of their entrance into the Oneida territory, the different routes they were to take, and the points where they were to halt till called upon, were all arranged by Woodchuck with a sort of natural military skill, which was more than once displayed by the American people during after wars. The part of the nobleman who was present was merely to listen and give some letters to officers commanding different posts. But he listened, well pleased, and attentively, for his was a mind always eager to acquire information and direction from the experience of others, and the insight which he gained into the habits of the new people amongst whom he was might have been highly serviceable to others as well as himself, had not a sort of pedantry prevailed amongst the older officers in the British army at that time, and for many succeeding years, which prevented them from adapting their tactics to the new situations in which they were placed. Wolf was a splendid exception, but Wolf was a young man, coming in the dawning of a better day, and even had he not been so, it is probable that his genius, like that of Wellington, would have shown him that he was now to make rules rather than to observe them. As soon as the scouts were gone, Woodchuck rose to take his leave, and as Lord H. shook him very warmly by the hand, the good man said, in a tone of strong feeling, "'Thank you, my lord, for all your kindness. You'll be glad to know. I feel very happy, and I'll tell you why. I'm doing something, and I'm doing my duty.'" End of chapter 16Chapter 17 of Ticonderoga by George Payne Rainsford James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 17. There is a light, sir, at the castle, said one of the servants of Sir William Johnson, entering the room where he was seated with Mr. Prevost. It comes from the great court. Then they have arrived, said the officer, turning to his guest. Let us set out at once. Are the horses saddled? They have been kept ready, sir, ever since the morning, replied the servant to whom the last words were addressed. It is strange, said Mr. Prevost, as he followed his host toward the door of the room, that the negro I sent to tell Edith the cause of my delay has not returned, as I told him. He might have been here four hours ago. I am growing somewhat anxious. Be not so, be not so, replied Sir William. Two or three years of forest life, my good friend, are not enough to inure a man to all the little accidents and discomforts he must meet with, and the first serious danger so shakes his nerves that they vibrate at a trifle. The man's horse may have fallen, or he may have purloined a bottle of brandy and got drunk, or he may have missed his way or set out late. Between this house and yours there is room for chances enough to make a moderate volume. Let us not look out for uncertain evils when there are real ones enough around us. Real ones enough, indeed, said Mr. Prevost with a deep sigh. A moment after they reached the front of the stables, from which their horses were immediately brought forth, and mounting they set out, followed by a small party, both on horseback and on foot, for Sir William, though he affected the simplicity of the Indian, was not at all averse to a little appearance of state and dignity in his dealings with his red allies. 
there is a certain sort of pride which clothes itself in humility and without at all meaning to assert that the very remarkable man in question desired to make the indian chiefs feel that his adoption of their manners was a condescension yet it is certain that from time to time he judged it expedient perhaps from motives of good policy to make a somewhat ostentatious display of power and authority the night was exceedingly dark the moon now rose at a very late hour and dim clouds hid the stars from the dwellers upon earth in such a night and in such circumstances the fancy even of the most stout-hearted is apt to indulge in deceits and as the eye of mr prevost wandered round dim forms like spectres seemed to be gliding about the fields of maize cut but in many places not gathered not feeling certain whether imagination cheated him or not he made no observation and for some time sir william johnson was silent also but at length the latter said in a commonplace tone our good friends seem to have come in great force probably in consequence of the urgency of my summons now be patient prevost and bear with their cool phlegmatic ways for these people often feel the strongest sympathies and serve their friends the best when they seem the most cold and indifferent mr prevost felt already how difficult it was to maintain that equanimity which in theory he estimated as highly as an indian and in practice strove for but not infrequently lost he promised however to leave entirely to sir william johnson the management of a conference with the chiefs of the mohawk and the onondaga nations which had been proposed by that officer himself for the purpose of inducing the two most powerful nations of the iroquois to interfere on behalf of walter and save him from the fate that menaced him at the gate of the castle the door of which stood open as usual for although it was filled with large quantities of those stores which the indians most coveted its safety was left entirely to the guardianship of their good faith the two gentlemen entered the large courtyard which on this occasion was quite deserted the weather being cold enough now to render some shelter agreeable even to an indian from the open door of the great hall which stretched along the greater part of the whole building came forth a blaze of light on entering sir william johnson and his companion found a number of mohawk and onondaga chiefs assembled sitting gravely ranged in a semicircle round the fire each was fully clothed in his garb of ceremony and bright and brilliant were the colours displayed in the dresses and ornaments of the red men but as this was a peaceful occasion their faces were destitute of paint and the scalp lock concealed under the brilliant gustaway or cap in many of which were seen the plume of the famous white egret used to distinguish the chiefs of the different tribes ever since the feathers of the famous white bird of heaven had been exhausted all rose with quiet native dignity when the indian agent and his companion entered and a murmur of gratulation ran round while sir william and walter's father seated themselves in two large chairs this is our brother said sir william johnson pointing to mr prevost hi hi said the indian chiefs peace peace he is our brother king hendrick then approached mr prevost dressed in his sky-blue coat of european manufacture presented to him by the reigning monarch of england and took his hand saying in a tone of friendly sympathy and in the english tongue our brother is sad be comforted he then seated himself and the atotaho or grand chief of the whole confederacy an office held in descent by the chief of the onondaga totem of the bear advanced to walter's father and spoke the same words in iroquois showing clearly that the object of the meeting was understood by the indian leaders when all had arranged themselves round again a silence of some minutes succeeded at length the atotaho said rising to his full height which might be termed almost gigantic our father has sent for us and we are obedient children we are here to hear his sweet words and understand his mind sir william johnson then in a speech of very great power and beauty full of the figurative language of the indians related the events which had occurred in the family of mr prevost and made an appeal to his hearers for counsel and assistance 
he represented his friend as an old tree from which a branch had been torn by the lightning when he strove to depict his desolate state and then he told a story of a panther one of whose young ones had been carried off by a wolf but who on applying for assistance to a bear and a stag recovered her young by their means the panther was strong enough he said with the aid of the lion to take back her young ones from the wolf and to tear it to pieces but the wolf was of kin to the bear and the stag and therefore she forbore but the bear is slow and the stag is not strong when he goes against his kindred said the atotaho significantly and the lion will never take the war-path against his allies heaven forbid that there should be need said sir william but the lion must consider his children and the panther is his son poor mr prevost remained in a state of painful anxiety while the discussion proceeded in this course wandering as it seemed to him round the subject and affording no indication of any intention on the parts of the chiefs to give him assistance for figures though they be very useful things to express the meaning of a speaker are sometimes equally useful to conceal it at length he could bear no longer and forgetting his promise to sir william johnson he started up with all the feelings of a father strong in his heart and appealed directly to the indians in their own tongue which he had completely mastered but in a style of eloquence very different from their own and perhaps the more striking to them on that account my child he exclaimed earnestly give me back my child who is the man amongst the five nations whom he has wronged where is the man to whom he has refused kindness or assistance when has his door been shut against the wandering red man when has he denied to him a share of his food or of his fire is he not your brother and the son of your brother have we not smoked the pipe of peace together and has that peace ever been violated by us i came within the walls of your long house trusting to the truth and the hospitality of the five nations i built my lodge amongst you in full confidence of your faith and of your friendship is my hearth to be left desolate is my heart to be torn out because i trusted to the truth and honour of the mohawks to the protection and promises of the onondaga because i would not believe the songs of the singing bird that said they will slay thy children before thy face if there be fault or failing in me or mine toward the red man in any of the tribes if we have taken aught from him if we have spoken false words in his ear if we have refused him aught that he had a right to ask if we have shed any man's blood then slay me cut down the old tree at the root but leave the sapling if we have been just and righteous toward you if we have been friendly and hospitable if we have been true and faithful if we have shed no man's blood and taken no man's goods then give me back my child to you chiefs of the five nations i raise my voice from you i demand my son for a crime committed by one of the league is a crime committed by all could ye find none but the son of your brother to slay must ye make the trust he placed in you the means of his destruction had he doubted your hospitality had he not confided in your faith had he said the lightning of the guns in albany and the thunder of her cannon are better protection than the faith and truth of the red man ye know he would have been safe but he said i will put my trust in the hospitality of the five nations i will become their brother if there be bad men amongst them their chiefs will protect me their atotaho will do me justice they are great warriors but they are good men they smite their enemies but they love their friends if then ye are good men if ye are great warriors if ye are brothers to your brothers if ye are true to your friends if ye are fathers yourself give me back my son kaui kaui cried the indian in a sad tone more profoundly affected by the vehement expression of a father's feelings than sir william johnson had expected but the moment that the word was uttered which according to the tone and rapidity with which it is pronounced signifies either approbation and joy or sympathy and grief they relapsed into deep silence again sir william johnson though he had been a good deal annoyed and alarmed at mr prevost taking upon himself to speak 
and fearful lest he should injure his own cause, now fully appreciated the effect produced, and would not add a word to impair it. But at length King Hendrick rose and said in a grave and melancholy tone, We are brothers, but what can we do? The Oneidas are our brethren also. The Mohawks, the Oneidas, the Onondagas, the Cayugas, and the Senecas are separate nations, though they are brethren and allies. We are lead together for common defence, but not that we should rule over each other. The Oneidas have their laws, and they execute them, but this law is common to all nations, that if a man's blood be shed except in battle, the man who shed it must die. If he cannot be found, any of his nearest kin must be taken, if he have none, one of his tribe or race. The same is it with the Mohawk as with the Oneida, but in this thing have the Oneidas done as the Mohawks would not have done. They have not sought diligently for the slayer, neither have they waited patiently to see whether they could find any of his kindred. The Oneidas have been hasty. They have taken the first man they could find. They have been fearful like the squirrel, and they keep him lest in time of need they should not find another. This is unjust. They should have first waited and searched diligently, and should not have taken the son of their brother till they were sure no other man could be found. But quoi, quoi, what is to be done? Shall the Mohawk unbury the hatchet against the Oneida? That cannot be. Shall the Mohawk say to the Oneida, Thou art unjust? The Oneida will answer, We have our laws, and you have yours. The Mohawk is not the ruler of the Oneida. Repose under your own tree. We sit upon a stone. One thing perchance may be done. And a very slight look of cunning intelligence came into his face. Subtlety will sometimes do what force cannot. The snake is as powerful as the panther. I speak my thought, and I know not if it be good. Were my brother, the Atotaho, to choose ten of the subtlest serpents of his nation, and I choose ten of the subtlest of mine, they might go unpainted and unarmed, and creeping through the wood without rattle or hiss, reach the place where the young man lies. If there be thongs upon his hand, the breath of a snake can melt them. If there be a door upon his prison, the eyes of a snake can pierce it. If there be a guard, the coil of the snake can twine around him, and many of the Oneida chiefs and warriors will rejoice that they are thus friendly forced to do right and seek another. I speak my thought. I know not whether it is good. Let those speak who know, for no nation of the five can do aught against another nation alone. Otherwise we break to pieces like a faggot when the thong bursts. Thus saying, he ended, sat down, and resumed his quiet stillness, and after a pause, as if for thought, the Atotaho rose, addressing himself direct to Mr. Prevost, and speaking with a great deal of grave dignity. We grieve for you, my brother, he said, and we grieve for ourselves. We know that our great English father, who sits under the mighty pine tree, will be wroth with his red children. But let him remember, and speak it in his ears, that the Mohawk and the Onondaga, the Seneca and the Cayuga, are not to blame for this act. They say the Oneidas have done hastily, and they will consult together around the council fire how you mayest best be comforted. Haste is only fit for children. Grown men are slow and deliberate. Why should we go quickly now? Thy son is safe, for the Oneidas cannot, according to their law, take any sacrifice except the life of the slayer, till they be well assured that the slayer cannot be found. Mr. Prevost's lip quivered with emotion as if about to speak, but Sir William Johnson laid his hand upon his arm, saying in a quick whisper, Leave him to me, and the Onondaga proceeded. We will do the best that we can for our brother, but the meadowlark has not the strength of the eagle, nor the fox of the panther, and if we should fail, it would not be the fault of the mohawk or the onondaga. I have said. Sir William Johnson then rose to reply, seeing that the Atotaho sought to escape any distinct promise, and judging that with the support of King Hendrick, a little firmness might wring something more from him. My brother the Atotaho, he said, has spoken well. The five nations are leagued together in peace and in war. They take the scalps of their enemies as one man. 
They live in brotherhood, but my brother says that if the Oneida commits a crime, the Mohawk and the Onondaga, the Seneca and the Cayuga are not guilty of the act, and therefore deserve no wrath. But he says at the same time that if the man named Woodchuck slays a red man, Walter Prevost, the brother of the red man, must die for it. How is this? Have the children of the five nations forked tongues? Do they speak double words? If the Onondagas are not guilty of what the Oneidas do, neither is Walter Prevost guilty of what the pale-faced woodchuck does. May the great spirit forbid that your father near the rising of the sun should deal unjustly with his red children, or be wroth with them for acts done by others. But he does expect that his children of the five nations will show the same justice to his pale-faced children, and unless they are resolved to take upon themselves the act of the Oneidas, and say their act is our act, they will do something to prevent it. My brother says that haste is for children, and truer his words. Then why have the Oneidas done this hasty thing? We cannot trust that they will not be children any more, or that having done this thing, they will not hastily do worse. True, everything should be done deliberately. We should show ourselves men if we want children to follow our example. Let us take counsel, then, fully, while we are here together. The council fire burns in the midst of us, and we have time enough to take thought calmly. Here I will sit till I know that my brothers will do justice in this matter, and not suffer the son of my brother to remain in the hands of those who have wrongfully made him a prisoner. Yes, truly, here I will sit to take counsel with the chiefs till the words of wisdom are spoken, even although the sun should go five times around the earth before our talk were ended. Have I spoken well? Quai, quai, exclaimed a number of voices, and one of the old sachems rose, saying in slow and deliberate tones, Our white brother has the words of truth and resolution. The Oneida has shown the speed of the deer, but not the wisdom of the tortoise. The law of the Oneida is our law, and he should have waited at least one moon to see if the right man could be found. The Oneida must be in trouble at his own hastiness. Let us deliver him from the pit into which he has fallen, but let us do it with the silent wisdom of the snake, which creeps through the grass where no one sees him. The rattlesnake is the most foolish of reptiles, for he talks of what he is going to do beforehand. We will be more wise than he is, and as our thoughts are good, we will keep them for ourselves. Let us only say, the boy shall be delivered, if the Mohawks and the Onondagas can do it. But let us not say how, for a man who gives away a secret, deprives himself of what he can never recover, and benefits nothing but the wind, I have said. All the assembled chiefs expressed their approbation of the old man's words, and seemed to consider the discussion concluded. Mr. Prevost, indeed, was anxious to have something more definite, but Sir William Johnson nodded his head significantly, saying in a low tone, "'We have done as much, nay, more than we could expect. It will be necessary to close our conference with some gifts, which will be, as it were, a seal upon our covenant.' "'But have they entered into any covenant?' rejoined Mr. Prevost. "'I have heard of none made yet, on their part.' "'As much as Indians ever do,' answered Sir William Johnson, "'and you can extract nothing more from them with your utmost skill.' "'Then he called some of his people from without into the hall, "'ordered the stores to be opened, "'and brought forth some pieces of scarlet cloth, "'one of the most honourable presents "'which could be offered to an Indian chief. "'A certain portion was cut off for each "'and received with grave satisfaction. "'Mats and skins were then spread upon the floor "'in great abundance.' Long pipes were brought in and handed round, and after having smoked together in profound silence for nearly half an hour, the chiefs stretched themselves out upon the ground and composed themselves to rest. Sir William Johnson and his guest, as a mark of confidence and brotherhood, remained with them throughout the night, but retired to the farther end of the hall. They did not sleep as soon as their dusky companions— their conversation, though carried on in low tones, was nevertheless eager and anxious, for the father could not help still feeling great apprehensions regarding the fate of his son, and Sir William Johnson was not altogether without alarm regarding the consequences of the very determination to which he had brought the chiefs of the Mohawks and Onondagas. 
symptoms of intestine discord had of late been perceived in the great Indian Confederacy. They had not acted on the behalf of England with the unanimity which they had displayed in former years, and it was the policy of the British government by every means to heal all divisions and consolidate their union, as well as to attach them more and more firmly to the English cause. Although he doubted not that whatever was done by the chiefs with whom he had just been in conference would be effected with the utmost subtlety and secrecy, yet there was still the danger of producing a conflict between them and the Oneidas in the attempt, or causing angry feeling, even if it were successful. And Sir William, who was not at all insensible to his government's approbation, felt some alarm at the prospect before him. However, he and Mr. Prevost both slept at length, and the following morning saw the chiefs dispersing in the grey dawn of a cold and threatening morning. End of chapter 17Chapter 18 of Ticonderoga by George Payne Rainsford James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 18 The snow was falling fast, the early snow of Northern America. Otatsa stole forth from the shelter of the great lodge, passed amongst the huts around, and out into the fields through the opening in the palisade. She was going where she wished not her steps to be traced and she knew that the fast-falling snow would speedily fill up every footprint. Quietly and gracefully she glided on till she reached the edge of the deep wood, and then along a little frequented trail, till, at the distance of about half a mile, her eyes, keenly bent forward, perceived something brown, crouching, still and motionless, under cover of a young hemlock, the branches of which nearly swept the ground. As the blossom approached, a head, covered with glossy black hair rolled up behind, was raised above a little bush, which partly hid the woman's figure, and coming nearer the girl asked in a low voice, "'Did he pass?' "'No,' answered the young maiden to whom she spoke. "'It was Apuqua, the medicine man.' Otetsa waved her head sadly to and fro, saying, "'Now I understand.' And then, speaking to the girl again, she said, now back to the castle through the bush then to the other trail and then home her own walk was to be longer and on she went with the same gliding step till about half a mile farther she turned a little out of the path to the right and there concealed amongst the bushes she found an old woman of her tribe to whom she put the same question and received nearly the same answer thou art cold my mother said otatsa unfastening her mantle and throwing it over the old woman get thee back with the step of a mole through the most covered ways thou canst find how far on is the other more than an hour replied the woman close at the foot of the rocks otatsa made no reply but hastened forward to a spot where some abrupt but not very elevated crags rose up out of the midst of the wood for a moment there seemed no one there and the trail at that spot divided into two one running to the right, and the other to the left, at the very base of the rocks. Atetsa gazed cautiously around. She did not dare to utter a sound, but at length her eye fell upon a large mass of stone, tumbled from the bank above, crested and feathered, with some sapling chestnuts. It seemed a place fit for concealment, and advancing over some broken fragments she was approaching carefully, when a head was raised and a hand stretched out, beckoning to her. Still she trod her way cautiously, taking care not to set her foot on prominent points where the trace might remain, and contriving as far as possible to make each bush and scattered tree a screen. At length she reached her companion's place of concealment, and crouched down behind the rock by the side of a beautiful young woman a few years older than herself. "'Has he passed?' asked Otetsa. "'Which way did he take?' "'To the east,' replied the other to the rising sun, but it was not the brother of the snake. It was Apuqua, the bulrush, and he had a wallet with him, but no tomahawk. "'How long is it since he passed?' asked the blossom in the same low tone which they had hitherto used. "'While the crow could fly out of sight,' answered the young woman, "'has my husband yet come back?' 
Not so, replied Otatsa, but let us both go, for thou art weary for thy home, my sister, and I am now satisfied. Their secret is mine. How so? inquired the other. Canst thou see through the rock with thy bright eyes blossom? The cunning medicine man goes not to pray to his manito, answered Otatsa, nor to converse with his hawaneo, neither does he wander forth to fulfil his fasts in the solitude to the east. Yet he will find no dry deer's flesh there, my sister, nor any of the fire-water he loves so well. But away there, where I have gathered many a strawberry when I was young, there is a deep rift in the rock, where you may walk a hundred paces on flat ground, with the high cliffs all around you. The wildcat cannot spring up, and the deer winks as he looks down. But it has a narrow entrance, for the jaws of the rock are half open, and I know now where they have hid my brother. That is enough for this night to attake her. And what wilt thou do next? asked her companion. Nay, I know not, answered the blossom. The sky grows darker, the night is coming on, and we must follow the setting sun if we would not have Apuqua see us. We have yet time, for the gloomy place he goes to is two thousand paces farther. Come. Be assured, dear sister, I will call for thy aid when it is needful, and thou wilt as soon refuse it as the flower refuses honey to the bee. Step carefully in the low places, that they see not the tracks of thy little feet. Thus saying, Otatsa led the way from their place of concealment with a freer air, for she knew that Apuqua had far to go, but with as cautious a tread as ever, lest returning before the sun had fully fallen, he should see the footprints in the snow. They had been gone some ten minutes when, creeping silently down along the trail from the east, the medicine man appeared at the farthest corner of the rock, within sight, but he was not alone. The Indian whom they called the brother of the snake was with him. The latter, however, remained at the point where he could see both ways, while Apuqua came swiftly forward. At the spot where the trail separated, he paused and looked earnestly down upon the ground, bending his head almost to his knees. Then he seemed to track something along the trail toward the Indian castle. And then, turning back, walked slowly up to the rock, following exactly the path by which the two women had returned. At length he seemed satisfied, and quickening his pace he rejoined his companion. "'Thou art right, brother,' he said. "'There were two. What dimmed thine eyes, that thou canst not tell who they were?' "'I was far,' answered the other, "'and there is shadow upon shadow.' "'Was not one a tater?' asked the medicine man slowly. "'Could the brother of the snake fail to know the blossom he loves to look at?' "'If my eyes were not hidden, it was not she,' replied his companion. "'Never did I see the great Satcham's daughter go out, "'even when the sun has most fire, without her mantle round her. "'This woman had none.' "'Which woman?' asked Apuqua. "'Thou saidst there were two. "'One came, two went.' replied the other Oneida, but the second could not be the blossom, for she was tall. The other might have been, but she had no mantle, and seemed less than Black Eagle's daughter, more like Roya, the daughter of the bear. What were the prints of the moccasins? The snow falls fast and covers up men's steps, as time covers the traditions of our fathers, said the medicine man. They were not clear, brother. One was bigger than the other, but that was all I could see. Yet I sent the blossom in this thing, my brother. The worshipper of the god of the pale faces would save the life of the pale face had he made milk of the blood of her brother. She may love the boy too well, as her father loved the white woman. She has been often there at the lodge of Prevost with the pale faced priest or her father, very often, and she has stayed long. That trail she likes to follow better than any other and the black eagle may think that his blossom is a flower fit to grow by the lodge of the Yengeese, and too beautiful for the red man. Has not my brother dreamed such dreams? Has not his manito whispered to him such things? He has, answered the brother of the snake in a tone of stern meaning, and my tomahawk is sharp, but we must take counsel on this with our brethren to make sure that there be no double tongues amongst us. How else should these women see our tracks when we have covered them with leaves? It is probable that this last expression was used figuratively, not actually to imply that a precaution very common among Indians had been taken in this case, but that every care had been used to prevent a discovery by the women of the nation 
of any part of the proceedings in regard to Walter Prevost. "'My tongue is single,' said the brother of the snake, "'and if I had a double tongue, would I use it when my enemy is under my scalping knife? "'Besides, am I not more than thy brother?' "'And bearing his arm, he pointed with his finger to that small blue stripe, "'which Woodchuck had exhibited on his own arm to Lord H. in Albany. "'My brother hears with the ears of the hare,' said Apuqua. "'The Honontko never betray each other, "'but there are young men with us who are not of our order. "'Some are husbands, some are lovers.' and with women they are women. Yet we must be watchful not to scatter our own herd. There must be no word of anger, but our guard must be made more sure. Go thou home to thine own lodge, and to-morrow, while the east is still white, let us hold counsel in the wigwam farther down the lake. The home wind is blowing strong, and there will be more snow to cover our trail. Thus saying, they parted for the night, but the next morning, early, from one of the small fortified villages of the Indians, some miles from their great castle, no less than six young men set out at different times and took their way separately through the woods. One said to his wife as he left her, I go to hunt the moose, and one to his sister, I go to kill the deer. The older man told his squaw the same story, but she laughed and answered, Thou art careful of thy goods, my husband. "'Truth is too good a thing to be used on all occasions. "'Thou keepest it for the time of need.' "'The man smiled and stroked her cheek, saying, "'Keep thine own counsel, wife, "'and when I lie to thee, seem not to know it.'" End of chapter 18